Thank you, Boyd. All right, colleagues. Colleagues, we'll just take take a moment uh, of silence to prepare for our meeting. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, folks, uh, good morning. It's um, Council Day, January the 24th. Um, because of the closure of the McKay Bridge this morning, uh, we have a number of councillors who are not uh, with us um, as yet, so we deferred the meeting by half an hour, <clears throat> and we still have a number of councillors not here, and I hate to take on important issues without, uh, without councillors present. I wonder if the clerk or anybody has any information in terms of ETAs of, of councillors. I don't like to get into important issues without, while well, people are stuck in traffic. We've confirmed there is nobody on the fourth floor in the building. We are checking in with the councils we are not aware of right now. Okay. Well, we'll go through our sort of normal uh, orders of the day and then uh, I want to figure out if there's some way we may have to defer another period of time until people get here. I'd like people to be here for these. Uh, yeah, but it's not fair for people with traffic issues in my view. Uh, this is not normal. Okay, um, I want to first acknowledge that we're in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional, the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. The peace and friendship treaties signed beginning centuries ago <clears throat> are very important to us as a municipality and I know to the, us as a council. Uh, I will ask if there are uh, community announcements, uh, after which I'll ask the deputy mayor to read a couple of our proclamations. So, uh, community announcements or acknowledgements? Nobody. <laughs> Councillor Hensby? <laughs> Councillor Smith? I think we all wait for Councillor Hensby to buzz in and then we buzz in afterwards. <laughs> really quickly, just have one, um, the, the African Heritage Month opening a night at North Branch Library, which is happening on January 26th, 6.30 to 8.30. You can, actually, you can actually join either online or at the North Branch Library. And this is the back to in-person uh, celebrations with lots of great performances. Africville Af Genealogy Society uh, will be speaking on their 40th anniversary and lots of other fun things happening at the opening night. So that's it for me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Tomorrow, January 25th, is let's, uh, let's Talk uh, Bill uh, Day across the country in regards to uh, initiatives that support mental health. Uh, hopefully, everybody be. Uh, wearing their, their blue let's talk paraphernalia and stuff like that and uh, take an opportunity to text some messages uh, to let's talk and help help fund raise uh, fund, funding for uh, mental health. Also coming up on Friday morning at uh, nine o'clock at the uh, Nelson Widener School of North Preston will be a book launch, the ABCs of North Preston. So uh, it would be a nice opportunity to, uh, I might be a little late for the budget meeting that morning, but I'll be up there with the, with the school children uh, with that book launch, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Bell Let's Talk Day is the 25th, so tomorrow morning at 8.30 we will be uh, raising the uh, flag for Bell Let's Talk Day. Encourage everybody to come out and uh, join us for that. Anybody else? Approval of the minutes of January 10th. Moved by Councillor Hensby, seconded by Councillor Cuddle. Um, any discussion, all those in favour? Opposed, carried. Approval of the order of business, Mr. Clerk. There are no changes from the clerk's office for this meeting at this time. Anybody else? Councillor, Deputy Mayor. 
just given the attendance around the room, I mean, uh, part of the reason I think rescission was on the table um, for Councillor Cuddle's motion was that we had three or four councillors absent. Uh, we would actually have fewer councillors present today for this one than there, so I'm wondering if, if it's okay with Councillor Cuddle thinking that maybe we should put that one at the end of our meeting rather than at the beginning of our meeting so that we have the most chance for people to be here for it. For uh, after lunch or something? or after lunch, right after yeah. our heritage hearings. Is there any reason that couldn't happen, John or Ian? Notice of precision. So let's move that to right after the heritage hearings at one o'clock. Is everybody okay with that? I'm gonna yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good. Okay, that's what we'll do. Councillor Mason. So I saw the uh, the uh, sad look from the CAO to the housing staff who are now getting up and leaving. So maybe to compensate them for having to come back, let's move the uh, rental registration to right after the rescission because it's all the same crew of people. Uh, so 1517 to right after rental registration or after the rescission. Councillor Mason is suggesting we move 1517 to follow the notice of rescission, which will happen after the heritage hearings. Is everybody okay with that? Yep, I agree. Agreed. agreed. So it shall be done. Anybody else? Or a to that. Does somebody want to move the order of business as amended? Second. Moved by Councillor Stoddard, seconded by Councillor Kent. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Carried. Consent agenda, colleagues? I'll move Councillor Mason moves the adoption of the consent agenda. That's 15.1.1, 15.1.2, and 15.1.4. No, no other discussion. Voting on the consent agenda on our machines. 15.1.1, the deputy mayor will take off consent. 15.1.2 and 15, uh, Councillor Kent. Uh, 15.1.2 off as well. With Cole Harbor Place, uh, Councillor Purdy is not here, and I think that that I would like to have an give her an opportunity to to uh, speak to it. Councillor Purdy won't be here. She won't be here today. She sent the note. She won't be here today. So can we? I asked Councillor Purdy yesterday if there was anything on the agenda that she oh, wanted to move to the next meeting, and she said there was nothing that okay. concerned her. So I don't think it's a problem. Super. Thank you. Okay. So we we'll leave 15.12 on yep. consent, and 15.14. Yes. Easy. So on easy, consent, easy. we'll vote on our machines for those two items. That is uh, adopted. Consent agenda 1511 stays in discussion. 1512 is Name change of community builders, Coal Harbor Recreation Society is deemed passed on consent and 1514 grant in lieu uh, arrangement between HRM and Halifax Regional Water Commission. Those two are deemed to have passed on uh, consent. Business arising from the minutes calls for declaration of conflict of interest. Notions of reconsideration, there are none. We have an item of rescission, which we will deal with this afternoon. Deferred business, none. Tabled matters, none. We do have two heritage hearings, which will happen at one o'clock, and we have a public hearing, which will begin at 6 p.m. Correspondence, Mr. Clerk. Correspondence has been received for item 9.7 and 15.1.7. All correspondence has been circulated all members of council. Thank you. Petitions, colleagues? Information items brought forward. There are none. For Councillor Russell's uh, benefit, just to let you know, we've moved the item of uh, rescission to take place directly after the heritage hearing this afternoon so that we could have as many people here for that as possible. Um, We'll go to reports 1511 snow and ice clearing contract damage. Deputy Mayor, you wish to speak to this? Maybe you I can put the motion on the floor and then have your. Sure. So, uh, where's my agenda? 
I move that Halifax Regional Council uh, continue to outsource snow and ice control and remove and removal to third party contractors and continue to ensure the agreements with these third party contractors contain suitable provisions governing the level of service to be provided to the municipality's residents and the insurance required to be maintained by the third party contractor. Seconded by Councillor Kent, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, you know, <laughs> I mean, it, I always leave my motions fairly open ended because I always like, uh, you know, uh, I want staff to have as much flexibility uh, to approach things as possible. But uh, this particular one, um, what's come back is fairly inflexible, shall we say, uh, the options that come back or not. And so the, the issue here on this one for me is. Um, yes, I understand from the report as well um, that we, there's, there's legal complexities about who's responsible when, when uh, during snow clearing operations someone's property gets damaged. However, um, that said, I mean, I don't, I, I reject the idea that we can kind of shrug and just dispense with um, our responsibility here. I mean, the entire reason that there's contractors on our streets be to begin with is because they're delivering a municipal service. It's our streets, um, people we've hired to do this. And, you know, generally, uh, my experience has been most of our contractors do uh, a, a good job. Um, I have half my district in-house and half contracted out. Um, but uh, there are times there are problems and it's really unsatisfying from a resident point of view when, you know, to them it doesn't matter. Uh, to them, it's my property has been damaged by snow clearing and they call the municipality and the response from us is, well, you got to go talk to the contractor. And most of the time that goes okay, but sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes there's uh, disputes with the contractor and in that situation, I mean, our answer is basically too bad, so sad. Um, and that's really an unsatisfying situation. And so I get the first two parts of my motion that why we don't want to take that on. Um, um, but, you know, I was really hoping for more out of that third piece, which is, you know, that kind of the customer service piece, the ombudsman sort of uh, role. And so I, I have a couple of uh, questions for staff if there's, if someone managed to make it in through the uh, mess that is the traffic today. This staff member uh, took the uh, corporate yacht, so he knows how to get <laughs> the today, right? Well, that was my solution this morning too, Councillor Mason, <laughs> Mancini. Um, so, I mean, I guess for me, like, uh, I'll, I'll start by asking, so we, we have, in the contract, we have a holdback provision. Um, how does that actually work in terms of damage out there? And, you know, for me, it, it, it's not so much the sod damage. I think our con uh, most, most of the time the sod stuff is rectified well. It's the more complicated damage that occurs when, when you know, a retaining wall gets hit, a building gets damaged, those sorts of things that seem to be where more of the complexity and problems are, in my experience, anyway. Good morning. Yeah, you've got to press the button. <laughs> the mayor to the councillor. It's my understanding that the holdback is for our damage. You can't apply a holdback to damage to other parties. So how then do we, I mean, how do, how do we or do we not at all ensure that like uh, when there is damage done, like if a retaining wall or a building is, is damaged by a contractor, um, is it literally then we don't do, someone calls 311, we just forward it over and we take nothing further from that? Th that's correct. A at the end of the day, the provision of this service is through <clears throat> what amounts to be an automobile. Snow plows and sidewalk uh, equipment is all insured under an auto policy. And under the auto policy, the, the Insurance Act speaks to you know, who's responsible for and it's in the purview of the owner of the vehicle and their insurer. And in situations where damage is done to property of others, there's nothing we can do. So literally, um, our message then would be if, uh, if, if, you're ha if you basically end up in a dispute with a contractor after snow damage is done, um, you have to sue the contractor as you, a homeowner? You would have to contact their insurer and then it's up to the ins every insurer has the ultimate power of attorney to investigate, negotiate, and settle claims as they see fit. But it's a, a private matter between the person who has damaged and the insurance company of the, the vehicle owner. 
It would be the same if we had an argument with our uh, contractor doing damage to our building. Um, ultimately, we would have the holdback, but past the holdback, we would have to go through their insurance policy. See, see I mean, if, if we had someone in doing work in our building and something got broken, uh, there'd be more consequences. There's an ongoing relationship. And the issue I have with this is we just abdicate ourselves from the relationship, which is fundamentally between municipality and resident. Well, it's a different type of insurance if they're working in our building. The, the, the reason that the report is structured and the limitation we have with respect to the service provided is because the, the, the structure around an automobile insurance is, is in, entrenched in the Insurance Act. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Deputy yeah. Mayor, I'm gonna have to halt you there on your first yeah. go around. Um, first of all, I'm gonna get you to just identify yourself for the oh. many loyal listeners. <laughs> Joel Plater, Manager, Risk and Insurance Services. Thank you, John. So if I may, Mr. Mayor, through you to council, if it helps to, to consider in this way, um, if you were to consider um, the municipality as a property owner with a 100 foot driveway, and in the same way that you as a private resident or a property owner with a 100 foot driveway, if you were to hire Bill's snow plowing that comes and in that process of clearing your driveway, tears out your neighbor's fence and, and the hedge, you would not then be paying, you have no insurable interest, it is not your accident to cover the damage to your neighbor's fence. And so what we do through Joel's office is actually act as an ombudsman and to pressure our contractors to deal with the damage in the way because they have that insurable interest through their automobile insurance or alternatively to pay for it directly themselves. As a municipality, given that we simply own the driveway or the sidewalk or what have you, we have no insurable interest. We don't own the, in we don't own the property that's been damaged and we don't own the vehicle that's caused the damage. And as a consequence, we have taken steps to ensure that our, our contractors are properly insured and have a process in place to manage the claims as they come forward but have no other role in the sense that because we have no insurable interest, we have no liability and we have no ability to take on those claims and pay them because we have no authority to pay for something that's not our responsibility in the, the day. So it's, it, it leads to un, unhappiness at certain points where like any accident involving an automobile, the, either the owner of the automobile, in this case the, our contractor, or um, the property owner is left unsatisfied if, if there's a dispute over the damage, which there often is. Okay, um, a couple of things before we go on. Number one, uh, for those councillors who are stuck in today's horrendous traffic, we have moved the notice of rescission to be debated after the heritage hearings this afternoon. And number two was, uh, what else was I going to say? Oh, yes, I have to leave for a few minutes. So uh, the deputy mayor is going to take the chair. In the event that he wishes to speak, uh, I will ask the former deputy mayor, who is here now, to step in. Um, I have to go and do a press conference for the East Coast Music Awards, which we're hosting in uh, this year, which is going to be a big event for the city. I'll say one more time for those just arriving, we've moved the notice of rescission till after the heritage hearings this afternoon. So, uh, Councillor Stoddard, on a point of uh, clarification, maybe? Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was uh, just wondering, I thought we had moved another item till after lunch as well. No, w w yeah, we've, we've, uh, we've moved the notice of rescission, and then it was suggested as soon as we do the notice of rescission that we would do 1517, so that oh. will follow okay. uh, the notice of rescission. That's the same staff requirement. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, thanks to everybody who's made it here. I know it's been a crazy day in traffic. Uh, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and you know, thanks to uh, then Councillor, now Deputy Mayor Austin for bringing this forward in the first place. Um, I have mixed feelings about this too, but in the six years I've been on council now, I've begun to really appreciate the relationship that we have with the contractors and in fact our role uh, to the Deputy Mayor's point about customer service. 
And so, you know, the solicitor mentioned a snowplow on a private driveway, but I mean, any kind of contractor, if you were having home renovations done, you could do them yourself or you could hire a contractor. If they get out and swing their ladder around and hit the neighbor's car or the neighbor's window and take it out, Arguably, it's not your fault as the homeowner, but the contractor's fault, which is why you make sure your contractors have insurance before they step on your property. Um, and so, but your neighbor's not going to care. And this is where we get into this whole issue. Your neighbor's going to come after you, and then you're going to have to mediate between the contractor and them and make sure everyone's happy and they fix the damage. And that's what we do. So, I mean, I, I have regularly mediated these complaints between our, our you know, public work staff and especially our superintendent of winter operations, uh, Joel and his group uh, in terms of, you know, explaining this to residents, giving them the contact information for the contractors and, um, you know, advocate it and make sure and follow it up. You know, have they fixed the damage come June? Is it repaired? And my experience has been, with the exception of one case, which was a very unique case, um, all of the damage that's been caused has been fixed. Where you get into weird things is they tear up the grass, which is actually on the municipal property, and the resident thinks it's their property, and it's not done to their satisfaction, et cetera. Um, that's hard to explain. But generally speaking, where there's a fence been damaged or where there's been um, you know, stairs literally ripped off the front of someone's home, that's gotten fixed. It's inconvenient, it's unfortunate, uh, and uh, at least one of those stairs was actually ripped off by a municipal staff person, not a contractor. Um, but overall, you know, I've, I've come to appreciate the kind of uh, contractual relationships we have and who covers what. And, you know, once you explain that to the resident, it generally tends to work out in the end. I think it's in the explanation and the follow-up in the service that you know we do that. So from my experience, it's the customer service that's the most important part, making sure our staff and us as counselors do that kind of work. So I don't have any questions. I just wanted to add that comment that you know, I think in the overall scheme of things, both legally and the way we operate, uh, this is probably the most efficient way to actually do it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cleary. Uh, next up would be Councillor Mancini. Thank you, uh, DM. Look, I, uh, I wasn't going to speak to this, but you know, um, the what Councillor Cleary just mentioned, I think, is the key. It's the customer service piece, right? Councillor Cleary described how he follows up, and I do the same thing. That's the piece that seems to be missing. I think most of us do it, but uh, you know, is there a way that we can put that customer service piece in there to follow up? You know, um, uh, uh, Madam Resident, you need to contact 311. It, the contractor will follow up. You know, is it our staff or ourselves to follow up with the uh, uh, with the customer after it's been taken care of? So the piece I wanted to chime in on was what's missing from this, and Joel, I don't know if you can speak to this, because this is more about the contract with the contractor, is the proactive piece. I've got many examples where every winter, the exact same spot, this is the exact same damage. That's, that's the, the challenge. That's, that seems to be, you know, sometimes we'll get a contractor that'll actually come by and put the, the, the little flexible metal post in on their own so that their operator of the Bobcat or whatever we're using doesn't drive over, but not all, all of them do that. And so, you know, is there any way to be proactive where we're constantly year after year seeing the exact same spot damage. So I, I know, Joel, that's probably not your piece, but it, I, I, that that's, seems to be missing from this. Uh, through Deputy Mayor to the Councillor, it's my understanding that in most situations, and, and perhaps the, uh, the, the superintendent can speak to it, our contractors do a, a pre-year drive-through, walk-through of their routes to uh, it, you know, identify those pitch points, but I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, the superintendent. Uh, hello, yes, uh, Steve York, manager of Winter Operations Training. Through you, Deputy Mayor, to the councillor. <clears throat> uh, each contractor does routine hazardous assessments every spring, or every spring, sorry, every winter, fall, where they go through, drive through the routes, identify issues, pinch points, retaining walls, planter boxes, etc. Some choose to identify those or flag them with a delineator or something like that. Not all of them do. Uh, we are proactive with talking with them about you know problem issues. I know there's a few spots uh, we service in-house in the north end that are very uh, troublesome, and we basically shift those to a hand route so there's no equipment through there to try and minimize damage. But damage does occur, but right. we, we do work with them to try and flag it where possible. So those types of requests we can make through you, Stephen, then say, look, you know, this is re it's a repeat offense here. The same, can we do something? And then have the conversation with your team, mm -hmm. and then you might have it. Okay, great. Yeah, exactly. That's good. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. 
Thank you, Councillor Mancini. Councillor Cuddle. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Um, and uh, Stephen, good to see you. I've been emailing lately, and uh, it's that time of year. Um, yeah, so the two things on my list were exactly the same as the issues that have just been raised. One is uh, the reporting mechanism, and the other one is dealing with recurring issues and what HRM's role is in that. And, you know, I understand from um, the explanation of the legal process that Mr. Traves just gave us in terms of, you know, you, it's private property, it's a contractor, it's their insurance. But part of the issue is that the residents don't have a choice in who gets hired, right? We have these multi-year contracts, we have recurring issues. I mean, if I hired a contractor who came and didn't do a good job, um, I probably wouldn't hire that contractor again. I, w I would have a choice in that. The residents who, you know, have this recurring damage that happens again and again, I mean, they don't have a choice. It's HRM's selection of a contractor. It's a multi-year contract. And, you know, I do know that HRM um, staff and, and Stephen, that, that you know you work closely with the contractors that will get a new contractor and that will bring up a whole new set of issues of you know making sure that the people that they hire are familiar with the problem areas and where the recurring issues happen. But I think the frustration from the resident side is that they don't feel they have they have control and much control over the situation. And so to put the whole you know, ball of snow in their lap <laughs> to say, you know what, this is, you know, HRM isn't going to step in this as a, a private property issue, um, I, I think causes a lot, of, a lot of frustration, particularly when there isn't that, that say in, 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 who, in who's doing the work or that direct, that direct relationship, because it's not the resident hiring the contractor. It's HRM hiring the contractor. And, um, you know, and I, and I know, like, you know, the level of complaints we get around the occurring issues, you know, some people are very fastidious about their lawns, you know, to much more of a degree than I am about my lawn. Um, but... <laughs> That's why I'm off appeals committee. Um, <laughs> but, you know, but some of them really are legitimate concerns, like knocking out a tree, for example, or damaging a tree. Um, you know, once you hit that tree with a snowplow, I mean, that's death for that tree, right? And how that, and how that tree gets replaced and when it gets replaced and, and the inconvenience. So I also, I also just want to note that from the contractor perspective, they too, like all of us, like everybody right now, is you know have the issue of um, you know getting employees, getting staff, getting people out there operating the machines. Um, you know, there's a high turnover rate. There's the the whole experience factor. Um, you know, I think that is playing into at least I know in my area a little bit. You know, Stephen, we've talked about that in the past. Um, you know, what, what a challenge that is. But I, I guess that's where I think HRM absolving itself of all responsibility when we're the ones who actually select the contractor is, you know, a, a bit of an issue. I see that as, as, a, as a bit of an issue because the property owners don't have, don't have a role to play in that. I don't know if you can speak to that at all. I can. I think our solicitor would like to chime in. Uh, so, uh, Deputy Mayor, through you to Council, I just, I just want to be very clear that, you know, our staff does not absolve themselves entirely in, or in any, any sense with respect to this sort of damage. We, we very much un appreciate and understand the dynamic. It's no different, frankly, than, than my neighbor hiring a contractor um, that, as I said, that, that damages my property and then waving, wave our hands. I don't get a choice in who my neighbor hires as a contractor. And so, you know, being aware of that, I, from my observation, I know that Joel can be very persuasive as a superintendent in terms of pressing the contractors to be reasonable in terms of the claims and to dealing with them in a, in a fair and, and reasonably quick manner to the extent of, you know, um, continuing to press where we feel 
that even though we're not a party to it, um, that the resolution is not fair and not being done quickly. And so it's not, it's not that we absolve ourselves of it. What we're trying to explain is legally we have no recourse. That doesn't mean that morally we n we're not actively engaged in managing that relationship to the best that we can with the, with the contractors, recognizing that if things do become so poorly managed by a contractor, then we really won't have much of a choice when it comes to the contract renewal time. If, if they're refusing to deal with the claims in a, in a fair and reasonable manner, that is something that we would then look at in future when we're trying to review the contracts. All right, thank you. I think our CEO would like to speak now too. Yes, and uh, John conveyed part of what I wanted to mention is that contractor performance can be taken into account when contract evaluation and award is happening and specifically how they're interacting with customers. And over the years, the management and expectations set for contractors around how they interact with customers doing snow clearing has really changed and matured a lot. And I think it's a continuous improvement journey. So I'm sure that Stephen listening today, you know, next time we come around to evaluating and awarding contracts, we'll be looking at how contractors have performed under the existing contracts and what clear language and expectations and service measures we can put in there for future. Thank you. Okay, um, so I think we'll move to Councillor Lovelace next. <clears throat> good morning, thank you so much. That was uh, such a lovely drive in. Um, good to see everyone and great to see you guys, Joel and Steve. Um, so I'm, thank you for bringing this off consent, Deputy Mayor uh, Austin. I uh, do obviously, as many of us do, receive complaints from residents. Uh, and so having kind of a, uh, an in-depth look as far as, you know, mitigating that concern around the dissatisfaction from a customer service perspective, as well as what is our legal role, what is our moral role, this is a really good discussion. Um, the unfortunate piece is I don't think we as counselors actually have the data that we need in order to have a fulsome uh, view of what the issue is. So for example, I wouldn't be able to tell you how many complaints we've had, how many have been resolved by the contractor, how long it took for the municipality to negotiate with that contractor to get that issue resolved. So I think we're really just scratching the surface as far as really understanding what the issue is. And I think when we're talking about, um, I think the statement from the solicitor was pressing contractors to be reasonable. Well, how much time are our staff spending on that? And again, I don't really have an understanding of how big this issue is or how small it is or how profound it is to property owners who are dealing with, you know, weeks or potentially months of getting this retaining wall resolved and fixed and, um, you know, the, the problem that that creates for them in, in their own life. So I guess my question to you, Joel and, and Steve, is why don't we have this data? Uh, to the council. Uh, I can run a report to get you the number of, of these types of claims that receive, but it would just be a number. Uh, where the, the, um, where the claim is, is within an area that is done by a contractor, uh, our file is, is just, you know, a notice of an occurrence, but we don't track the time or the, the length of time it takes to, for the contractor to effect a repair because uh, as uh, municipal mm -hmm. solicitor has indicated th that's a private matter between the contractor and the uh, the resident uh, what i can do is get a number of, of of these types of claims that have happened but we would have no way of determining when the resolution when the resolution has occurred yeah. so there are two issues there's the claims and then there's the complaints so as uh, councillor mancini pointed out you know he can certainly go to staff and say hey i guess we've got a problem issue with this contractor it keeps happening year after year and um, this is an issue but I, i'm just wondering why council would have to do that when i would assume that you would have the numbers on you know the issues that and the complaints are coming in on this uh, particular contract um, and potentially that could uh, create an issue with renegotiation of that contract, for example. So I'm just wondering if you can speak to that, Steve. Yeah, so the majority of damage that occurs occurs to HRM infrastructure, so our property. So this whole um, insurance portion of this only applies to like a very, very small number, like Councillor Cleary mentioned. So this is damage that occurs off of our property, mm -hmm 
on a resident's front yard. So in your district, there may not be any at all, any claims of this nature, just because houses are farther off the property, there's not much infrastructure to damage that isn't ours. We've had complaints though, so that's, but there's a, there's a difference between number of complaints mm -hmm. as opposed to number of claims. Um, because in order to get to the <clears throat> claim point in, in, the, in the conversation, they would have to understand that there's uh, responsibility on their part to prove that it was the contractor and so on and so forth. So I guess I'm just trying to understand the magnitude of the issue that we're talking about. If most of the time it resolves itself very quickly. We have June 1st as the cutoff for damage repairs that are reported throughout the spring and almost always they're all completed by June 1st except for a few outliers that you know, have very unique circumstances that may require additional time to repair. Okay, I've only got uh, 30, 40 seconds left, so I'll just say that uh, my, I guess the last thing that we would need to do then is to better communicate um, our responsibility and role with regard to the customer service in this arrangement. I think that's definitely a piece that's missing, so when complaints are coming in, people aren't quite aware of, you know, what, how they manage that situation, so potentially we could put up some uh, more detailed information communications on the website so that when people are issuing a complaint um, to 311, we have a better understanding understanding of, you know, what is the process to issue that complaint and then to follow that through to, from a complaint to a claim. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you much, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Following the comments of uh, Councillor Lovelace and also from our CAO, I was kind of wondering about the performance tracking of our, of our contractors. Uh, complaints will come in either to the councillors or through 311. Uh, are we de are we monitoring that information? Is 311 our contact center advising the constituent in regards to they must file their complaint to the insurance company of that particular contractor? Will that information be provided to the constituent at that time? If ABC contractor is doing it in my area and does damage, or are we going to provide the information for ABC contractor's insurance to make the claim against? Because it seems to be very, uh, what I call, Bureaucratic, I guess you could say, in regards to making a claim. It depends on how how substantial the, the bend damage may be. You would think it might be easier for the contractor to go back and just repair it in the spring, because that's what the, the standard uh, thing was. But if you do damage, uh, just document, take pictures of it, and hopefully they'll be back in the spring to fix it before when the things thaw out. So I like to know is how are we going to be tracking all these damage claims if uh, if if they're being told just to go contact the, the insurance agency. Yes, so uh, through you, Deputy Mayor, to the Councillor. When a resident calls 311 with the uh, concern of damage caused by snow plowing, the call is triaged by the team at 301. It's determined then is it an HRM municipal asset that's been damaged or is it private property? And that kind of was where the uh, decision tree splits. So if it's uh, HRM infrastructure, it gets sent to us internally, it gets sent to the contractor as well, and our supervisor and the contractor both go and take a look. If it is damaged, it gets compiled to a list, like a master list we keep, and once again, they have that repaired by June 1st. If it's a private property damage, then it gets sent to Joel's group where, I'll, I'll let him go. <laughs> When it comes in as a claim for damage to private property, my, my team opens up a claim, contacts the, the resident, discusses uh, you know, what contractor is responsible for the area, sends a, an email to the resident and to the contractor saying, hey, there's damage, and it, it provides an introduction between the two. Uh, if the damage isn't resolved, and the resident gets back to us, then we provide them the insurance information so that they can present the claim directly to the insurance company. We tend to give the contractors the first opportunity to go good for the damage that they've caused, and in most situations it is resolved. And who would do the estimation of the damage in regards to like, does a surveyor or a landscape going to come on so it's going to cost you this much to repair their property? Like, how do you how do you justify a claim in regards to how much it should be? And I don't know if there's going to be a deductible or not in, in impacted on the on the property of the owner or versus the uh, the, the uh, contractor. And um, I just recently had an experience this past weekend on Thomas Street in Lake Echo where our blade did it some damage to the apron of the driveway. The question is that apron of the driveway is a paved area, was in the right of way of the road, so is that driveway considered municipal property or is it considered private property because it was a paved driveway going to this person's home? 
Uh, yeah, so that's a very interesting topic. So it comes up all the time where the driveway may be higher than the shoulder of the road and it's paved. When the snowplow comes through the wing, it, it will scratch it. So our take on that is that it is, it's private property within the municipal right of way. So there's no right or wrong answer really. Uh, we, if, it's, if it's damaged or structurally damaged to the asphalt, we expect the contractor to cut it out and repave it incorrectly. If it's just a surface scratch or a visual thing, then often the contractor will just come through, sometimes a driveway sealer or something like that to paint it so it uh, is aesthetically pleasing. I can tell you it's not a scrape. And, then, if you, and if you drive beyond the driveway, you'll see that the edge of the road has been all broken up because of the, the blade boot ripped up the asphalt as well, made a mess. So I'll send some pictures along and make sure you guys have a look at it. Thanks. Councillor Outhead. Thank you, uh, Deputy, and I'm glad uh, this came forward. I seconded it when it came forward. And uh, this is something that used to be a real problem in the past. I think it's less of a problem now than when we had the smaller companies and the hourly folks and whatnot doing uh, plowing for us. Uh, it still happens occasionally with mowing. And it's always sort of bothered me that if HRM decides to outsource one of its core responsibilities, and snow removal and mowing of our core responsibilities of HRM, if we choose to outsource it and damage is done, I've always sort of had a problem where the customer would have to get involved with the contractor. I always use the example of, I got wiring done at my house today. Let's say I wanted to switch over to a different uh, internet provider. They came to the house and they damaged a wall. Well, I would call Alliant. I would call uh, Eastlake. Eastlake, thank you, uh, and, and say, you know, please come and fix my wall. It was damaged. I wouldn't expect them to say to me, well, please call Joe and Fred's wire pulling uh, mm -hmm. because we outsource to them and uh, they will hopefully have good insurance and, and uh, hopefully they'll get this resolved. If it's not, well, too bad. I guess you can go to court. You know, that, and that used to happen with some of the smaller contractors and with things, and I'm not talking about nicking a curb. I, I think HRM staff does it outstanding. We have outstanding supervisors and, and, and I see them out in the, in the trucks and often with their colleagues and, and with uh, Dexter or Ocean, whoever, and looking at this curb damage and looking at where this was hit and, and, and getting, make sure that it's fixed before June 1st. So I don't have a problem with that. And in the case of the larger contractors, like I, I have Dexter in my area, I have seen them go back and, and take huge steps to replace that tree or even to put gravel down in an area where sod may have been damaged year after year after year by, by plowing. But in those exceptions, when there was damage to a car, when there was damage to uh, something on a lawn, to have to refer the resident to the contractor I think is an abdication of responsibility. The, the, it, it's, a, it's a municipal service that we chose to contract out. The customer is still our taxpayer, and that customer is still entitled to customer service from the municipality. So while this doesn't happen often, and I agree it happens a lot less than it, than it used to, and, I, and, I, and a lot of people take some really great steps to make sure that, uh, that it doesn't happen, I, I just really, the same as if somebody damaged my house I, uh, when putting in something for Eastlink or, or uh, Alliant, as I mentioned, I just don't think that the customer has a role in this. The customer reports it to the service provider, which is us. We decide if we do the service in-house or not, and we, it's up to us to resolve that situation. And to some extent, what goes on behind the scenes, if it's, if it's determined in-house by our insurance company, by our supervisors, by the contractor's insurance, by the contractor's supervisors, should almost be invisible to the client, to the customer. And, and I think that's where this, this, this falls down. Not often, but it, and, and less than it used to. So I, I cannot support the status quo on this. I think one of the things that we've said for years, we want to start thinking like a customer a little bit in the services we provide. Well, you know, kind of jerking the customer around with whose insurance that it should be and whose, 
uh, whatever they need to speak to, I think is, is, is just unfair. They say it doesn't happen often, but when it does happen, I think, no. And there are gonna be some situations that just can't, you know, the customer may be, the resident just may be unreasonable. They want their whole front lawn re, redone or whatever. But then at some point we are going to have to say as, as, a, as the service provider ultimately that no, this isn't, we're not gonna redo your whole front lawn, the file is closed, so be it. But to say, well, sorry, call Joe and Fred's mowing, or Joe and Fred's plowing, uh, it's, it's just not satisfactory to me. Uh, thank you, Councillor Outhead. You've inspired our solicitor. Yeah, I thought I might. <laughs> thank you, Deputy Mayor, to you, committee. So just, just to back up, I, I totally agree, Councillor. And I think where, where an individual contracts in, in the sense of uh, Nova Scotia Power, anybody else, yeah. those, those those comments make perfect sense. Just want to bring, you know, counsel back to something Joel said early on, which is our challenge in this case. Um, the Insurance Act regulates this because it involves automobiles. So as opposed to sending a contractor to someone's house where I could fix the damage myself as a municipality and go forward, we are in a regulated industry under the Automobile Insurance Act. And so what happens fundamentally is we have no ability to step in and to solve that in, in, in the sense that it's left to the insurance of, of the automobile. And so it, the alternative, and that's why there are no alternatives in the report, really is either we do the service ourselves and, and we address it um, ourselves in that way, or we're left with the current situation in terms of, of um, these sorts of damages, and that mm. I'm very, being very specific in terms of ones caused by you know, these, these uh, machines and trucks, that we're left with the Insurance Act provisions and, and that restriction on it. And that, that fundamentally is unfair in many ways, but it's, mm. it's the way it goes. And so but the whole work, have sorry? But our contracts have dispute resolution solution clauses usually too though, right? They have as between us and our contractor. Correct. And they have a requirement that the contractor have insurance, automobile and otherwise, to deal with damage to our property and also to respond to those claims. They do not, and, and no contract will allow us to step in and take the place of our contractor. All right, that's what I was wondering. All right, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor uh, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, and my apologies if uh, if this was asked uh, earlier while I was still stuck in traffic. But uh, I've uh, I've heard the phrase a couple of times said, "We expect the contractor. We expect the contractor." And I'm just wondering, do we have repair quality standards? Like, does HRM follow up on the work? Because certainly, more than a few times, it's been expressed to me that, uh, you know, somebody gets their lawn ripped up and the repair is uh, basically a truck slows down to 30, throws a handful of grass seed out and calls it a day. And so I'm just wondering, you know, what is the mechanism in place to make sure that these repairs are, are you know, quality standard and, and up to our standards? Uh, yes, uh, so through you, Deputy Mayor, to the Councillor. Uh, we have a general rule of thumb where if it's grass that's maintained, someone's mowing it actively and, and looking after it, the expectation for a sod repair is sod. If it's a strip of grass in the right of way somewhere that is constantly trampled or something like that, then topsoil and seed mm -hmm. is typically the, the repair. But for the most part, if it's someone's lawn, it's the expectation is sod. And so if that is not happening, uh, the mechanism is to call 311 exactly. and open yep. a claim. Exactly. It, well, it, there would be a claim open if it's private. Right. And if someone contacts 311, they'll get sent to Joel's group where they'll follow up with the insurance information and Joel's group will reach out to the contractor and say, hey, have you spoken with this resident yet? Have you established communication? Which is the first step we ask. And after that, it would become a insurance matter between the two parties. Deputy, Minister to the council, or Deputy Mayor to the Councillor. Uh, yeah, what would happen? We have no ability to to impose a a standard of care of repair mm. on private property. The repair would be like kind and quality is typically how insurance works. Yeah. 
Uh, the, the determination of like quine and quality is between the, the property owner and the individual who did the damage of their insurance company. But we would have no standing in, you know, getting involved in whether or not repairs to private property were done to the satisfaction of the homeowner. Uh, what, uh, what Mr. York was saying is the damage to our property, to our sod, to our infrastructure will be picked up through calling through 311 and, and with those expectations as outlined. Mm. I guess that's the struggle that I have then that, uh, yeah, much as, uh, as Councillor Oath had uh, expressed. All right, no, appreciate that, thank you. <laughs> Councillor Smith. Thank you, Deputy, uh, and thanks, colleagues. This is a great discussion. So, uh, and it was it was mentioned uh, earlier uh, of, of some of the changes happening in North End that kind of deal with a, a lot of the issues we've seen in the past. And and, I've, and I'll say, you know, being the district that was usually on top of the list for the most snow complaints <laughs> uh, for a long time to now only be in the top three and four, I think kind of says that, <laughs> that the work and the changes that we've done has been working. Um, so there's only one piece that I feel is a gap between everything that we do here. So if, if uh, within the report, it kind of talks about the timelines of, of when we expect the work to be complete and uh, how we get to from when the complaint comes in and, and when it's, when it's uh, I guess, complete from the repair. And we have timelines, for example, uh, any urgent or safety related danger damage repair requiring immediate attention will be completed within 24 hours. Um, there's some other timelines within there, but we don't keep a timeline on when the repairs are complete. And I think you said that earlier, we don't track when the repair is complete. Uh, yeah, yeah, so we, we do tracks. So we have a master tracking sheet of all repairs that get submitted to us. Um, our supervisors go through in the spring and they're always communicating with the contractor um, individually to say, yeah, we have had these ones finished, this one's finished, this one finished for our infrastructure ourselves. Okay, so I must have mis I thought you I, I must have misheard that thing because I thought that you said we don't track the time from when repairs are complete or not. So if that's the case, then the deputy mayor to councillor, we don't track when the damage to private property is completed. We have oh, okay, no ability yes, to track. Okay, that's that's what I meant, sir. I should have been clear. Yeah. Okay, got you. We have no ability to track that. Right. So so. The question is, you know, understanding that we do re expect, and maybe this, maybe I'm misunderstanding this as well. So, the 24 hours to to respond to the the issue is that related to private property as well? Yes. Okay. So so then that, I guess that's still a gap. Then so if we have a timeline on when we expect them to respond to it, why are we not? Why do we not have a timeline or track when? repairs to private uh, properties come in and when they're complete. Uh, through the deputy uh, mayor to the councillor, because of the issues that the municipal solicitor has outlined where we're not a party to that claim. In order to do that, we would be putting ourselves into a, a what is a private process between the insurer and or contractor and the homeowner. But we do ask for the work to be completed by a, a specific date, June 1st. So th where I'm confused is there's no way for us to stay within the contract. When you receive a complaint, um, make us aware of when you, when you accept it and then make us aware when you've completed it and then we just track that for future dates. That can't happen? Our I, can, I like think I can, I think I can help with that. Okay. Um, Deputy Mayor, through you to the councillor. So, when the damage is on our property, the issue when it's resolved is when it's resolved to the satisfaction of the owner of the property. When the damage is on our property, then, then Steve and, and staff will determine, yes, they're satisfied and, and, it's, and it's fixed and, and satisfactory. When it's on private property, it would be up to the private property owner to decide whether they're satisfied with that or not. And we have no way of tracking that. They do not then respond back to us. And there's no way to force them to say, look, I'm satisfied that the contractor did. It's complaint driven. So what we hear is, I'm, I'm not satisfied. There's no way to really track whether or not the private property owner 
has had that resolved to their satisfaction or not. It's simply a matter that the complaints stop coming in, as it were. I, I don't mean to make light of it. No, no, I know what you mean. So, so there's there is that gap. We can't force the property owners and and the contractor necessarily. It is something I think to your point we could look at when we do the next round of contracts in terms of saying, listen, we would like some data from the contractor as to how many outstanding unresolved claims you have at any particular time and or how many have been resolved. But that's something I think for the next go round of the contract, yeah, certainly I'll, worth looking into. Yeah, and I'll just leave it there. I, I think that's simple. If a contractor gets a complaint, it's like if they make a list, this is we, when we got the complaints and this is when we we solved it with the resident. And then if we get that information, that's just great for us to have as, as a future. And I don't think that's difficult because I know they're tracking it as a contractor. Uh, so if that can be looked at, that's really where I'm, all I'm looking forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Smith. Councillor Outhit for a second go around. Um, thank you, Chair. And I think Lindell and John touched on this a little. I was wondering, you know, we, we, we have SLA, service level agreements, for when they have to dispatch, when they have to salt, <laughs> when they have to do, except they being the contractors. I don't understand why it couldn't be an SLA on when they have to address uh, a, a complaint on private property. What, what's gnawing at me, and, and you know, I was on council when we decided to go to, to uh, performance-based contracts, and then I was a little leery about it at first, and I've had a good experience with the contractor that we use. But the benefits of outsourcing were they have different varieties of equipment than we have, they have repair uh, facilities that we don't have, large repair facilities, they have flat rates versus worried about overtime and this sort of thing, benefits we don't have to provide, these sort of things. So there were benefits to us outsourcing and I think we would agree that those benefits were worth considering. But apparently there's a disadvantage though, <laughs> if you're a homeowner and the damage is done to your property by a contractor versus by the city directly. I mean, one, one could interpret it that way, even though that service provider, that contractor, is sort of acting as our agent, our representative. So I'm, I'm still, and, and John, I, I understand when the Motor Vehicle Act and, and Motor Vehicle Insurance come in here make it a little more complicated, so that, and that's fair, and thank you. But I don't understand why we can legislate everything else in our contractual agreements with them, I'll call them an SLA, service level agreements, that used to be this thick and are now this thick. I don't understand why we can't have some dispute resolution and why we can't have a, a time frame around, uh, you know, de dealing with mm -hmm. private property damage. It's just, that's not intuitive to me. Deputy Mayor, through you to the Councillor. So certainly we can embed in an SLA a response time. What we can't embed is the response which is to deny the claim or, or otherwise. And so that in part is because it's not entirely in the contractor's hands. Oftentimes it's in their insurance company's hands and the insurance company is going to, so that layers back into this whole piece. And yes, yeah, so I arguably there is somewhat of a downside, which, which I would suggest is offset on yeah. some of the other bits of it. And so that's just the nature of the beast. We can track it a little bit, but we can't, we can't factor in the decision that the insurance company or the contractor will make in response to the claim. Yes, thank you. thank you. Yes, I just wanted to add also that even if the service were delivered in house, like it used to be, um, there would still be a certain percentage of customers who would not be satisfied, oh. and we would still be dealing with delays in timelines in terms of insurance providers, you know, assessing claims. In theory, though, we would have more ability as council members and employees to help them, though. That was my, my point, but yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the list. I'm wondering if I can call on Councillor Lovelace to come uh, take the chair so I can close. <laughs>
Thank you, and thank you, colleagues. I was hoping to have a discussion on this because it's rather disheartening to get a report that just says you have no options. Um, and you know, there, the piece that came that's come out of this that actually I quite like was uh, Councillor Otis and Councillor Smith uh, talking about that in our next batch of contracts, we probably should be tracking some of this, and we probably should be mandating some response times in the contract for dealing with this stuff. Um, Although I thought we had a June or something that's already in there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I mean, I, I think Councillor Outit for me I really summed it up well about uh, you know example about they you have someone into your house they they break stuff and then uh, it's like well you know call Joe and Fred um, you know and the example off the front about the about a contractor and you know if your house get, uh, your neighbor's house gets damaged well. <laughs> As someone who just went through a house project and paid to fix his neighbor's house because his contractor left it was in the lurch, the example rings rather hollow <laughs> uh, because it's the right thing to do. Um, you know, I, the, I wasn't expecting much out of one and two, um, but you know, I, I think we do need to look at um, the handoff process here too, right? Like, you know, we talk about it with 311 all the time about, you know, a warm handoff, right? You know, if it's if we're sending someone over to Halifax Water or to 311, but I mean, with the contractors, it's no, you got to call, you got to con, here's your contractor, you got to contact them. And depending on your contractor, you know, that may go really well or it might be a, a bit, bit more painful. And, you know, and I, I do want to say too, like the, the, the other kind of piece of it, and, you know, um, you know, there's always learning to do around the room. Um, in my six years, I've never spoken with a contractor directly ever in my district because I've never seen that as my role. I've in fact saw that as completely something uh, to me, you know, um, is uh, not not appropriate for me to be doing, to be, you know, mucking in with the staff relationship there. Um, but maybe I've been maybe I've been doing my residence a disservice by not doing that based on you know what somewhat Councillor Cleary has shared in terms of like uh, trying to uh, produce some actual outcomes out of it for people and you know that is problematic if it's kind of up to well does your does your local councillor have a good relationship with their contractor or not I like that's not a good way to be running things so I I, I don't quite know what to do with this I had been kicking around the idea of a supplemental to try and build on uh, number three about that customer service handoff piece, some of those dynamics maybe coinciding with the next contract, but I'm not ready with that today, so uh, this is probably something I'm going to have to circle back around to. Thank you, colleagues. All right. Um, that's right where I left off with Councillor <laughs> Austin. So. Uh, ready for the question, colleagues? Okay, so that motion uh, carries, thank you. Uh, item 15.12, we have uh, passed on consent, that's the name change, Community Builders, Inc. 15.13 is first reading proposed bylaw P1203 respecting on-street parking permits. Councillor Smith. No one seemed to jump to the gun for this one, so uh, I move that Halifax Regional Council give first reading to bylaw P1203, amending bylaw P1200 on street parking permits, bylaw as said, attached to staff report dated January 16, 2023. Second. Anything on it? Oh, I just was waiting for you to give me the cue. Councillor Smith. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So. Uh, I don't know about other folks here, but this is one that I you know for me in my district I, I, I get a ton of complaints and concerns with so seeing some of these changes I, I, I think are worthwhile and, and as we have adopted new technology, I think it allows us to be a little bit more creative. So I appreciate some of the, the changes that have come forward. Uh, I'm just wondering in uh, I'm assuming there's no presentation or no. Okay, cool. So I'm just wondering if staff can just give a little bit of clarity, uh, maybe for myself and, and others that might be wondering how these changes will look. Um, one of the ones that I hear most uh, complaints about is the fact that multi-unit 
buildings, which is, has been kind of cleared in the, in the report, multi-unit buildings um, are not eligible to get the, the permits. So I just want, if you don't mind, just to talk a little bit about what this change is and how try to look at uh, dealing with, with those concerns uh, that we hear from residents. And the, the other one, which I'm very interested in as well, is related to the, the, the day use. And so, so I just, the process of residents accessing the day pass, because uh, I know there's different days, I think it was one, three, and seven, just how, how, I guess the lead time, how fast they can get them, what they need to do, is it something you could do at home? Just, because that would be something new. So I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about that as well. Good morning. Good morning, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor. I'm Jeff Nephew, Senior Advisor for Parking Services. Um, to answer your first question, we've looked at the availability or the eligibility requirements um, in an effort to try and balance the different demands for the curb use in the neighborhood. And four was four dwelling units was where we drew the line to say um, that that property wouldn't necessarily overwhelm the neighborhood with permits. So if we had an 80 unit building, still is a relatively small curb frontage if all of those pieces, if all those units were to have permits, um, it could be more than, 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 the, than the neighborhood streets could handle. So in, in a matter of managing capacity, we found that four units was the, the best place to, to draw that line. Um, with respect to your question on the day use visitor permits, uh, they would be available to anybody regardless of uh, residency status, so it could be from out of town, could be contractors, could be residents, and those um, with the adaptation of our new technology can be um, set up so that they're uh, effective immediately upon payment. So you can pay for the permit theoretically from your smartphone, park safely in the parking space, and have it become effective immediately. Would you use the hotspot? No, it would be through our, our AIMS permit app. That would, that would be the same way that you would purchase a resident permit now. Oh, okay, got you. Yeah. Okay, okay, so as long as they have access to that uh, app, then right. they, they can access the, the day pass pretty much immediately at once they pay. For you, Mr. Manager of the Council, yes, through our webpage you can access that portal and that would be how you would okay. connect. Okay, great, um, that's it for me, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Was there anything else to add, to Victoria Horn? Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the Councillor, Victoria Horn, Director of Parking Services. I just wanted to add to point one, Councillor. So we continue to monitor supply and demand of total inventory, and as that adjusts, we will come back to Council with recommended adjustments uh, for programming related to overall inventory. We do feel strongly, especially with amendments to center plan and encouraging residents when they're looking at, you know, purchasing a unit or renting, that they're considering whether or not they need a vehicle at all. Mm -hmm. And so we certainly don't want to um, create the impression that just because you're purchasing a unit without parking associated with it, that there will be parking available to you outside of your unit on street. Right. In, I don't know how much time do I have left, Mr. Mayor. 20 seconds. 20 seconds. Just one last one because it's not in here. I know we, we also hear about volunteers and service providers who feel like they should also be able to access that. So I was wondering if we can just talk a little bit of why that change hasn't been included in, in, in this year. Sure, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor. Uh, thank you, Councillor, for that question. So Council has debated on two different occasions specific permits for uh, service providers like Victorian Order of Nurses, for example. Uh, on those two occasions, Council has not voted in support of providing specific permits for that service. Instead, they've opted on the staff option of having this service provider type permit. So in consultation with Victorian Order of Nurses, but also other service provider industries, they found the permit to be inflexible or the fact that they had to come to visit the resident, return to their vehicle to place the permit in their vehicle to be cumbersome and not helpful. So the way it's set up now as staff are proposing is that it could be managed from their mobile device, from their computer or the resident themselves could purchase it for the service provider and manage it for as long as they needed. So it just provides more flexibility. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Clary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Ms. Horn, uh, for this. So I'm, f well, let me back up for a second. Uh, if I had my druthers, 
and I thought it would pass through here. Uh, I would vote to have actually paid parking on the street everywhere in the municipality, not just uh, in the urban core. Having uh, said that, uh, I don't think uh, my colleagues are ready for that just yet. But you know, in, in, in not too many years, it will be important. Um, but, and I'm fine with all of the changes in here, especially uh, changing the rates on the zones in the urban core. Some zones are obviously higher demand than others, and it makes perfect economic and environmental sense to charge more for high demand areas and less. So, you know, moving from like $40 to 35 in some of those zones, fine. Going up to 70, fine. Um, the one thing that I am concerned about, and it's a very small amount of revenue. So for car share, as an example, the proposal is to go from, um, I forget what the current fee is, 30, 60, something like that? 40. So to go from 40 to $100. Uh, there are, there's only one car share company at the moment in Halifax. Uh, I wish there were more. Um, and. The, the number of vehicles must obviously be relatively small because we're only raising uh, you know, a few thousand dollars from it. And the proposal to go to 100 is only going to raise an extra 5,900 for the entire fleet for the year. Uh, and the operational revenue increase you're looking at here is about 85,300. So it's a small portion of the overall. My concern is that, and I get the benefit, to moving to the new permit system so that they can park in other places, great. But we also, we're not increasing the amount of road available for them. So, you know, it's still going to be difficult for, for the flex fleet uh, to, to move around. And so, um, you know, just give me some, some comfort that, you know, it's not a whole lot of revenue to us, but it will be an extra expense to them. And we're trying to get more people to get rid of their cars, to pick up uh, car share to ride a bicycle to take transit. So going from 40 to 100, that's a, a large increase for them, small increase in revenue for us. Why that dramatic increase? Why not go to 60? Why not go to 75? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Uh, so CarShare is a member of our Parking Advisory Committee. Uh, we've met with them on two different occasions to talk with them about their service provision. Uh, they've indicated very healthy growth in their fleet. They're adding additional fleet this year. Uh, and they were very much appreciative of and looking forward to the increased flexibility that we're offering them with this permit. Uh, we also uh, socialized with them the permit uh, charge, and, and there were no concerns. So to, to justify the jump, uh, if Councillor recalls, we had come to Council, I think two years ago, Jeff, three, uh, proposing $100 per permit. At that time, councillors opted uh, to adjust that rate back down to the rate it is today uh, with concerns that it would impact the business. We've seen that to not be the case. The business has grown and flourished, which is great. And so really it's just about trying to align it with fair market value of, of what the spaces that they're using would be worth. We'd, this would not be passed on to the user. This is a private business that, that would has indicated for all intents and purposes, they're willing to absorb that cost. I will say that they have said that if the price continues to increase, that they would just adjust their flex fleet allocation. So, so really, to answer your question, the jump is arbitrary, but we just got to a place that we felt was relative to all of the other increases that we're imposing. Okay, and since I haven't received a phone call from them complaining, I'm as I'll assume that they're all good with this and that they see the benefit of that extra parking spaces that they're now allowed to use as a benefit to them. Okay, I'm satisfied with that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. Um, and I appreciate the, uh, the responses to the questions that I fired off uh, a little earlier on this. Um, I, I would like to bring one of them up and, and there was a, a, a new concern that I heard today. The first one is that uh, many of our apartment buildings are reducing the number of spaces that they have available um, and they are charging for the spaces that they have available. And I appreciate that the apartment buildings are responsible for providing a space for uh, the tenants that they expect to have the cars. Uh, I, I am concerned that uh, m as more of them move to the model that they are now where they're renting the spaces separately from the apartments, um, that they are going to continue to reduce the space and they're not going to meet that obligation. So I'm just wondering uh, if, if we're able to um, 
accommodate something about that in in uh, while well, you've got objective two that would that would address that. The, my my second concern that I picked up today was that someone needs the app to be able to get the visitor parking, um, and that's a concern. Uh, we are trying to not limit access to. Uh, to people who are visitors, to people who might not be uh, technology enabled. When I first read the report, I was envisioning that someone would go into a storefront and be able to purchase that. And then if they didn't have a phone, if they are renting a car, if they're a visitor, if they're on an, uh, if they're um, not te uh, technologically inclined, then the vendor at the store would be able to take care of that for them. But that's that doesn't sound like that's the case. And I'm just wondering if you could address both of those, please. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, I'll answer your second question because it's the easiest one. All of our, all of our payment, all of sorry, all of our permits, with the exception of the car share permit, which they apply for directly to us, are going to be available for purchase at storefront. So while the app or the website is the easiest way or the quickest way to obtain it, any of these permits would still be available for anybody to walk into Alderney or to Bears Road and purchase with cash at the counter. So if I'm driving to a place, to use Councillor Clare's example of, of let's have paid parking everywhere, frankly, I'd, uh, I, I could see there being a qualifier everywhere that there's a sidewalk, because that would leave out Sackville. Um, then uh, uh, then uh, we, we, that, that would be a little bit more encouraging, but to say, I'm going to visit someone near McMack Mall, that's fine, I don't have a phone, I have to drive down to Alderney pick up a visitor parking pass, drive back to McMack, is that what I heard you say? Uh, councillor, Mr. Mayor, through you to the councillor. So in that scenario, they could do that if they wanted, but they don't have to. So when they arrive at the residence, they can use a computer or the resident can apply on their behalf. So if I have a guest coming to stay at my house, I can pre-apply for them if I have their plate information and or when they arrive at the place of residence, they can apply. Or if they do not have a technology option, either the resident or the visitor can apply at any customer service center. If the resident and the visitor are my mother. Sure, yep, and, mine as well. Right, yep. and, and neither the resident nor the visitor have, uh, you know, are, are technology capable. Mm -hmm. Then it's not a problem. They leave where they're going, go down to Alderney, pick up the parking pass and go back to where they're going. So in that scenario, Councillor, yes, that would be what they would do, but that would be the same scenario that happens today. If they required a visitor permit, they would have to visit a customer service centre to, to receive one. Okay. I'm not terribly comfortable with that at all. It's not enough to turn over the report or to request a supplementary, but, uh, but I'm going to think about that and I'll be back. Sure, if I may, just to help alleviate your concerns, I would say that that instance of occurrence is extremely rare and would only be for residential areas that have exclusively paid or restricted parking. So at, in and around McMack Mall, for example, that would not be an issue, nor would it be in, in anywhere in your district. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lovely. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks for this uh, uh, discussion um, and staff report. Just a quick question, Victoria. Good to see you. Um, so it, you, you gave uh, Councillor Russell a couple of options. I'm just wondering, would one option be uh, for someone who doesn't have access to the technology or their technology know-how to just call 311 and say, hey, we need to register? Uh, is that an option? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, unfortunately, no, because 311 cannot accept payment over the phone. Uh, what I will say is that uh, in the vein of customer service and following the discussion previously, if we had an instance where, you know, it was an elderly resident that was unable to navigate or access the website and they had issues, and again, in the rare occurrence that they would receive a ticket, through the review process, we would certainly be extremely lenient uh, in, in our adjudication if they said, look, I, I tried, I'm visiting, I'm from out of town, I have no idea how to navigate your parking system. In that instance, we certainly would uh, Wonderful. Rev Thank you reverse so the ticket. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. 
Thank you. Nothing else? Ready for the question, colleagues? Thank you, uh, Ms. Horn and Mr. Nephew. That passes. Thank you. Fifteen point one point four has passed on consent. That's grant in lieu between HRM and the Halifax Regional Water Commission. Fifteen point one point five is the Rapid Housing Initiative Round Three. Pardon me. Move that to after lunch. I'm sorry, we didn't move 1515 that I know of. 1515 is on the agenda. It hasn't been moved. It's, it's on the floor now if somebody wants to put it on the floor. Councillor Mason. So I think the confusion, which may be true, and we'll ask, I'm looking to see who's still in the audience. Oh, they're here anyway. So you guys, so what I, so moving it till after me didn't help one little bit. Someone should have texted us, sorry about that. All right, I'll just put it on the floor to keep this moving along. I move that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to enter into Rapid Housing Initiative Agreement from Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation substantially in accordance with the draft form in attachment A of the staff report dated January 16th, 2023 to accept $11,028,364 for the creation of a minimum of 36 affordable housing units. I so move. Second. I wasn't planning to speak on this, so I don't really have anything to say. If anybody else would like to, that's great. Otherwise, question. Just for clarification, it was 1517 that we moved to after Correct. the rescission, not this one. Uh, Councillor Hensby on this. Uh, thank you much, Mr. Mayor. Um, from my experience of working with the uh, RHI projects round two, um, I'm finding, we're finding that the costs of construction is being higher than anticipated. So. I'm concerned that the project cost here for $11 million uh, may not be enough to achieve for 36 affordable units. I'm wondering uh, in regards to the program, are there going to be any flexibility for inflationary adjustments, either because of cost of materials, the cost of labor, or supply chain issues, because we're finding uh, trying to get things completed in a reasonable time fashion are being delayed because of the reality of what's going on there with, with suppliers and, and, ch and chain supply issues. So my concern is that um, folks that are making applications for the RHI3 initiative now are trying to try to keep their funds or trying to keep their construction costs close to the RHI2 projects, but it's just not realistic. And I want to know in regards to how we're going to try to implement this program when we know these pressures are real. Julie McClellan. All right, uh, through the Mayor to the council, Councillor, my name is Jill McClellan. I'm a Principal Planner with the Priority Planning Group and Planning and Development. Um, through our experience through uh, RHI Round 1 and Round 2, we have been much more uh, cautious when we're looking at the operating budgets to make sure there is quite a large buffer for contingency to allow for increase in costs for materials, increase in costs for trades. So we have um, had a much better success with the round two projects because there was that larger contingency. So as we're going through the submissions for our, for the round three or the projects that have been proposed to us, we're also you know very cautiously looking at those capital budgets to make sure that there's a large contingency in there to make sure that the cost won't go over. Okay, we'll see. Thank you, okay. Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. Um, this is a project that deals with housing, and considering the current housing crisis, my default answer is yes, and I look for reasons that it shouldn't be yes. Um, in this case, there are a number of them. Um, the risks as identified in the report are significant. Uh, the timing is dependent on other parties. Uh, we have a criteria in the report that says that uh, CMHC requires us to have certain building standards um, in excess of the fire code and things like that, that we cannot pass on to the contractor so they're able to do whatever and we are held liable on that. Um, we're already experiencing delays because uh, many developers are scrambling for both skilled workers and uh, as if, if I understand correctly, there are still supply chain issues. Um, what are, what are the options to back out of the agreement if we don't feel confident enough on March 15th? 
Uh, through the mayor to the councillor. So by entering into this agreement, should council, uh, once we get to March 15th, or even after we um, approve some of the projects, but feel as though they may not be able to meet the deadlines or they're not gonna be able to go forward, we can uh, retract from the agreement and just return all of the funds back to CMHC. And, and so if we have, uh if we have committed funds, if we have paid anything out for the evaluation of anything, uh, would we be on the hook for those or, or would they have to be contributed back to CMHC as well? So uh, through uh, through the mayor to the councillor, so we will be required to return the, the full funds back to CMHC. So um, how our agreements have worked with the previous rounds, if we, you know, we've worked with the non with the third party nonprofit groups um, that to have, to share some of the burden that we have with these agreements as well too. So we would work with the nonprofit to try to get the money returned and if they were unable to, then we would need to find another source to return those funds. Okay, thank you. And I'm wondering if you could address um, the concerns about the, the timing being dependent on others and the, and the building standards. Um, yeah, at least those two. Yeah, so through to the mayor to the councillor. So in regards to the energy efficiency standards, so for RHI round three, it's a little different than the earlier rounds of RHI, um, where we're required to meet uh, you know, certain parts of the energy code from 2015 and from 2017, depending on the type of the building. Um, from my understanding with our discussions with our, our building standards uh, uh, people, that's the standards that we're already requiring. So that would already comply with current HRM energy efficiency requirements. Um, the standard that CMHC is requiring would be the same throughout uh, Canada. So that's why um, it may be different for other municipalities, but for us, it's, it's already within our standards. For the accessibility bit, um, it's part of that contract that we would build into that third party agreement to require them to go above and beyond our current accessibility standards. So it's, um, we, we do that through that third party agreement. Okay, I thought I saw in the report that we, that we couldn't. And, and we, that's would, we wouldn't be able to do it through um, our, you know, as a land use bylaw provision, you know, or uh, through, through our permitting review saying you have to do this, it's through, without that, I guess, third party agreement to require that, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's great that we're seeing more funding coming from the federal government for affordable housing. Uh, you know, I just want to note um, how we stretched that with our partners in the last round to provide a lot more affordable units than um, required through the funding program. And I think that's really exciting. And I, I just want to, I noted in the report that, you know, we're, you know, the confidence with which we're moving forward and that we've already identified some partners for this and um, you know to Councillor Russell's points you know in terms of in terms of the confidence on being able to deliver um, I take it you know we have these relationships you have some confidence that we're going to be able to meet this we wouldn't be applying for this funding if that confidence didn't exist and I'm just wondering if you can just reassure us a little bit about that. For sure, so to the mayor, to the councillor, so for some clarification, we, we are not applying for this funding. CMHC has selected us as a, as a, a city stream uh, municipality. Um, however, though, you know, staff still still welcome this uh, welcome this program, um, and yes, based on the when we're doing our review of the submissions, we do do we do look at the viability of the organization and you know their past experience with doing you know these types of projects and uh, providing a deeply affordable housing as well too. So that's all looked into as part of our uh, consideration. I will also note too, um, in the previous rounds of RHI, projects have been given 12 months to do their to complete their development. However, in this third round we've been given up to 18 months and that 18 months will not start until the spring so until you know the projects are you know our projects are um, selected and approved by CMHC which we're expecting for May so we do have a, a I won't say a large window but a larger window than previous years to get these projects complete and CMHC has appreciated that 12 months is a very ambitious timeline hence why they extended it great thank you thank you Councillor Smith Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just on that last point around the, the more time and, and knowing a fair amount of the projects who received funding, you know, that 12, that 12 month that in the past was, was difficult. 18 months is great, but still concerned with, you have about a month or so to gather applications and have them, have them submitted and, you know, the, the requirements within the, um, what's needed to submit the applications. There's, it's a lot on nonprofits, so I'm just wondering, because I know how much work you've done the last couple rounds, um, have you kind of created a 
template quotation that allows you to kind of go through that process further. And we also know that this does take a lot of your resources as, as a department, as staff, to help support the nonprofits to get these applications in when this short turnaround. So I'm just wondering if you expect that you'll start to see some of that crunch happen again, because we know that some of our other uh, uh, discussions, one including short-term rental, was kind of put on the side because of, you know, we had money for affordable housing and that had to be, you know, pri reprioritized. So I'm just wondering if you if you think you might be in the same place you were before where you'll have to reprioritize to get these applications in. Yeah, so uh, through the mayor to the councillor. So the biggest crunch on staff's time is when we're kind of reviewing the submissions and doing the call for proposals. And so we're already in the middle of that. So this is kind of the busiest uh, point that we would be at. Not not to say that, you know, those will still be working with the nonprofits throughout the, the next year or 18 months to get the buildings completed. And then over the next, you know, several years while they're occupied, and you know, we're monitoring those. Um, however, though, I'm not anticipating that entering into a third agreement Will will have a you know a large impact on staff except for this period right now where we're trying to get everything together. All right, thank you. And then this last piece within the agreement too, it does talk about the fact that that the the recipient is is responsible for any cost overruns. So that is something that we have to think about of what that means for us because we know there's going to be overruns. It's just the nature of the business. So we just have to be aware of how we're going to deal with those if they come to our doorstep or not. So I just want to make sure folks are aware of that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Dale Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> one of my questions is about, <clears throat> sorry, I don't have much of a voice. Um, one of my questions is about the investment plan. And I know in the alternative, uh, there's an alternative there that is um, put that says, <clears throat> we could direct the CAFO to defer entering into it until the investment plan is done. What is the risk of seeing that full investment plan, um, waiting for that? I mean, you've got eight submissions of interest right now, but I guess I'm wondering, what is that risk? Um, through the mayor to the councillor. So I guess if we wanted to see the investment plan, that. So we do need to have our agreement signed with CMHC by February 15th. We don't have to have our investment plan completed by March 15th. Right. So we're proposing that we sign the agreement first to give us more time to go through the applications and have the confidence we need to have uh, the projects that we want to partner with uh, to bring those forward to you to council. Um, <coughs> so our plan, what our plan would be is should council approve entering into the agreement today, we would return to council um, in March 7th for that council meeting with the proposed projects. Should you want to enter the, to the agreement with the proposed projects as well too, we would need to do that before February 15th. So that would, would cut the amount of time that we'd have to review those submissions. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wanna just say a word on this. Uh, uh, thank you, Jillian, to you and your team, to Kelly, to everybody who's worked so hard on these. There's a lot of work for us on these rapid housing initiatives, but we, uh, Councillor Russell and Councillor Hensby have brought forward really legitimate issues, particularly around you know, cost and flexibility. Um, but I do recall the first round of RHI, we were asked to create 28 housing units, I believe, and we created 50 some. Um, and in the second time, similar. So I think we have lots of, uh, you know, flexibility on that. It's a danger, right? We, this is something I've talked to Minister Hussein about, the Minister of Housing. Uh, he knows that we're concerned about the fact that this is a great thing, but we get stuck with the overruns. But we have contributed directly to over 130 housing units in HRM through this, um, including the Overlook. Um, and some of these, most of these projects wouldn't have happened without rapid housing initiatives. So th these are housing, this is housing that we, uh, we do need uh, in this city. And I also want to thank the province. The province have been part of this. They've supported with the wraparound services on those initiatives. And provinces in a lot of cases were a little agitated that the feds work directly with municipalities, which I think is great, but I understand from a provincial point of view, they had to come after the fact, but they have supported this process. And I know from talking to the minister recently that uh, we'll be involved in, the province will be involved in having a look at this, I think, from the beginning. So I want to thank the province for that. All right, colleagues, ready for the question on this? Okay, that motion is carried. Colleagues, we will take our break and come back at one o'clock. So just to, as a reminder, we will be uh, doing our heritage hearings at uh, one o'clock, followed by the notice of Councillor uh, Cuddle. Um, and then, well, as it turns out, we will
No, we will be following that with 15.1.7. All right, public hearing tonight. We'll see you at one o'clock here for Heritage.
Okay, we're good to go, folks. Okay, we're back and we have uh, two heritage hearings in front of us, folks. <clears throat> the first one is case uh, H00541 to include 5812-14 North Street, Halifax in the Registry of Heritage Properties for the HRM. We will begin with a presentation from staff. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Devin Paris, and I am the Outreach and Research Coordinator with the African Nova Scotian Affairs Integration Office and Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, my former role when, I dra when drafting the staff report was with the Heritage Property Program, so this is why I'm presenting to all of you here today. Uh, before you is an application to include 5812-14 North Street to the Registry of Heritage Properties for the Halifax Regional Municipality. Staff have completed a preliminary review using the evaluation criteria for the registration of heritage buildings and provided a score by the Heritage Advisory Committee that I'll go through throughout my presentation. So here is a map of the surrounding neighborhood with a red rectangle outlining the subject property. So 581214 North Street is located just near the intersection of Robry Street and North Street in the north end of Halifax. Uh, this is a third-party application submitted by the Halifax Friends of the Common. The property has received extensive public attention in recent years due to its connection with the Halifax explosion and Dr. Clement Lagore, an African Nova Scotian physician who treated Hal or, or Halifax explosion survivors at his clinic, which was located at the property. So before you here is a scoring criteria. Uh, staff has elected to evaluate the subject property as a heritage building. The ca categories included in this evaluation are age, historical significance, the significance of the architect or builder, its architectural merit via its construction type, its architectural merit with its style, uh, its architectural integrity, and its relationship to the surrounding area. So I'll just go through each of these qu criteria briefly throughout the course of this presentation. Starting with age, the subject property was initially commissioned by Herbert Harlan and his wife Isabella. Uh, records in historic city directories list the site of the property as being vacant lots until the couple purchased the property in July of 1892. Based on the evidence in the historic city directories and ownership history, it is estimated that the building was constructed in 1892. Moving on to historical significance. The subject property has a strong association with both the 1917 Halifax explosion and African and African Nova Scotian history. The property was per the personal dwelling of Dr. Clement Lagour, Nova Scotia's first black doctor and the site of his Amanda private hospital, which Lagour ran in the early 20th century. Uh, the house is also associated with Nova Scotia's first African Canadian magazine, The Atlantic Advocate, which was edited and published by Dr. Lagour and operated out of the subject property as well. So a little bit of background on Dr. Lagour. In the winter of 1916, Dr. Lagour moved from Kickson, Ontario to Halifax with the intention of joining the number two construction battalion and as their medical officer. So after he was, after he was refused, Dr. Lagour helped with recruiting and raised over $2,000 for the battalion. In March of 1917, Dr. Lagour purchased the subject property then known as 166 North Street from the uh, merchant John W. DeWolf and outfitted the building to be used as both his residence and his private hospital, the Amanda Private Hospital. So the Amanda, the Amanda Private Hospital was near the areas most devastated by the 1917 Halifax explosion, and the Gore worked tirelessly treating Haligonians in the days and weeks following the explosion. Dr. Lagour and his team estimated that they treated over 180 patients a day in the weeks following the explosion, with all this work being done free of charge aside from a modest stipend awarded by the Halifax Relief Commission. Uh, Dr. Lagour conveyed the property back to the Dual family in 1921, and later passed away in May 23rd of that year. With the, uh, moving on to the significance of architect and builder. Um, evidence of the architect responsible for the design of the subject property is inconclusive, but an old collection of photographs pointed to the building being designed by Arthur Freeman Pelton, who was the architect and Halifax manager of the Rhodes Curry and Company, a construction firm. Uh, Pelton is most recognized for his work designing multiple Baptist church in Nova Scotia, including the Weston Baptist Church on Preston Street and the First Cornwallis Baptist Church in Upper Kennard. Uh, Curry and Company is well known for having built numerous prominent buildings across the Maritimes, including Halifax City Hall, the Halifax Post Office, University Hall at Acadia University, and numerous houses, courthouses, banks, schools, and churches across Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and New Brunswick. 
So moving on to architectural merit for the construction type. Uh, the subject property is a two-story building built with a light wood frame and is constructed with an L-shaped plan. It is built on the masonry foundation of stretcher bond brick. Uh, the eastern side of the foundation is obscured by a thick concrete block, re er, block reinforcing wall and the outside walls have vinyl siding. However, the front facade is clad in wooden shingles with several rows of decorative scallop shingles. With uh, architectural merit style, the subject property provides a strong example of the transition between the stylistic periods known as the Second Empire from 1860 to 1880 and the Queen's Anne Revival from 1885 to 1910. The influence of the Second Empire style is seen in the building's mansard roof, while elements of the Queen's Anne Revival style are present in its asymmetrical facade, its steeply pitched roof line, its circular tower, and its ornamentation. The character defining elements of the subject property include a mansard roof with a projection above the doorway, a uh, bracketed gable dormer with paired brackets, doorway with a double cornice, and a stretcher bond brick foundation and a two-story bay window. With architectural integrity, the subject property exhibits a moderate level of architectural integrity in respect to its layout, additions, and character-defining elements. Uh, the house retains its original L-shaped plan with one small single-story addition to the rear of the building. Many of the characters the defining elements of its unique transitional style are present, including the mansard roof, the bracketed dormer, the double cornice above the door, pilasters flanking the front doorway, its bay window and various moldings and brackets, its octangle, octangle turret roof, and uh, brick foundations. So by comparing the present building with the Arthur Freeman Pelton's photo of the building taken sometime shortly after the completion of the, of the building, we can see that elements of the original structure have been entirely lost over time. So these include the original front steps, the original front door and side light transom arrangement, the pyramidal turret with decorated gable, which was lost when the other half of the duplex was demolished. With the relationship to the surrounding area, the subject property bears a strong relationship to the surrounding neighborhood since the property is consistent with the neighborhood scale of primarily two and three story residences. Many of these residences were constructed during the same period and in similar architectural styles since many of the neighboring blocks were formed as part of the division of the former Young's Field in 1863. The immediate surrounding of the subject property consists of a mix of residential and commercial uses. The surrounding streets are home to multiple unregistered or contributing heritage properties, with some notable examples including the former J. Wesley Smith Memorial Church, which is now the All Nations Christian Reform Church, and the Maritime Telegraph and, and uh, Telephone Company building. The subject property, uh, 5816 North Street and, two, and 2590 Roby Street make up a trio of Queen Anne Revival inspired homes in the neighborhood. All in all, there are about 10, or there are 10 registered heritage properties in the surrounding area that further contribute to this, historic, or this neighborhood's historical character. So in terms of scoring by the Heritage Advisory Committee, the property scored 65 out of a possible 100 points. Um, 50 points is usually th is the threshold for a positive recommendation. So the subject property scored relatively well at the Heritage Advisory Committee. So based on the score that it received at the Heritage Advisory Committee, it is recommended that Regional Council approve the request to include 5812-14 North Street in the Registry of Heritage Properties. Um, if the Mayor and Council have any questions, then staff is prepared to answer any follow-up questions that anyone might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Devin. A question of clarification, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and great to see you, Devin. I wonder if we can have the presentation back up, back to the slide we're comparing today in the original property. And so, and I thought, is your, does your mouse work if you scroll on the screen by chance? Oh, it does. Can you can you tell me where? So, what we have today in um, what's left from today from the original picture, just to get an idea of where we're at in terms of the, the old property and the new. We'll yes. The current. So with the property now, this part, the left part of the building has been demolished. So it's this section right here and then this section right here that remains for the building. Okay. So the second, so the, there's the first door if we were coming, uh, yeah. So that's the current door now. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that's the end of the building on, on uh, Roby Street. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This would be the green portion of the building and this would be the gray portion of the building. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you. 
No other questions yep. of clarification? Then I'll open the heritage here. I don't believe the property owner is here. Okay. Um, if the property owner isn't here, then we can close the heritage hearing. Moved by Councillor Smith, seconded by Councillor Mason. All those in favor? Then that is carried. Uh, Councillor Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I will put the motion on the floor. And I want to make sure I have the right motion here. I move that Halifax Regional Council approve the request to include 5812, 5814 North Street, Halifax, and registry of heritage properties for the Halifax Regional Municipality as shown in attachment, so as shown on map one of the November 28, 2022 report as municipal heritage property under the Heritage Property Act. Seconded by <laughs> Councillor Stoddard, I think I saw. Uh, Councillor Smith. Anything? Thank you. I wonder before I uh, get into my remark, because I think it's an important piece that we just didn't cover during the presentation, just the difference between um, a third party heritage uh, registration um, and then a regular of why only the property owners can speak, just cause for folks who might not understand why we, no one else can have an opportunity to speak before I, before I go. So I don't know if. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and members of Regional Council, Aaron Murnahan, Principal Heritage Planner. Um, as with any heritage registration under the Heritage Property Act, only the property owner can speak. Um, and that is a standard across municipalities throughout Nova Scotia. And it's uh, a standard that we have, uh, have used here procedurally in HRM as well. So independent of whether it is a third party or an owner initiated or a council initiated initiated application uh, in all of those cases, only the property owner would be able to speak currently. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that was clear for folks. Um, so if you don't mind, I'll just, I'll just start. So, so I just wanted to say one thank you to staff and, and the work that was done to get to this point today and also uh, the community for bringing this forward, but also you know, bringing more attention to this property in general. Um, I'm going to put a, a motion forward that expands on our current motion, uh, but before I do that, I'll just really say that it's, there's two aspects I think that's really important for us to, to understand here today, and is one is that I know it's been shared that, that the owner was going to demolish this property, and you know I've had a discussion with the owner, and the owner was very clear that there was no intention to demolish this property whatsoever. Um, but also, it's important to understand that this property actually is outside of transportation reserve, and that's been one of the things that have been uh, discussed, that this property will be tore down by the city when we are looking at doing the transportation reserve on Roby Street. This is actually outside of that reserve, so the, the city is not intending to, to demolish this property at all uh, as well. So, so with that, the, the owner, when I spoke with, to them to understand where they were felt about this, they said no matter where the city goes, whether they decide to register or not, we support um, because at the end of the day, if, they, if it gets registered, they have the opportunity to use a heritage DA, which gives them more rights for development. Um, and if it doesn't get developed, then they just do what they feel they want to do. So no matter what, they're happy with whatever decision we make today. Um, but for, for me today, I believe that we should register the heritage property um, for, for vast uh, reasons, but uh, I'll leave those comments to when I put the other motion on the floor. But what I will say is it was very, you know, to see the correspondence that came in, I think was, was great, but also some of it I felt was a little um, uh, disingenuous, disingenuous if I must say, because I saw a lot of, well, this property uh, will preserve black heritage, which I don't think that we should rely on buildings to preserve black heritage. Um, there's much, a lot more to it. I can tell you if, if the, the great doctor from the work that we've seen would have done his work in any building in the city, uh, would have did his work in a tent in the, the commons. 
because I, I, so I don't believe saying that um, this building has somehow will preserve black history and uh, is, is, you know, unfortunate, but I understand because the, the work was done by the doctor in here and, and served many, many, many community members, so we must preserve that in some way. But really for me, it's looking at the bigger picture of how do we preserve the history um, in a, a, lo a larger sense rather than just a plaque. Um, so that's my motion I'm gonna bring forward after I hear from other colleagues looking at the broader um, aspect of what we can do to look at preserving this history in a bigger sense rather than just registering as a heritage property and kind of leaving it there. Um, so with that, I'll save the rest of my comments for when I come back with the motion and look forward to hearing, um, hopefully getting support from colleagues. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We've heard a lot about Mr. Lejour, sorry about that, um, as being the first uh, African-Canadian, African Nova Scotia medical doctor. We heard about him treating uh, over, um, I'm sorry, can't read my own notes, um, treating hundreds of the injured in Halifax during, this, during the Halifax explosion. We understood that he was co-founder of Number Two Construction, and he was the editor of the first black newspaper. Um, to Councillor Smith's point, very little is told about our Halifax history in toll. It's not just about the black history. Um, I would like to mention that our own Dr. Robert Strain has received a doctorate from the Clemens Lacure Award in 2021. This award honors a physician for their excellence during an unprecedented times. I would just like to add that. Thank you. Thank you. Very appropriate. Councillor Hensby. Hello, Mr. Mayor and, and Council. When opportunities like this are before us, I think we should take every opportunity as possible to preserve some of the heritage of the African Nova Scotia community. Um, we've heard about the opportunities to move forward in regards to the Viola, Des the Viola Desmond's um, beauty salon in Hel north end of Halifax, of so having that preserved. We recently seen the preservation of the, uh, the old Nova Scotia home for color children, now known as Kinney Place, being preserved and, and, and revigorated. Um, the story of this particular doctor came to light you know, when we did a research from the uh, Nova Scotia home on the 100th anniversary of the explosion of uh, 1917, because originally the home was supposed to open north end of Halifax. And we, we, we had a research uh, done by uh, David Woods, with the, uh, everybody knows him as an astound, uh, uh, accomplished uh, black artist and researcher. And he found the story about this particular doctor in regards to how much significant contribution he's made to, to the Halifax. And I think that this particular um, uh, place should have a place in our history. Uh, more than just, yes, it should have a plaque. It should become a part of a heritage trail of, of uh, significant uh, places in Halifax region uh, for the African Nova Scotia community. And I'll be supporting the application to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So there's late breaking news. So the, the motion that I intended to bring forward is actually because this is a hearing, this would be outside of that. So this has to be a notice of motion, which is fine. I, I'm not, I don't have any issue with that. But what I'll do for, for I'll just I'll read the intent of what, I'll, what that notice of motion will be, just in case folks don't stay to the end of the meeting to listen to the council. Um, so the, the intent of the motion was, uh, again, I'm not putting the motion on the floor. I'm just reading it for, for the, the record. Um, direct the CAO to provide options to regional council regarding potential future uses of the property that would recognize its historical importance including but not limited to one collaborating with the property owner to preserve and commemorate the property's history as part of a redevelopment to purchasing the property for preservation and redevelopment by the municipality or three purchasing the property with the goal of providing a space to nonprofit health care or affordable housing service providers associated with the African Nova Scotian community uh, in the North End. So, so the, 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 I, I've had discussions with the Nova Scotia Health, uh, Nova Scotia Brotherhood, which services the African Nova Scotia community related to health care. Um, and I'll be very clear that they are interested in having further discussions on this property potentially 
becoming um, a, a satellite healthcare service station uh, clinic or um, something along those lines. Again, I'll say clearly they are interested in having further conversations. They haven't committed to it, but they are aware of it. We had we had a very very quick discussion that they're interested in having those conversations. So, um, with that. With that, that's that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you uh, Councillor. I personally can't understand why anybody would leave before this meeting is over, but if they do, uh, you have explained what, what would happen. Um, okay, is there any uh, further discussion on this? Are we ready for the question? Uh, motion is passed. Thank you. And uh, thank you to staff. We will move to our next item, which is uh, item 12.2, case H00546, request to include 6221 Coburg Road in the Registry of Heritage Property. So we will begin with a presentation from staff. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Carl Boper McPhee. I am the Heritage Planning Researcher with HRM's Heritage Property Program, and this is my first such presentation, hopefully not my last. Uh, this is case H00546, the Heritage Registration Application for 6221 Coburg Road in Halifax. In June of 2022, a first party application was made by the property owners to consider the inclusion of 6221 Coburg Road in the Registry of Heritage Property for the Halifax Regional Municipality. The owner is in attendance in this meeting and will be making a statement in support of this registration. The subject property is located in the Old West End neighborhood on the northern side of Coburg Road between the intersections with Walnut Street and La Marchant Street. At their November 2022 meeting, the Heritage Advisory Committee evaluated the subject property using the six cri evaluation criteria shown here. I will go through each criterion summarizing staff's findings and I will outline the score awarded by HAC at the end of the presentation. The first such criterion is age. The subject dwelling, which was originally situated on a 10 acre plot of land, was, com uh, was completed sometime between 1790 and 1796, this being the time frame during which the property was owned by Lawrence Hartshorn. The deed history for the property shows a tenfold increase in property value over this time frame, suggesting the construction of a dwelling. The construction technology used in this home is consistent with this early time period, and as a proponent of agricultural improvement and having established a model farm in Dartmouth, Hartshorn had adequate reason to be buying and establishing another farm on this 10-acre plot. Hartshorn used his Dartmouth farmhouse as an occasional residence, so this too may have been used as an occasional residence, or he may have rented it to a tenant farmer. Next is historical importance. 6221 Coburg Road has associations with its original owner, Lawrence Hartshorn, and several generations of the Lowndes family. Uh, Lawrence Hartshorn was a prominent Quaker, abolitionist, businessman, and politician living in Halifax and Dartmouth. He's recorded as having freed an enslaved black family from Isaac Allen prior to his emigration from New York to Nova Scotia in 1783. Hartshorn was a hardware merchant, and in Dartmouth, he established a model farm as well as a grist mill and bakehouse operation with his business partner, Jonathan Tremaine. Among other roles, Hartshorn served as an MLA from 1793 to 1799 and as a member of the Council of Nova Scotia from 1801 to 1804 and 1807 till his death in 1822. Lawrence Hartshorn is especially notable for his role as chief assistant to John Clarkson in the project to transport willing black loyalists to the colony of Freedom Province in Sierra Leone. A bit of background on that project. The idea for a utopian free and equal colony in Sierra Leone was conceived by London-based abolitionist Granville Sharp. The first attempt at settlement was a tragic failure and the Sierra Leone company took over the project. Thomas Peters, a black loyalist from Nova Scotia, worked with Granville Sharp to convince the British government to pay for willing black loyalists in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick to be transported to Sierra Leone where they would be granted land. Peters was sent back to Nova Scotia with Naval Officer John Clarkson to spread news of the offer to the black loyalists. Neither the governor, 
nor most of the white populace wanted the black loyalists to leave Nova Scotia as white Nova Scotians had grown reliant on their continued exploitation for cheap labor. Despite efforts to stop them, the black loyalists, the black loyalists showed great interest in the offer and nearly 1,200 emigrants set sail for Sierra Leone. Hart Shorn, as chief assistant to Clarkson, helped spread the word of the company's offer, accompanying Clarkson on visits to Preston and Windsor, and assisting him in screening applicants, supervising the outfitting and provisioning of ships, and drafting and signing land grant certificates, among other duties. Ultimately, mismanagement by both the Sierra Leone Company and later the British government saw many broken promises and failures of governance. But the resilience and adaptability of the black loyalists led Sierra Leone to become an important trading port and underpins the history of Sierra Leone through the 19th and 20th centuries. After Hartshorn, the subject property was owned by members of the Lowndes family for 130 years, most notably including Matthew Lowndes Sr., a farmer and truckman who acquired the property from Hartshorn in 1796, William H. Lowndes, a carpenter, builder, and contractor who inherited one quarter of the farm and developed his and his brother's lands. He is credited with having built the houses highlighted in red on the map shown here. And Lillian Rent, the youngest child of William H. and his wife Elizabeth, she inherited the house and took out a series of loans against it, commissioning her brother Walter Francis Lowndes to renovate the house in an arts and crafts style in the 1910s. The house left the Lowndes family when it was foreclosed upon in 1926. Next is significant of the arch uh, significance of the architect or builder. Staff were unable to determine the original architect or builder for 6221 Coburg Road. However, Walter F. Lowndes is the builder responsible for the major arts and crafts renovation in the mid to late 1910s. The house owes many of its character defining elements to this 1910s renovation. Walter F. Lowndes was a builder and contractor who employed multiple carpenters. He's reported to have built 1568 and 1572 Walnut Street, and he likely also worked on his father's projects from the previous slide. He is connected to many permits for new builds and renovations around Halifax from 1892 to 1907. Next is architectural merit for construction type. The house at 6221 Coburg Road is a one and a half story home of timber frame construction built atop a coarse rubble foundation. The construction method of timber framing predates dimensional lumber and employs wooden joinery techniques such as mortise and tenon to fasten joints between large timbers as opposed to using metal hardware. Staff inspection of the home revealed a subtype of timber frame construction known as poteau et pièces coulissantes. This early form of nailless framed wall construction consists of vertical posts with grooves cut into them and either squared logs or thick sawn planks being slid into these grooves stacked one atop the other to form the exterior wall. This building technique is associated with the foreign Protestants who settled Lunenburg and with the settlers of New France and it's both a very rare and very early construction method. Next is architectural merit for style. This house was originally constructed in the Nova Scotian vernacular style, which is sometimes referred to as neoclassical or colonial. Character defining elements such as the one and a half story height, the steeply pitched gable roof, the symmetrical three bay facade and dual chimneys just inside the gable ends and dual dormers are characteristic of this vernacular style. The dwelling received an extensive renovation in the 1910s in the popular arts and crafts style. The arts and crafts is more of an artistic movement than merely a style and it inspired such styles as Craftsman, Bungalow, Foursquare, Colonial Revival and Tudor Revival. The dormers, which would have originally been either gabled or Scottish, were made three-sided with hipped roofs as commonly found on Foursquare homes. All the front windows were replaced with diapered or diamond pattern windows common on Craftsman style homes and the enclosed two-story front porch was added with its Craftsman style porch door. I've mentioned many of the character defining elements already, but the full list of CDEs is presented here. Please note that the coarse to rubble stone foundation has been added to the list of CDEs and is reflected in the form A for this property, but was missing from the original staff report. Next is architectural integrity. Uh, per standard two of the standards and guidelines for the conservation of historic places in Canada, second edition, uh, one must conserve changes to an historic place that over time have become character defining elements in their own right. And so it is with this in mind that the original summer kitchen addition and the arts and crafts elements of the home are considered part of the historical fabric of this house and are not considered to detract from the integrity of the original structure. The house has received multiple further additions, none of which are visible from the front elevation. Most of the dwelling's architectural features remain intact from the 1910s renovation forward. Most of the exterior's wood shingle cladding has been replaced or covered with aluminum siding and overall the structure's exterior is in declining condition with the roof, eaves and aluminum siding showing significant deterioration. The windows by contrast are generally in good to very good condition. 
Overall, the dwelling exhibits modest and reversible changes. And lastly, the relationship to the surrounding area. 6221 Coburg Road predates even the earliest large estates of the Old West End, such as the Studley Estate and Coburg Cottage. And with a construction date of between 1790 and 1796, it could be anywhere from the 8th to the 11th oldest building in HRM. The property is intimately related to many homes in the surrounding neighborhood that were built by members of the Lowndes family on the former Coburg, Coburg farmlands, including among them 6215 Coburg Road, the adjacent registered heritage property known as Toomey House. Other connections to local development patterns include the Lowndes family having sold part of the farmlands to the city to build the southern section of Walnut Street and selling part of, the part of the farmlands for the construction of the Old West End's first school on the present site of La Martian St. Thomas Elementary. For these reasons, this house is considered to be intimately re related to the surrounding area and is especially an especially valuable heritage asset for this area. When the Heritage Advisory Committee evaluated 6221 Coburg Road, Halifax, they awarded a total of 73 points out of a possible 100 points, with 50 being needed for a positive recommendation. Given this score of 73, the following positive recommendation is before Council for consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carter. There's no questions of clarification. And I will open uh, the uh, heritage hearing. I understand the applicants are here. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. Welcome to Council. Hi, everybody. This is just such a big day for us. I wanted to just start my remarks. And somebody wave at me if I talk too much, because I have the habit. Um, this guy um, here monitors all that stuff. But just give us your name and... Uh, oh, I'm Susie Giddy, along with my husband, Martin. Awesome. Thank Brief. you very much. So I just want to open my remarks by telling you that on January 15th, we went to the Maritime, uh, you know, the Atlantic Museum, because we had just watched the Titanic. And when we walked in, there was this committee of people who were part of the 1792 project, and the 1792 project was when the 15 boats went with the black loyalists, right? And we were just there for the Titanic, and the lady says, oh, we're here for the 1792 project, and she gave me this thing, and I was like, oh my goodness, we've just applied for our house who, with the Lawrence Hartshorn, who we call Larry, because Hartshorn's kind of hard to say, and she, she and I both just stood there with tears in our eyes at that coincidence. And it really speaks to why I just feel so strongly that this house needs to be a heritage property, because not only was he an abolitionist, abolitionist but you know he fought so hard for these people who had been treated so, so, so badly by Nova Scotia. And so when I sit in my living room at the fire, at fire at night with my husband, I actually think to myself, an abolitionist was in here, right? He freed four slaves, and it's quite a remarkable feeling and extremely powerful and something to be so proud of as if Martin and I somehow had something to do with helping the cause. And I also wanted to tell you just a little bit about the neighborhood and how our house tells a story because the way it was developed, because our house was sitting right there where it sits, and not really very much has changed in all these 230 plus years. So when I look out my back window, or from my bedroom or from my kitchen, I essentially see the very same thing that everybody else, Hartshorn would have seen, the Lowndes would have seen, because it just goes straight back. So there's barns there were, that were there when the, barn, when the um, Lowndes family were carpenters and built the neighborhood. So every day in our house, it tells a story of where we've been. And the last thing I wanted to share with you I told you that my name is Susie Giddy, but that's not 100% true. My name is actually Susanna Giddy, and it turns out that one of the first ladies of the house was named Susanna Lowndes, and there happened to have been a lot of Susannas in that house. And so what 
I'm hoping kind of a dream of mine is that you guys will approve it and when we get our plaque, we're going to have a plaque party and I have somebody who's making me a dress that would be just like the dress that Susanna Lowndes might have worn. So thank you very much for considering this. Our house is so special to us and we think that it deserves to be part of our heritage. Thank you. Well, Susie or Susanna, thank you very much. We don't allow clapping in council. If we did, I, I think I would have clapped for that. I think that's uh, <laughs> Thank you to you both. All right, does somebody want to propose that uh, we have a motion to close the public hearing? Closed by Councillor Mason, seconded by Councillor uh, Lovelace. All those in favor? That is carried, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it's my great pleasure to move that Halifax Regional Council approve the request to include 6221 Coburg Road in the Registry of Heritage Property from Halifax Regional Municipality as shown in Map 1 of November 24th, 2022, report as a Municipal Heritage Property under the Heritage Property Act. I so move. Second. Second. Councillor Stoddard, was it? Councillor Mason. I don't really have anything to add to that that I could follow that up with uh, other than I look forward to the plaque party. I thank you for bringing this forward. Uh, I've always admired, you know, I've lived in that neighborhood for 30 years and I went to Dalhousie and I've always admired uh, that building and the uh, set of buildings along the street there across from Howe Hall. And uh, I'm really glad to see it being registered and, and uh, added to the uniqueness of that area. So thank you so much for bringing that story forward to us today and, and to the staffer who presented. Yeah, I thought it was good. I think we can let you come back for another one after this like yeah you get a do-over yeah that's good anyway so yes thank you all very much for that I'd ask for council support thank you this is very much one of those occasions when you kind of say in debate what she said because uh, that's uh, that was very appropriate uh, ready for the question colleagues I'd like to thank uh, Carter for being here on his first uh, presentation. And I guess, Devin, this will be your last uh, presentation if you've moved on. So thank you both. That is carried. All right. It's been a while since I've been to a good plaque party. That would be, uh, that would be great fun. All right, we were going to continue with our agenda. Last thing we did before lunch was 1515, so we had decided that we would do the notice of rescission next, which is item 9.1, Councillor Cuttle. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I move that... Halifax Regional Council rescind the December 13th, 2022 Council request for a supplementary staff report in respect to item 15.1.11, case 22423, regulation of short-term rentals, the purpose of which is to bring forward debate on the deferred motion as amended. Thank you, Seconded Council. by Councillor Lovelace, Councillor Cuttle. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Um, you know, first I want to thank staff for helping me get this motion of rescission on the agenda. I realize that it's uh, something that's not done often, and um, given a motion of rescission requires a two-thirds vote, um, it's not something done without a lot of consideration. Uh, the motion of rescission specifically relates to the motion for a supplementary staff report asking for additional information regarding short-term rentals. A report that we heard could defer the matter on short-term re short rentals um, for six to 12 months. The time staff said they needed to try and do the research given that much of the information requested is currently not available. The vote for requesting the supplemental report was split eight in favor and six against, with three members of council not present due to circumstances beyond their control, um, including myself as I was out ill with uh, COVID. There's broad consensus that action related to short-term rentals is needed. Um, while Halifax has been a leader on many things, like Halifax, we're sadly behind when it comes to short-term rental regulations. It was almost a year ago that Charlottetown PEI passed short-term 
uh, rental regulations, where tourism is even more of a significant economic driver. The regulations on short-term rentals have been implemented in many other cities, and I would ask Council to support this motion of rescission to be able to further debate the action on regulations for four reasons. One is that there's an urgent need to address housing supply and demand. There's new provincial legislation coming into effect in April, and we need clear direction for those who operate Airbnbs and short-term rentals sooner rather than later. Uh, the information requested in the supplemental report is burdensome, and it's really unclear how it will inform future decisions, given that the quality of the data requested um, just isn't readily available or doesn't currently exist. And that, you know, stakeholders were consulted in this process um, in staff coming up with uh, their recommendations. So including, including Discover Halifax and everyone has agreed that um, some regulation is needed and that we really need to take a balanced approach. So the vote on the supplementary report was close enough that, you know, should we have had all members of council present, the outcome may have been different. And given the importance of the short-term rental issue, I think it's worth taking a second look at this and something worthy of more debate where all members of council have an opportunity to express their thoughts. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Cleary. Point of procedure, Councillor Mancini. <laughs> Process here, are we all allowed to debate what's on the floor now, or do, uh, can you, how does that work, John? Can you help us? Mr. Mayor, through you to Council, at this point, you would simply be debating the motion of rescission. Okay. Which is the request for the supplemental staff report. If that passes, staff is here today, to and, and we could proceed with, uh, with the deferred motion from the 13th. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And as a notice of rescission, it would require a two-thirds vote. Right. John. Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to, you know, debate the motion of rescission. I'm happy to debate the original motion again. Um, it's important. So I, the, the way the notice or the way the motion of rescission is worded, though, uh, there's actually three components to the supplemental staff report. So Councillor Austin, for example, has an aspect of the supplemental staff report. He asked for a sub report on proactive approach to enforcement and staffing requirements. Um, Councillor Smith, second of Mason, asked for a supplemental report on short-term rentals and secondary suites on the same lots as primary residents. So by rescinding the sub report, all that information, none of it will come back to us. Um, so my motion was a defer actually originally a referral to Committee of the Whole. We then talked about that and whether there was a desire, desire by councillors to have that. Then we went to uh, the deferral based on getting information back, which by the way was scheduled to come back, whether, and this was the mayor's idea, whether or not they had all the information, they would come back in the beginning of April so that we could meet the timeline of the province coming in with its regulations. And so, you know, the, the what are we now? the 24th of January, it's only another two months, and we'll have the sub report back to us, which includes the information for Councillors Austin, Deputy Mayor Austin now, and uh, Councillor Smith, that, uh, you know, I, I would hate to see us not get that information back uh, before we have a chance to vote on this. Especially, so if you look at, I think the number was around 2,000 units uh, at the end of July, August, whenever the, uh, the, they had the report from AirDNA, uh, doing a quick search on Airbnb right now, there's about 500 units available for January rental in Halifax, uh, just under nine or around 900 for February, just over 1,000 for March. So clearly, there's a seasonality to the Airbnb units. Uh, using what was in the staff report plus what came from the, uh, I forget the, the name of the group, the, the neighborhood group that uh, wanted to ban Air, Airbnbs in the first place. Uh, they estimate about 400 units would be non-compliant, so the 1,600 would still be allowed. Although that's an estimate, we don't actually have good data whether that 1600 is, is actually accurate or not. But nonetheless, let's say 400 uh, are non-compliant. We don't know how many of those are seasonal. So it might not be 400, it might be 100, 200, 300, we don't know. Uh, we also know because of um, where they are and if they're non-compliant because of zoning, they could easily 
if those uh, owners want, sell those properties in non-compliant areas and then buy areas in areas that are compliant. And if we look at the growth centers and the corridors, it's actually a, a quite a substantial area, uh, several uh, areas in Dartmouth, several areas on the peninsula where they could just buy that. And then there's no net increase in units. So when we asked staff to come back with some, in, some more information, whether they could get all of it or not was, was immaterial, but to come back with a little bit more information giving us some idea of how many of those might actually convert to long term, you know, that was to give us the sense that, you know what, we need to feel more confident in this. And if Councillor Smith's uh, idea and Mason's on um, uh, secondary and backyard suites, then maybe it's not 400, maybe it's only 100, maybe it's only 50, maybe it's none, we don't know. So until we get more information, I still don't know how we could make a reasonably informed, intelligent decision on whether or not we go ahead with the package staff brought forward. So I'm still in favor of getting order, more of that. Point of order here. Are we debating the, rescission. the motion or is this on the rescission? I'm giving the reasons why I don't think we should rescind. Yeah. We're still waiting for staff to come back with whatever information they can get between now and the beginning of April. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Mason. So uh, the way my motion was worded and, and what my intention was, was that because there's a there's an off ramp in the staff report that they're going to come back with more information uh, at a later date. Uh, but that we should their recommendation was to still go ahead with the regulation on short term rentals. So my expectation was that the secondary street report would come back at that point. But that wouldn't be I didn't write that amendment. Uh, assuming that we would have that before we voted on it. My thought was we would adopt the regulation, then we would get more information, we could amend it within six months to a year or whenever the other report came back. So I don't see that as an impediment. I intend to support the, the rescission. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, uh, you know, as a similar situation, the my understanding when I put forward my uh, motion regarding, you know, uh, the uh, enforcement, is that that would come back at a later time. I think if, uh, I, you know, maybe staff can clarify, but as I recall during that debate, they indicated that you weren't, we weren't gonna get that by April anyway. Like either of those pieces were just too much work um, for such a short time frame would require too much for us to get anything meaningful back on. So um, with that in mind, I mean, uh, I have no, problems revisiting this and you know I thank Councillor Cuddle for bringing it forward you know when I think about this and you know the two the two dominant reasons and it's hard to talk about it without getting into the debate of the main thing the two dominant things that I think of of like why we should rescind um, the one is that um, you know the provincial regulations are coming and I think we'd be in a better place to have our regulations very clear and set when that provincial registry goes live rather than potentially being in a place where people have registered with the problem and then a month or two later, the, our new bylaws come into effect and then people who had a valid registration before, then, well, now the, now the rules have changed. I think we would be better if we had our rules clear from the get-go. And then the other piece is, uh, you know, I know of um, buildings in my district that were apartment buildings that have become Airbnbs and that under the proposed rules would go back to being housing again for people. And so I think that's too pressing for me to ignore. So. Uh, I, I support the rescission and I don't think, uh, I, I suspect most of the data that would come back that Councillor Cleary is searching, searching for, if it's even available, um, it's not going to actually change the fundamental um, dis debate that we're having in the first place. So I, I support the rescission. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Cuddle, for getting this on the floor and, and getting us talking about this. You know, for the last four weeks, um, some I've been having great conversations with some of you about the urgency uh, of acting on short-term rentals and the confusion uh, that's in the public, because on one hand, they're being told they need to get ready and register uh, with the province, and on the other hand, they're uh, not quite sure what the municipality is gonna do, and so they're just investing in uh, expanding their Airbnb uh, investment opportunities, and uh, as, as Council, oh, sorry, Deputy Mayor Austin just pointed out, and then they're gonna be told that it's illegal, it's not compliant. They've already invested all this money into it. So I, I do think that there's a sense of urgency here, um, not only because of the provincial legislation, but it's our due diligence to ensure that the public understands 
the landscape of what is happening, mm -hmm. not only with the housing uh, crisis that we have right now, um, the lack of um, uh, housing units that are now Airbnbs or soon to be Airbnbs, but I think too, as people are getting ready for the um, tourism uh, you know, season that's coming up, they're spending a lot of money uh, upgrading or fixing um, apartments uh, that are now short-term rentals. So is it, you know, it just seems really unfair to, to then turn around and, and tell them that their investment uh, was not worthwhile and, um, you know, you're, you're, it, it, you have to now change um, because the municipality has changed the bylaw on you, yet the province has approved your registration. And the other thing I think that's really important is that we move forward with a public hearing sooner than later. I don't think that the pieces that we're debating uh, in, in the uh, deferral, all, all that, potential data that we may or may not have changes um, the water and the beans. We need to move forward with short-term rental registration. There's no doubt about it. But the longer we wait, uh, the less housing there will be, and the more uh, potential uh, long-term units will be turned into short-term units. And the other thing is I think that there was some confusion um, at the last debate where, uh, in on December 13th, where there was um, a concern that this somehow was impacting rural areas when staff, I think, were, were quite clear that we're not talking about the rural areas right now with short-term rentals um, because that's a, that's a different animal. You know, rural areas don't have hotels. They don't have the tourism accommodations um, like uh, urban and suburban areas. So it's important for us to think about ways that we can work with those rural communities to ensure that those land use bylaws are updated um, and, and relevant and appropriate for those communities. So again, I just, I, I urge you to uh, approve this deferral. This is a sober second thought. Um, and a means for us to get prepared for that April 1st deadline and ensure that citizens, residents, property owners uh, across HRM are aware of where we stand. Um, and also we have a chance to hear from them at a public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Russell uh, on the deferral. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so we've been talking about the deferral and, and I'm wondering, uh, th this is in relation to uh, the report that was discussed in December 13th when we had a different CAO. Wondering if we could hear from uh, staff on what might be ready in a report by April 1st. And if we don't have um, enough of the right information in the report on April 1st, that, that might change how, uh, how people think about uh, the deferral as far as a, a, a hotel in the rural area. We don't have one in Sackville. So, uh, some some people from that m might think that Sackville is rural, but I'm getting a little bit off the uh, a, a little off bit off the rescission, but a little bit off. I, I think yep. that's a relevant question to ask yeah, staff if there's somebody who can speak to what information realistically could come forward. Jillian and Kate, I think, can speak to this. Hey guys. So, hello. Uh, so, Jill McClellan again, Principal Planner with uh, Planning and Development. Um, through the Mayor to the Councillor. So, the motion that was passed on December 13th asked us to focus on four main items. So, that includes the number and percentage of short term rental listings that will be illegal, non compliant under the proposed changes, an estimate of the number of units that will convert to long term uh, from short term rentals. So, to kind of get an understanding as to how um, short term regulations have impacted other cities. Um, the impact of the proposed changes um, on short-term rentals that were allowed on the same lot as a residence, but not their primary residence, so that would be a second unit or secondary suite. Um, and then the results of consultation with the tourism industry. So we were asked to go back and, and do some further engagement with the tourism industry. I'm going to let Brandon speak a little bit further to what we expect we can get by, um, by, by April 1st, because knowing the exact number of short-term rentals, that's, would be, we'll need that registry information to get that, so that part will be um, harder to get, but I'll let Brandon speak further to that. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to the councillors. Just in, in initially starting to lay out the, the work for that, estimating the number of units that will return to the long-term market is, is not an easy task. Not many cities have done 
the analysis of how many units have done that precisely, but we could, what we've thought about is looking at uh, the, for Toronto for example has tried to estimate the number of units that have returned to the long-term market, so using their numbers to maybe apply them to the number of units that we have and see what that rate might be. So just looking in the few jurisdictions, but in most cases the jurisdictions have adopted the regulations and then seen after the fact how many of those units have returned to the long-term market. Not, I haven't seen any that have done that analysis up beforehand. Okay. So I think uh, Council's interested in <clears throat> your answer to the question, how much of the information that's being requested would be available by April the 1st? Um, so yeah, through the Mayor to the Councillor, I think we'll be able to do some information to understand the amount of properties that are zoned R2 or can have up to two units on there to kind of understand um, how many potential, you know, secondary suites you could have or additional units you could have. We would look at those properties located within the um, zones that would allow for short-term rentals to kind of understand what that impact could be. Um, the number of short-term rental listings that would be illegal or non-compliant, I mean, we're still going to be relying on air DNA data, so it's not going to be 100% accurate. So it's similar to the responses that we would have had last December. Um, you know, we're still working with our, with our GIS groups to, you know, to find that any further than we can, but we're still using data that's, you know, not not exact. So, so that part will be might be a little difficult. Um, and then in regards with engagement with the tourism industry, we've already been uh, having conversations with Discover Halifax, um, and we'll be you know looking to re-engage with some of the folks that we had engaged as part of the last report as well too, just to make sure everyone still understands what how the proposed regulations would work. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Based on this, I'm, I'm happy to uh, move forward with the rescission. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Cleary. So just, I'll start with the just procedural stuff. So just to clarify from staff, from especially legal staff, um, if this rescission pass is given the way it's worded, because it says rescind for the SUP report, doesn't say rescind the deferral, uh, that means we go back to the main motion before SUP reports were requested? Correct. Okay, so all of the SUP reports, if you want them, you'd have to move them again. Uh, assuming that the matter is debated and discussed today, then they wouldn't be a supplemental, it'll be an additional, or just move, move for a report for further information, right? But, but we haven't actually voted on the other motion yet, so we deferred it. So we would have Correct. to go back to debate. Correct. Correct. Right. Right. And the, depending on the outcome of that, if the matter is decided and you still wish that information, you know, from that the two councillors had asked for, in addition, yeah. you would move so additional motions. So we do go motions. back to the beginning in terms of, we're back at that main motion voting. The main motion's motion. on the floor for first reading and that would be the debate and discussion today. Okay. Um, so given that, you know, I, I don't want to see us have to go through all that again and then ask staff for more SUP reports, whether they are hold things up or come back later. Um, the number one goal, as was laid out, was to convert units from short term to long term. That was what we were talking about with case 22423. So I guess if, if no one cares to know an estimate of how many units will be converted, then I guess we go ahead blind and just say, sure, regulate based on what you're proposing without having any idea what your number one goal will actually achieve. Okay, that's fine. So I'll still vote, I'll vote no on the rescission because I do want an estimate. And just to clarify, we're not voting, this is to Councillor Lovelace's point, we're not voting on the registration today on, with this motion and that case. That's actually on the agenda today under all rental registrations, short term and long term. That's a separate motion we'll be voting on later today. So they're, the two, you can't conflate the two. They're two separate things that'll happen at different times in different processes. So anyway, I, I always go for more evidence when we make as a core value of our council that we adopted six years ago, evidence-based decision making. I'll always vote to get more evidence when we make major decisions and we don't actually have an estimate of what the impact will be. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cuttle. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, you know, just want to reiterate again that there's broad consensus from the community and stakeholders that regulations on short-term rentals are required. Um, now it is a completely unregulated industry and it's having a significant impact on our housing and our neighbourhoods. The original vote for the supplementary report was close. 
and there were a number of councillors missing from that debate, and I think it's worth having, as Councillor Lovelace said, a second sober thought on this discussion. The information that is being requested does not exist and won't exist until we start to have Airbnbs or short-term rentals actually register themselves. So you know what, there's an opportunity to move forward. We are not leading the pack here. This has been done in many other places. We've been looking at this for several years now. The issues have been well established. I think now is the time to take action on this and, um, and to open this up to public hearing to a public hearing so we can hear from so we can hear from the public on you know what the issues are um, on on both sides so um, I really hope that we can as a council rescind this motion for a supplementary report and bring it back to the debate of the original motion that was presented in December and um, and look at uh, what those other amendments were around enforcement and um, secondary suites. Thank you. Okay. Question. So um, the notice of rescission is on the floor. It, uh, where there are 16 councillors here, it would require 11 votes. Uh, Ian, 11 votes. Ready for the question, colleagues? Okay. That's notice of rescission is carried. Okay, so this is the original motion from December 13th. The main motion was amended during the meeting, so this is the motion from the meeting as amended prior to the deferral. So the, the requests for information that Councillor Cleary referenced were part of the deferral motion and not part of what was on the floor, correct? That is correct. Okay, all right, Councillor Cuttle. I'm just wondering, a point of procedure here, do we have to put this motion back on the floor or it's just automatic, it doesn't, it's just automatically on? It's on the floor now. It. All right, thank you. Councillor Smith. Thank you, I'm just looking for clarification. So looking at, so we just got handed the, the information from the clerk, so thank you very much. So the motion that is in front of us uh, that we just received has three points. Get first reading, direct chief officer, staff report around the urban service area boundary, and then the short-term resident secondary suites. The the motion that Councillor Austin or Deputy Mayor Austin, is that one not here as well? It's part of number three. Uh, staff requirements, funding, options, carry out. Okay, so, so your motion was was included and put together to three. Okay, so does that mean that if we want those um, supplementary reports, we have those would have to be moved after a vote on the main motion? Like, how do we get to that point? So the okay. motion on the floor is the motion that was amended prior to the motion of deferral. So it includes um, <clears throat> either either um, completely or or is subsumed into a recommendation. The motions of Councillor, uh, Deputy Mayor Austin and Councillor Mason and yourself, yeah. I believe. So that's, but that's different than what Councillor Cleary asked John earlier related to the supplementary reports would not be. Yeah, no, I think, I think there was confusion around that. John, can you just clarify yeah. that? Yeah, so there was, as you recall on <laughs> December 13th, there was some amendments to the main motion. Right. They're, they're captured in what you have in front of you on the front page. Okay. In addition, there was, I think, three or four items that there were the topic or made the topic of a supplemental report, which was to come um, as a result of the deferral. They are not included, All right? So 
those items that you were looking for in a supplemental report are not included in that. They would have to add it again. They would, ha they would, they would, after this has been dealt with, if you still wish further information, you know, to follow up later, you would move a motion for a staff report okay. and it would come as an information report. And deferral could be put on the floor You could, again, put a motion of deferral on the floor at some point, yeah. Okay, all right, I just want that clarification before we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Sorry, just following sorry up on if that. I may, <laughs> just John? to be to be clear, having having moved a motion of rescission at two thirds to put it back on the floor today, you're going to need two thirds to defer it again. At this point, you're just going to be undoing what what we just decided <laughs> before you start a procedural di uh, you know duel here. Can we, can we reset Councillor Cleary's time at five minutes? So, Councillor Cleary. Uh, well, actually, just um, so first question is back to the solicitor. So, given the way the rescission was worded, uh, number three in front of us is asking for a supplementary report. So it, the, the rescission wasn't to uh, just on the deferral and that particular supplementary report, it was on a supplementary report. So I'm not sure how we can have a supplementary report. It, yes, it was an amended motion, but we never got to vote on the motion. Mr. Mayor, through your chair, I am mistaken. You're right, there is a supplemental report embedded in this, which I missed. So you could, that is already on the floor and that could be amended further if there was additional information, but that would come after the, the debate and the decision on the first reading and everything else. Okay, so then I would like to amend number three um, and I won't uh, ask for all the information that I asked for before, because uh, clearly there's no desire to get that. Um, so what I would ask for, just got to go and bring up, all right, where did it go? Uh, so I would like to have um, an amendment that would include in the supplementary report uh, information uh, uh, in, the, in terms of the proposed changes for uh, short-term rental, if it was allowed on the same lot as the resident, uh, not just in their uh, backyard or secondary suite, as Councillor Mason said, but let's say, for example, they have a duplex. So that's not a secondary suite, that's a second unit, but it's on the same lot. Uh, and so uh, I would like that included. It was uh, number three on my original uh, motion there. So really it just adds to what Councillor Mason was saying. So if we could have a secondary or backyard suite on the same lot, I don't see the difference of having a full size unit because a secondary suite could be 800 square feet, whereas a secondary or a, like a, a second uh, unit could even be smaller than that, but it would be a second unit in a duplex as an example, or it could be bigger than that, a thousand square feet, which would not be considered a secondary unit. So my amendment would be to add to number three also looking at not just secondary suites, but second units on the same lot where the primary resident resides. Seconded by Councillor Hensby. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. So I'm not going to go over everything. That was seconded everything. by Councillor Hensby. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Councillor so, Clear. So just to be clear, you're you're amending number three yeah. to say not just secondary, but it says secondary units, short-term yeah. rentals in. Uh, secondary units and second units, if you want to call them. Secondary units and second. Is that a, the right terminology? And second, I'll leave it to the planners to figure out what the exact terminology would be, but they understand what I mean by not accessory unit, but just another main unit on the same lot. But what? Secondary and second units. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and because uh, I know a, a number of residents who've contacted me that that's what they have done. Uh, uh, you know, it's not a secondary suite, but it's a second unit uh, because they're zoned to uh, allow that. Uh, I would still love to get more information on an estimate of how many units would actually convert, but uh, hopefully staff can figure out another way to do that, uh, but I won't put it in the motion. Thank you. Is everybody clear on that amendment? That amendment is now on the floor, unless it's considered friendly. Um, what's that? I'm not sure if it moved and seconded this 
Okay. Count, uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I have no problem um, going for this information. I'm just wondering if, uh, if, we're, if the goal is to look at uh, other units on the same lot rather than trying to draw distinctions between the two, why don't we just amend the motion so there's a report so that council may consider uh, short-term rentals in units on the same lot as the residents' primary and stop trying to define the two. And then when the report comes back, our capable staff can go over the different permutations for us. I don't think we need it inherently in the motion. Sorry? What Sean was saying is the same lot, whereas a duplex that was occupied. Because sometimes, sometimes a duplex is two separate lots. Sometimes it's actually one lot. So right now, the, the amendment reads to add uh, secondary and second units on the same lot. You saying we should change that? I, I was just making the suggestion like, that we may consider short-term rentals in units on the same lot as the residence primary, and then that covers every possible situation of having a unit on the same lot and uh, gets us out of trying to say, well, secondary, secondary, what other permutations do we need to throw in here? Yeah, okay. So council, staff understand uh, what we're talking about? Okay. So do we need to change it? Leave it as it is, okay. Leave it as Councillor Cleary said. It's understood by staff what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. What's that? Sorry, leave it as it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Is, so on the amendment, is there anybody else? On the amendment. So on the amendment of Councillor Cleary, we're ready for the question. So that amendment is carried. So the motion is now amended. Any other discussion on the motion? You ready for the question on the motion as amended? This is the main motion as, oh, hang on. Councillor Cuddle on the main oh, motion. Wait. Yes, yeah, sorry, you can tick me off that now. Councillor Cuddle's okay. Councillor Lovelace on the, you okay? No, I, something's going on here. I'm on and then I'm off and then my button's on and my button's off. So I'm good, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> yes, you are. Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I do have, a, first of all, I agree that we need regulations for short-term rentals. I think most of us agree with that. Um, I do have a question uh, if staff can come forward. Uh, And thank you both on this file. I, this was not an easy file, and I appreciate the work. So the, the province's registry, is that up now? Uh, through the mayor to the councillor, yes. The province has a registry system that is currently up. And are people being requested to, to register now? Uh, at the moment, all uh, commercial short-term rentals are required to register. Uh, those that are in one's primary residence will be required as of April 1st as of April 1st. So if this passes today, now, now I didn't realize the registry was up. Uh, if this passes today, what happens next? What does what staff do? What are the next steps? Are we enacting the, this, these regulations? Uh, uh, the notice is going out to those. Where, how are we determining who's got the illegal uh, uh, units, et cetera? Uh, through the mayor to the councillor, there will be a public hearing that will be held, required to be held before council can make a final decision on the uh, on the proposed amendment, right. so this is just first reading that's right. being considered right now. Right, so we're not activated. Okay. Um, all right. Um, okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Russell. Hmm. Thank you very much, and I apologize for missing the uh, earlier meeting on this. So my questions might have been answered. I'm just not sure. I didn't watch the video. Um, I'm, I'm just curious. Um, three things. Are we, so the province has a registry, are we able to access that registry? Uh, the second question is, uh, would, this, would the legislation cover those spaces that are listed on 
uh, not your sites like Airbnb, but things like uh, Facebook Marketplace or Kijiji. And my third question is, what would be the fines if uh, someone is found to be in violation? Has that uh, schedule been set yet? So through the mayor to the councillor. So um, the province has agreed uh, to share their data from the registry with us, so we will have access to that. Um, in regards to where it will apply, it will apply to anybody who's offering their unit as a short-term rental, so whatever means they're using to advertise it. Um, they, they'll be required to have a registration number that's provided by the province, and that will be up to the province to enforce. Um, and then regarding fines for the um, uh, not registering your property, I don't have that information um, I'm with me at the moment, but we can find that for the public hearing, and I'll contact my colleagues with the province to get that information regarding, okay. and again, that would be within the uh, provincial registration or regulations. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Hensley. Just to follow up in uh, Councillor Russell's comments in regards to that provincial database, will we be cross-referencing that in regards to see if, if these units, um, these Airbnb uh, short-term rental facilities are compliant to the local zoning? Uh, through the mayor to the councillor, yes. So as part of the rental registry, someone, the, the short-term rental host or operator is going to need to verify, they're just gonna to need to click on a box stating that they meet municipal land use bylaws. So by the province sharing that information, we can then go through each of those properties to ensure that they actually comply with our bylaw requirements. And should they not, we'll let the province know and the province will then remove them from the registry and tell the, plat the platforms that they're partnered with to remove them from their listings. So do we have on assigned to provide these zoning confirmation letters? I'm sure we're gonna have plenty of requests for them and maybe a little bump in revenue for the amount that they're out there, so. Um, through the mayor to the councillor, the province isn't gonna ask for the zoning confirmation letters or require any supporting data when somebody uh, registers. So they're leaving it up to us to go through the list that is uh, provided by the province to make sure that they're actually in compliance. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clary. Just a quick, very procedural. Uh, when will the public hearing be? And I know the province changed our requirements for notice and advertising. So do we have a plan on how we're promoting the public hearing uh, beyond kind of just putting it on our website kind of thing? Mayor, to the councillor, we'll work with the clerk's office to determine when the date would be for the public hearing. I, I, I don't want to suggest any dates at the moment without verifying with them. Um, and then we can, uh, yeah, definitely uh, look at doing, uh, you know, a larger um, public, uh, in, <laughs> larger notification for the public hearing, um, you know, to make sure that residents are, are well aware that this is happening. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, staff. Um, Okay, are we ready for the question on the main motion as amended? Okay, that is carried. Thank you, colleagues. So that is that. Uh, we agreed to move. Uh, we agreed to move 1517 up. So we will look at 1517. I believe we do have a presentation on this. Shall we hear the presentation first and then go to Councillor Mason after that? Okay. This is uh, first reading respecting registration of residential rental properties. All right, um, so I believe council knows that I am Jill McClellan, principal planner with uh, planning and development. <laughs> yeah, you know what, I know a long time to see. So you, you, you were this morning and earlier this afternoon. Exactly, so yes, but. yes, it has not changed. <laughs> we agreed to move 1517 up because it's the same staff uh, uh, issues. So All thank right. you, that was before some folks were able to get here, thank you. Um, I will acknowledge that I am joined by, uh, by my colleagues, uh, Peter Duncan, who's the Director of Engineering and Building Standards, and Dawson uh, Patterson, who's the Acting Manager of Building Standards as well, too. And we're here today to discuss the uh, proposed bylaw, R400, respecting the registration of residential rental properties, and amendments to uh, bylaw M200, which respects standards to the residential occupancies. 
So the development of a rental registry, this is, this is not a new item for Council. The idea of the registry or licensing program was first discussed through a motion of Halifax and West Community Council in 2013. And over the next several years, um, that included a different additional motions and reports discussing updates to our minimum standards bylaws. Between 2017 and 2018, staff engaged Stantec Consulting to further explore the development, development of a licensing or registry program. Um, and to further undertake uh, community and stakeholder en holder engagement. The engagement consisted of strategic interviews and focus group discussions with regulators, landlords, tenant representatives and advocates, and tenants themselves. Work from the Stantec uh, 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 report and their work was presented to Council in April of 2019, where Council provided further direction to explore a rental registry instead of doing a licensing program, and they, propo and they appro approved the proposed framework for such, the program, such a program. Um, so the rental registry framework that was endorsed by Council in 2019 includes five main themes. So one is to develop a building registry, so this would be a mandatory registration for all residential rental properties. The second was for strategic um, inspections and regulations. So this includes you doing inspections using evidence-based uh, decision-making to target high-risk properties. The third was to uh, build a framework around safety requirements, so establishing safety regulations that are applied based on, uh, based on uh, risk and building classification. Um, it further looked to do community integration and education, so making sure that there was program and educational packages designed to inform tenants of their rights and responsibilities um, and the impact to the surrounding community. And also looking at accountability, so enhancing the accountability for property owners through, through making sure there were proper penalties. So while the direction that was provided to staff in uh, April 2019 was for staff to include the rental registry as part of the M200 bylaw, upon further review, staff are recommending that a separate registry be adopted. And as such, we're also including complementary amendments to the M200 bylaw um, to, 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 be, to accompany this bylaw. Um, the adoption of, through the adoption of R400, staff will establish the framework for the registry and require all residential rental properties to register. This is with the exception of any properties that are licensed under the Home Service Special Care Act or are owner-occupied uh, dwellings that are in land lease communities. Um, we do appreciate that there's going to be many residential properties, so we want to make sure you know, people have the adequate amount of time to register. So as such, we're proposing a deadline for registration of April 1st, 2024. Beyond requiring information uh, regarding the property owner, uh, property management, the dwelling, um, the proposed R400 will also require that uh, residential property owners have, um, have a maintenance plan to ensure maintenance of the buildings is, is being considered. And as emphasized in the December 1st, 2020 motion, uh, we do appreciate that you know, any by strong bylaw is gonna need really strong fines for enforcement. So we wanna make sure that there's, you know, we have fines ranging from $150 to 10,000, uh, depending on the, uh, the violation. Oh. Um, the amendments to the M200 uh, bylaw will strengthen existing provisions to include more clarity on building maintenance. These provisions will be important in informing the development of property maintenance plans that will be now required under R400 and will allow for building officials to enforce additional maintenance requirements when we're doing M200 inspections. So should council approve the adoption of R400 and create the rental registry, staff will develop an online registry portal and website that will include education material for landlords, renters, and the broader community. Staff will further plan to resume sharing M200 violations in the upcoming weeks as part of our new electronic permitting system is being implement implemented. This is something we were doing but had to take a pause. So we will continue to do this. Uh, we'll, continue, we'll plan to start doing this in the next couple of weeks. Um, at this point, staff do not plan to share a full list of rental properties that will, make, that will be included in the rental registry, although this is something we may want to further consider once the uh, registry is in place. Through setting up the rental registry, staff will have the foundation to establish the framework for proactive building inspections that are not reliant on tenant complaints. Our current practices are only do um, uh, inspections on properties based on complaints, so now we'll have the information we need to be able to do more proactive uh, um, inspections. 
And as the, with the adoption um, of any new bylaw, we're going to be closely monitoring the success of the rental registry and the amendments to M200 bylaw. And so due to the significant you know, public engagement and interest in this, the creation of the R400 bylaw, we do want to return to council within the next two years to you know, present to council you know, what has been working for the uh, bylaw and identify any areas maybe where further amendments may be required. Um, as shown in the staff report, in April 2019, the Investment Property Owners Association of Nova Scotia, who was a key stakeholder in the community engagement, shared their concerns with councillors related to the proposed framework. These concerns related to how the proposed framework aligned with stakeholder feedback, potential financial implications, potential conflict um, with the Residential Tenancy Act, and the public release of any minor landlord bylaw violations. So this was discussed in report, and we feel as though the approach that we are taking with the proposed R400 bylaw and amendments to M200 have addressed these concerns. We also want to acknowledge another important stakeholder throughout this process, ACORN Canada. In February 2022, they shared their recommendations to HRM on their website based on how we should proceed with the rental registry. Um, their recommendations included proactively inspecting HRM apartment buildings, requiring a fee for registration, having significant fines for non-compliance, reporting all inspections and violations on the halifax.ca website, and providing outreach and education. Again, we're of the opinion that the majority of these concerns have been addressed in the proposed approach, with the exception of requiring fees at this time. Um, and at this time, we do not plan to make all violations public. Um, at this time, we just plan to, uh, we don't plan to include all inspections, make all inspections public. We just want to focus on violations at this time, point in time. But again, will be something that we'll continue to monitor and look at. So thank you so much. Um, as shown on this slide and in the report, staff, do you recommend that council adopt the bylaw R400 and adopt the proposed amendments to bylaw M200? Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Jill. Uh, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council, one, give first reading to bylaw R400 respecting registration of residential rental properties, the purpose of which is to establish a municipal residential rental registry as set out in attachment A of the staff report dated January 20th, 2023. Two, give first reading to bylaw M202, the purpose of which is to amend bylaw M200 respecting standards for residential occupancies the purpose of which is to amend certain minimum standards applicable to rental housing as set out in attachment C of the staff report dated January 20th, 2023. And three, direct the chief administrative officer to prepare a staff report two years following the implementation of the registry and amendments to bylaw M200 on the effectiveness of the registry and the amendments to bylaw M200. I so move. Second. Second by Deputy Mayor. Go ahead, Councillor Mason. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. This is literally the results of maybe the second motion I made after I first got elected. Like, it's been a long journey to get here, 10 years, and it's not like nothing happened. I'm not throwing staff under the bus because we've done significant work to improve M200 and uh, how we inspect along the way. But starting around 2018, 2019, what we started to see was a multi-step process to get to where we wanted to be with the registration or licensing. We've chosen registration for good reason, I think. And, uh, and this has been long delayed, and I'll talk about that. But I want to start way back at the beginning to, to, to say for the benefit of the public, you know, generally in Nova Scotia, municipalities are responsible for buildings to make sure they're safe, to make sure minimum standards are met. And it's important to recognize that the province is responsible for tenancy and rents and social programs and social housing and uh, rent control, that our job is to do buildings and their job is to do tenants, tenancy. Our job is to make sure that buildings are safe. So what drove this for me in 2012, 13, 14 was you saw in communities with lots of new Canadians, with lots of international students who maybe didn't know their rights and with lots of young people in schools, uh, apartments being built that didn't meet minimum standards in places, not just here, but uh, in Toronto and Vancouver and Victoria, you saw illegal apartments get built and people died. Right? Like that's, that is the end result of not meeting fire code. And we've had in my area, because I have 30,000 students coming to visit us, we've had people jacking up buildings without a permit, putting in an illegal basement suite, not putting fire rated drywall, not being worried about having a secondary egress so that if the place is on fire, people can get out. One of those, one of my former students from NSCC lived in, barely escaped with his life with his girlfriend. So this is a real and present danger. These things actually are happening in our community. And it's not just on the peninsula. 
Peninsula. Uh, that's why historically the councillors for Fairview and Spryfield and Sackville and North Dartmouth have also been very involved in supporting this. Uh, and, and sometimes I'll be really honest, like nothing surprised me more in I think 2014-15 when Russ Walker voted in favor of a landlord licensing because he was seeing these issues and it wasn't something that I thought he was going to support, but he did because he saw, saw those issues too. So. We don't have a complete picture about what is out there right now because units built before zoning was brought in, before we had permitting and all that stuff. You know, the city's 250 years old. So part of what this gets us is we will have a list of what rental properties are out there. And I think that's really important. Staff also talked about how IPONS asked us these five questions. We've certainly got a number of emails and letters from them in the last uh, couple of months. But, uh, you know, I'm very briefly going to go through this and just say, you know, the staff report not being in uh, sync with uh, stakeholder feedback. Uh, yes, that is true that IPONS was not in favor of a rental registry, but uh, we talked to a broad swath of people in the public, including other property owners who have said to me, and I've heard this from a lot of them, especially around the universities, saying, I am tired of competing with people who aren't meeting minimum standards, mm -hmm. who are doing the least amount of money to plausibly be able to say, hey, this is a rental, uh, and, and they feel that that's unfair. And that moves us to what what Jillian talked about, what Ms. McClellan talked about is uh, the proactive uh, inspection, something that we've had to change bylaws to enable us to be able to do. We know where there are problems. We know where there's repeated complaints. We know where there's repeated failures on inspection. And we know that often you'll see that across multiple properties. We should be able to infer from that that we should inspect those properties more. And I'm glad to see that we're moving in that direction. I think the financial implications were addressed uh, by uh, not having a fee for the registry. Uh, and I would say that we're not going to get to uh, having uh, inspections more regularly if we don't have more staff to do them. That's something that we've been identifying for years. Uh, and I started off there by saying, let's remember, we do buildings, we don't do tenancy. One of the biggest things that we've been getting from, you know, frankly, I'm just going to say from IPONS and from the people who are emailing because of the email that came out on their mailing list uh, uh, last night is around the issue issues they're having with provincially controlled things, which isn't a reason for us not to do our job around maintaining minimum standards. That is our job. I agree there are real issues with tenancy, and I understand a lot of small property owners are getting squeezed right now with seeing uh, expenses going up and, and being under their, uh, uh, you know, not being capped and being under the rent cap. And, and so I understand those issues, but that is provincial, and I'm happy to go with those representatives to talk to the province about that. So probably you'd have better luck getting a meeting without me. Uh, and then the uh, public release of landlord bylaw violations needs further analysis before implementation. Uh, I think that's been addressed by, by you know, staff say, if it's a notice to fix something, we're not going to put that public. If it's an order to fix something, we're going to fix that public. So I'll just close by saying uh, everybody on council voted, has voted for this, who's here right now has voted for this every time it's been in front of us. And uh, I hope that that continues. Uh, I also uh, have one question for staff, which is, uh, can you outline a little bit why we're not going to make the list of who is registered public? Because one of the big selling points for this is if we have a database and you can look up a property and it's not registered, then you know it's an illegal uh, unit in the first place. So if you could unpack that a little bit for us. Thank you, can Mr. Mayor. Can you do Mayor, that in the last council. two minutes of Councilor Mason's 12 minutes, please? Well, I read the motion, so that has to count for something. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my name is Peter Duncan. Um, we struggled with that one. I think we'd like to get there at some point to publish the entire the entire uh, registry. There's a, a little bit of an element of risk if you if you publish the registry without having a good baseline for the com compliance, uh, you know, data. Um, the last thing you want to do is to give the public or someone looking to rent the illusion or understanding that because a property has been uh, registered and is on the registry that everything's okay with it. And until we get out and get some inspections on the ground and get a baseline there, um, like I said, there is a little bit of element of uh, risk. So we would like to get there at some point in time, but we don't think it's appropriate to get there until we actually build the actual registry and see what we, what we have in front of us. Thanks, Steph. Thank, Thank you, you. Council. Councilor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, and thank you, uh, Councilor uh, Mason, uh, for the, the history lesson and, and the why we're here. So it sounds to me we're here because of safety, right? Uh, in particular, our vulnerable communities. But do we not have minimum standards now? 
so the question I have, are those minimum standards not being met? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, the purpose of what we're trying to achieve here, my understanding is, is that we're trying to make our administration and enforcement of our minimum standards bylaw more effective. Right now, it's a, it's a uh, complaint generated process, so we're really trying to get out there and do more proactive inspections, and we see the uh, registry as one of the key uh, tools to make that happen. So it is really about uh, getting to those minimum standards and enforcing those minimum standards. So, uh, you know, I love the idea of being proactive. I think we should look at that with much of our bylaws for, for, that we could talk about. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm worried about the list, uh, thank you, I'm worried about the list, uh, the, good, the good boys list and the bad boys list. I found like I'm talking to Santa Claus here, but, uh, and you know, if I was to talk about we should have a tenant rent, uh, renter registry, well, people will go nuts because they're all worried that a landlord will be, uh, because I don't like uh, that person, I'm gonna get them on that list, right? And so, but the, I have the same little bit of concern here. How do we make sure if there's an issue, we're being proactive, we look at at a building or a unit and say there's something wrong here, let's fix that. And, the, we, and you said earlier, Jill, that if it's a quick item, it's not going to go on any list. Uh, but if the item is more involved, uh, how, does the, how does that tenant, that landlord get on the list and how do they get off the list and how do they make sure they don't stay there too long? Uh, and so how do we make sure that a complaint is done in the wrong way, even though we're being proactive. Do you understand what I'm, I'm asking here? Uh, the same concern people have of a tenant list, I have a little bit of concern of some of our good landlords. And look, we've got some bad landlords in this municipality, but we have a whole bunch of really good landlords. Landlords that own one or two properties, 10 properties, 11 properties, they're still small business owners. And, and, and there's a little bit of this concerns me, those folks. So uh, how do we make sure they're represented properly and not on the bad boys list? I'll take an opportunity to introduce myself. Many of you recognize Peter, but I'm uh, Dawson Patterson, again, the Acting Manager of Building Standards. And to address your question through the Mayor to the Councillor, uh, it's not the intent when we do decide to publish this registry and release it to open data, it's not our intent to have any retroactive data on there. So in a sense, this registry will be kind of a fresh start for even what is regarded as a problem property now. It may go under a new ownership, right? right. may have a, a new opportunity here uh, uh, and operate under new management. And I want to expand on Jill's comment about the notice to comply. So that's not just associated with quick items. It could be life safety, right, paramount items that may take a, quite a while to complete that scope of work, but that opportunity, ample opportunities given to the property owners to complete those deficiencies, right, via notice to comply. It's only when they fail to comply in a reasonable amount of time that it progresses to an order, and that order is our intent as we move forward with this registry, right, will be published. Okay. Yeah, openly. Hopefully yeah. that yeah. addresses your question. Thank you. Uh, look, I have a whole bunch of questions. This is first reading, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, I assume we'll uh, go through this today and we'll get to second reading, but one last question I do have. Uh, so, we don't, uh, they're asking, what, four or five staff is, is the recommended recommendation? So, if we don't hire four or five staff in this budget year, what does that mean? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor, we're expecting we'll need two staff this year to help us actually build build this, and uh, the four staff will not kick in until 24-25. Uh, so the, the, there is an ask in the budget, we'll see uh, a request for two staff. All right, uh, my time is up, but I'll, I'll come back. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, staff, for bringing this forward, and uh, thank you, Councillor Mason, for initiating this 10 years ago. Um, just my I guess my first question is because I looked at what was going to be uh, re relative to R400, uh, the registration process and the data that was required didn't look too bad, you know, like the owner operator, uh, the contact information, that kind of stuff. So how onerous will it be to register a rental property? Will it be an online form? Will there be paper? How, how's that physically going to happen? Because that wasn't spoken to in the report. 
Uh, thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, that will be primarily online. There'll be paper forms also, but I, I don't expect a lot of people will wanna do that. So it'll be primarily registered online. And uh, the first thing we'll have to do if this passes second uh, reading was, um, you know, get out to the stakeholders, do a lot of leg, you know, leg work and so on. Uh, but to answer your, your specific question, it will be done primarily online. And just quickly, uh, do we have an estimate right now of the number of rental units? That's a really good question. Because um, I know from CMHC data, about 40% of no, re, uh, Haligonians rent. We have roughly just plus 200,000 units, so basic math says 80,000. But we don't actually know, and that's part one of the reasons for the registry, right, to get a, a good eye on how many, where they are, the type of dwelling. Uh, through you, Ms. Mr. Mayor, I knew someone was, was uh, gonna ask that. I'm gonna tell you what I know, and I'm not gonna take a stab at how many I think there are out there. Um, when the Stantec study was published, they estimated there was in the range of 60,000 units. Um, staff did a quick count on GI, GIS. We found in the range of 50,000 and change on 3,700 properties, I believe. So, so, so say just shy of 4,000. Uh, based on the growth since the Stantec, um, you know, study happened, uh, if you use a 40% number and the number of households, I make it around 80,000 units. You're referring to the 2013 Stantec report yes. on growth? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so you're probably in the range of 80,000 units. Okay. Like I said, we found just shy of 4,000 properties represented around 40,000 units. So that's okay. the range you're working in, yeah. so. And so the, my next question is on the maintenance plan. Again, you talk about it in there, uh, but there was no, and you also say in there you're gonna provide a template. But I couldn't find a template, so that's still being developed. How easy will that be? And I'm thinking of the small mom and pop, you know, I own a house, I have a basement apartment, don't want it to be terribly onerous to register, also don't want it to be terribly onerous to provide a maintenance plan. There probably won't be much of one, uh, as opposed to say, you know, a kill them with a 200 unit building, that sort of thing. So what are we talking about for maintenance plan? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, we, um, we've, been, uh, we've been sort of guided by the uh, rent safe program that the city of uh, Toronto has. We think it'll be easy for the, you know, for those same, for those same uh, reasons. Um, and you can look at it as more of a check, more of a uh, check, more of a checklist than anything else. So um, I think it'll be relatively easy for a homeowner to uh, fill out and give us a checklist of the work that they plan to do. And in our case, we were thinking to start with uh, in the next five five years. So other cities uh, that have similar rental like rental register, you know, uh, some similar rental registries will ask for work being carried out, say zero to five years, five to ten, and then uh, beyond ten. To your point, the larger landlords will already have that. We're only asking for any work you anticipate will be carried out in the next five. So okay. it should be straightforward. And in M200, I'll give you an example. So I had several calls from small building owners and large building owners uh, about things like duct cleaning. I'm not sure how familiar they were with the previous M200 as opposed to the updated one here. But duct cleaning for dryer vents is already included, is it not? And it said annually. You're saying now every 12 months. So that seems to be, um, you're just tightening that language up, it seems to me, but it also says you have to inspect and clean as required. Uh, so if I look at it and I don't see any lint buildup, I'm good, I don't have to clean it, correct? Yeah, it's just identifying that depending on the configuration of the ductwork associated with that dryer and the frequency that is used, so if it's a common laundry versus yeah. maybe it's laundry in somebody's individual suite, it may require cleaning uh, in advance of the annual inspection. Yeah. And when you inspect or it, it may annually, actually, it may right, actually you, not need cleaning as regularly if it's got one of those uh, exactly. filter boxes on it. Yeah, and, and some have redundant filter or, or screens, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, upon an annual inspection, that you pre were prepared to clean it, there was nothing to clean, your job is done. But okay. as a minimum, once a year, that dryer duct is in intended to be cleaned. And some dryer duct configurations require cleaning, you know, uh, quarterly, right, or more, so. Okay, I'm out of time, so I'll have to come back. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Councillor Mason and staff for bringing forward this information. Um, 
I just had a quick question. I'm not sure if I might have missed it. Um, but how, how does this bylaw M200 align or conflict with the Renis Reg I'm sorry, Registry Tenancy Board? Because a lot of their, sorry, a lot of their issues are complaints about broken doors, uh, insufficient heat, and things like that, that they go before the board and lay a complaint. So is this in conjunction with this, or is this in instead of that, or how does, how does that work? Uh, through the mayor to the council, I can start this, and then you guys can uh, pick off what I miss. Um, but uh, th yeah, so through the mayor to the councillor, the M200 bylaw is mainly focused on building standards, so making sure that you're meeting the, you know, the safety standards and the minimum fire code standards for your building, whereas the Residential Tenancy Act and board is more about the relationship between the renter and the landlord. So we're more focused on the building, what's happening within there, whereas the tenancy board is more focused on the, the relationship with the, the, the renter slash landlord. Thank you. Sometimes that relationship might um, be that the landlord didn't fix a lock or the landlord isn't doing whatever is required to make the apartment safe. So you wouldn't be looking at that. You'd be looking at the building itself. Well, we'd still be looking at making sure you're meeting those, you know, that you have the adequate locks on the door if required. That's been added in the M200 bylaw. Our clarification's been added there. So we're going to be making sure you're going to be meeting all those health and safety requirements within the building. Um, and then, yeah, Peter or Dawson, I don't know if you want to speak further to the relationship. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I don't know. I just wanted to add to that a, a uh, you know, somewhat. Um, if the uh, Residential Tenancies Board gets a call now, um, has anything to do with locks on the doors or the building condition, the heat, you know, whatever. They're current, currently sent our, our, our way anyways, so we currently deal with those. Okay, great. Thank you, I didn't realize that. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, certainly, I've my, uh, I'd be remiss in defending my reputation here if I didn't ask about land lease communities because I just want to be I just want to be sure that I understand completely that this registry will not apply to land lease communities as a whole. They already have to apply for operating permits and prove that they've met a certain standard. But there are a lot of individuals that own mini homes in these land lease communities and rent them out. So that, in that situation, they would be subject to this registry, recognizing that perhaps the standard that we have uh, to rent this out might be a little different than what the park standard is. So uh, I, uh, you know, I, and I understand Peter Nightingale and his team are working very, very hard on the, uh, the new bylaws for land lease communities. So I, I'm, I'm seeing nods, so I think I've got, uh, I've got it right there. The only other question that I have um, has to do with subleasing. When you see a bunch of you know, students come in, they've rented an apartment, they want to stay in that apartment for the next school year, but they're going home and they sublease it for the summer. What uh, what happens in a situation like that? Do they have to register as a as a landlord in that case, or is it already registered and therefore taken care of? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. With regards to sublets, um, the intention of the registry bylaw is to deal with the with the uh, property owner. Uh, primarily, so a sublet wouldn't would not have any impact on it. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. Um, we heard with the last discussion that we have uh, the provincial registry of rental properties that include short-term rentals, and so we're discussing creating a registration for rental properties that include short-term rentals, and I haven't heard anything. Um, that says that ours is going to add this, ours is going to be different than this. Um, and in a lot of cases, I look for that differentiator to see is it worth the cost. In this case, I haven't heard anything. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you could uh, share with me, um, uh, share with us, uh, what would differentiate this registry from the provincial registry, and why would why should we fund this? I will also ask if we can have the motion split, please. Thank you. 
It's through the mayor to the councillor. So the provincial short-term rental registry is mainly focused on tourist accommodation. So it's making sure you're meeting all the requirements of the Tourist Accommodation Regulation Act. So that will apply to sh short-term rentals in somebody's, you know, home or, you know, uh, a spare room that they have that's meant for the traveling public, hotels, bed and breakfast is inns. Whereas this rental registry is intended to apply to all rental properties. And so we can appreciate that sometimes short-term rentals here might be used for long-term rentals and they can easily be converted to short-term rentals. So we wanna just make, sh and it, make sure that we're capturing all the rental properties uh, within HRM. Another big difference between the two is the short-term rental registry or the tourism registry is annual. So every year people will need to apply, whereas our rental registry is a one-time registry, so you only apply once. You may need to re-register should the property you know, ownership change, should you make any substantial changes to, uh, to the building, such as adding more units. But we, we just basically want to have, require one, a one-time registry so we have an idea of the rental properties throughout the municipality. Okay, so, so the difference then is the provincial registry, I, I, forgive me, I thought that was short-term and long-term re uh, rentals, it is only short-term, okay. Reading through this, I haven't seen enough benefit to justify a long-term rental registry. Um, and since we already have uh, the short-term reg rental registry um, generated by the province, I, I can't see supporting M400. I can certainly supporting, uh, see supporting the changes in M200. So, that, and that is why I uh, had asked for the motion to be split. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, so um, I, I was happy to see this report come forward and uh, I had a really good read of it. Um, you know, I've seen rental units that have been, you know, really in a despicable state where compliance officers have gone in and, and said, well, the water's going through the drain and it goes into a bucket that the tenant has to then dump down their, their toilet. You know, it, it's like um, entranceways being blocked with garbage. I've seen, you know, doors falling off hinges. And so I, I, I really do see the need for increasing, um, the building standards for rental units, and in some cases, I feel like it's a few, you know, a few bad apples that have, have kind of created this. But I also see the importance of this registry in us being able to understand what our housing stock is and the different types of tenures that exist, and um, you know, figuring out how we might in the future incentivize more rental if that's needed or more home ownership if that is needed. You know, it's very important data for us to have um, in our decision making. Um, my questions are, um, what about fees? I see that staff is recommending that we don't do fees, but that we, that, you know, possibly in the future. Um, doing a quick scan yesterday, I saw that there's many other cities that do have fees for registration. Um, in, in terms of hiring, needing to hire new employees to help implement this registry. I'm wondering what the thoughts are on fees down the road and is this something that um, we're thinking is going to come in at a later date and what kind of um, financial burden do you think that would be? Um, from other cities I've seen it's not extraordinary amount but it is something. The other thing is about the fines. I've noted our fines are $150 to 10000 and I just think it's worth noting um, the City of London, the fines start at $25,000. And if it's a commercial operator, they start at $50,000. And um, so, I mean, our fees, um, I mean, our fines, on the fine side of things, uh, it, it seems so, but maybe we, um, you could just talk a little bit about how that scaled. Like, what's a $150 fine and what's a $10,000 fine? Um, and um, when and how will those be applied? Um, also, like what triggers a proactive building inspection? So I know as people get registered, there was talk about using some data like to making strategic decisions around the building inspections. And I'm, I'm just wondering, like when would, you've got to start somewhere and you can't start everywhere. So what, really, what does that inspection process look like? And, also, I mean, we have heard from a lot of landlords over the last couple of days, and I expect that, you know, we'll probably hear from some more. So there, 
there is concern um, that this is an additional burden. And, um, you know, I have to say that I, I do, gosh, I felt a little mixed um, going around and, and looking at units that were in a real state of disrepair and, and being very concerned for the tenants, but also knowing today that they actually have nowhere else to go. They're, you know, it's not that they wanted to be there. It's just that they could not find another place to go. And so I'm, I'm wondering about phasing in compliance here um, and, and knowing that we're in a housing crisis with a housing shortage, that um, shutting apartments down for non-compliance, well, that, that's where I'd like to get to eventually. Um, right now, it's actually could be putting people at a greater disadvantage. Um, so just really, how are we going to handle that? Is there an opportunity to phase phase in the registry in a way that helps landlords come into compliance rather than being punitive in terms of um, fines and being put on the, as Councillor Mancini said, the bad boy list? Uh, thank you for those. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll start and take a stab at answering the question with regards to the fees and why we're recommending no fees at this point in time. Then I may have to turn it over to my uh, colleagues to talk about some of the enforcement issues and uh, the proactive inspections and so on. So there was really, with regards to the fees, there was really three issues that were front and center for us. Um, w one was, the, um, you know, the fact that a good Healthy safety rental stock is a is a is a uh, you know broader bene benefit to to like everyone. Um, it was also front and center in our, in our mind that any cost you impose on a landlord in this market is probably going to be passed through you know uh, you know anyway. So we were we were sort of cognizant of that uh, impact and. Also, uh, we were cognizant of the need to incentivize actually, like you know, signing signing up and actually registering it. So those were the three primary factors why we why we are recommending no fees at this time. Um, with regards to your question on proactive uh, triggers um, and how you phase phase in and uh, the actual registry itself, I think uh, Dawson, if you explained a little bit of the inspection process and the compliance process. It may be help, helpful, and a lot of the what I will say is the amount of the fines and the amount of the penalties are set uh, are predetermined for us, like that's set in the in the uh, charter. So, All right, thank you. Did you have something else? I think I'll just pick up on where you left off there. Maybe I'll just describe briefly the proactive inspection piece in hopes to elaborate there. Um, we need to identify, where I'm sure we already have, that our municipality has a lot of older building stock, and that would be our priority uh, as we stand this up, right, this process. That would where, where we'd want to concentrate our efforts. Um, acknowledging that, you know, some of our newly found backyard suites and secondary suites, that's relatively new, modern, right, model codes have been applied to those structures. It's really, um, we've identified again in the staff report, there's a gap there where we're in the one to three unit range um, where our fire safety regulations, right, uh, doesn't specify any type of routine or proactive inspections when you're less than four residential units and we want to kind of target that group with our older building stock. Buildings that we've never been in, buildings that have never seen current um, fire and life safety measures. That's kind of a, I think, uh, Maybe the also piece about phasing is the maintenance plan. Um, you'll find staff will work quite closely with the property owners with an already de uh, established template of what a maintenance plan looks like, identifying the elements where they should concentrate their efforts in a five-year forecast. So it's not all today. We identify really the big ticket items, fire and life safety, by the way, right? There's some elements here that look like in the next five years they could potentially fail and cause an issue, right? Let's make sure those are on your radar moving forward. Maybe, yeah. You know. right, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor uh, Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this has been a really good discussion. 
I have to say I don't have a lot of rental units in my district, uh, but I've certainly lived in rental units. I know people who are in rental units. Um, I have seen uh, horrific images, as Councillor Cuddle uh, just alluded to, of people living in, in quite substandard uh, conditions um, and afraid, afraid to complain because then they're on the street. Uh, the system that we currently have relies on uh, people to stand up and be brave and speak out against the landlord. This is about a, a power imbalance where we have very vulnerable people, uh, young people who are moving here for the first time to attend university, seniors who have just sold their home looking for a safe place uh, to live, um, you know, folks who, who generally would be afraid to speak out and complain and put forward, um, you know, an M200 complaint to, to the municipality. I think really what this is, is what it looks like for HRM to be growing up. We need to be transparent. We need to be accountable. We need to be responsive to all community needs. That includes landlords, property managers, and tenants. And uh, I think it's important for folks to understand what is it in, what's in it for me. So that's a lot of the questions I've received. Well, well, I'm not going to benefit as a landlord. That's trying to understand why uh, this registry is important for them. And I think if we, uh, you know, go back to the data question, which was earlier, well, currently we don't even know how many rental units are illegal. We have no clue. And that's frightening because we can't stand up here and state that we're a world-class citizen, uh, world-class um, uh, city, and yet not have any understanding of how many unstable or unsafe rental units are in this in this, uh, in this city. I know f for a fact that I've had numerous complaints about the lack of safe drinking water outside of the service boundary in an apartment building. Mm -hmm. And yet, as this process was going on for months and months and months, and people were being told, you're gonna get safe drinking water, don't worry, it's gonna happen. Months continued to go by, and new people were entering into rental agreements at this building without any knowledge whatsoever that there was a drinking water issue in that building. That's a problem. So I truly believe that being transparent um, and having M200 complaints listed is important because that shows that we are accountable and the people who cannot follow the rules, they should be held accountable. Um, because they're, you know, in, in some situations, yes, it's minor, but in others, it's life-threatening especially to, to young children. There was a, a sink that was coming off of the wall and had been jerry-rigged to stay up. That sink could have been pulled down onto a child. Um, so, you know, I think the, what, what we're doing here is, is growing up and um, making sure that we are responsive to the needs of communities. I do support uh, the registry. I think that not having a fee associated with it is important. Mm -hmm. The province, on the other hand, for their short-term rental fee, it is free for the first year, but they will be charging an annual fee uh, following that. Um, and that's just for a small piece of the market. So when we look, about, when we look at these long-term rental units who are uh, being rented out, let's say from September until May uh, for university students, and then they turn into short-term rentals in the summer, again, we have no idea uh, how many rental units are out there. So I think it's important for us to, to move forward to, um, to a second reading. I think that um, you know, there will be certainly some folks who are not aware of what the benefit is to them, and that's on us to communicate. That's, that's important that we help people understand that why we're doing this, and I, I think that sometimes HRM has a hard time explaining the why. We, we don't communicate well enough. So, you know, again, this isn't about, you know, looking at the bad boys uh, in the rental market. This really is about shining a light on the good people who were, who were providing an essential service um, to the workers and the residents and the, and the people in the, who live here. So uh, I fully support this and I look forward to moving forward and I'm, I'm really grateful to staff. I know this has been an awful lot of work and uh, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Uh, for not having much to say, you went right down to the wire. So that's pretty good. <laughs>
I think we're going to take a break, folks. There's a couple of people left to speak on this. Um, so I think what we'll do is uh, take a break at this point in time, and we'll come back at 20 past 3, finish off this and the rest of our agenda, and then we have our public hearing tonight. So we'll come back at 20 past 3.
Okay, we have quorum. It's 322. Okay, folks, let's let's resume. Uh, Jill McClellan, you're still good to go? Been a long day? Uh, Councillor Morse. We're discussing uh, the uh, landlord registry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a question for staff on how they uh, envision the registry to work. Um, will there be uh, some way of sharing information with Halifax Fire and Emergency? Because we will be doing inspections and there could be situations that are more urgent than others. Thank you. Uh, so the short answer is yes, um, definitely. It's open data, but behind internally our processes will align. We'll definitely be in close contact as we are now with, uh, with fire and life safety issues. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I wanted to say a couple of words on this one. Um, thank you to, uh, to staff on, on this work. And I, I, first of all, I have to say I, <clears throat> I first met Councillor Mason when he was not a councillor and I was not a mayor and we were... We met at Perks Coffee Shop in 2011 talking about the 2012 municipal election and the fact that we were both giving consideration to running. And at that point, Councillor Mason in his uh, policy-focused way, I, I recall, talked about this. Back then we were talking about landlord um, licensing and the need for that. And I think, so he's right, this has been on the books a long time, sort of like, you know, accessible taxis and, uh, and center plan. <laughs> And Sandy Point, and, and, and the progress that we've made on Sandy Point. Um, look, I'm, like most people, I'm nervous about adding any kind of burden to, to, uh, to business and to landlords who, by and large, in this city, I think are, are pretty good, but we have some who aren't. And, you know, I can recall early on in my time as mayor, we had to prevail upon the fire department to, to, to get relief for somebody who was, I think, being abused by a, an ethical um, landlord. But most of our landlords are, are not like that. Um, and I don't think, I think there have been changes made. We're not charging uh, a fee for this. I don't think this is a threat to most of the landlords in HRM, but I think there are some that need, uh, need to have a bit of an eye kept on. I don't think this is going to be onerous. It's not licensing. It's not uh, charging um, a fee. Uh, it's, it's not a new concept. It's being used in lots of other uh, cities, and um, they, they survive. I am cautious because I, I know the costs that businesses have and uh, but I think Councillor Lovelace indicated there is some communication around this that hasn't been completely 100% um, accurate. Uh, I've received letters from people talking about our permitting fees having gone crazier than other cities and if I was one thing I recall from the from uh, from the uh, report was it the Altus report the one that the minister spoke about uh, when I talked about our fees we were virtually the lowest in the country or, or very close to that. Um, but we, we, owe, we, owe a, we need to be partners with our development and our landlord community in lots of ways, but that doesn't mean that we don't have responsibilities to the tenants that we have to employ. Um, so uh, I can vote for this. Uh, I know that some people uh, don't like it, but in my view, I, I don't think this is a radical uh, approach. So uh, I think the work that staff have done on this Probably not satisfying IPONs and not satisfying ACORN, but you know, a, a reasonable place in the middle that says we need to do something is a sensible way to go. The one question I have, last year the City of Montreal introduced landlord uh, licensing. What, what they did that was interesting was they said that uh, larger landlords had to um, register within a very short period of time, but smaller uh, landlords had, I think, five years before they had to register. Did we look at doing something like that so that the, the smaller businesses would have more time to comply uh, with this rule? Uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, short answer is no, we didn't, uh, we didn't consider that. Uh, uh, we thought that one year would be reasonable for everyone, but we did not give thought to extending it for the smaller, smaller guys. The date that we set is April the 1st of next year, correct? Yes. People have to be registered by, so 
it's a year and a few months, uh, assuming that this passes. Um, and have you talked to smaller landlords about what's involved for them to comply with this? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, to this point, uh, we have not talked to landlords recently. We've been relying on the uh, console consultation that's been previously done. So no, the answer would be no. We haven't. Okay. And if we were to consider it an extra year or something like that, would that have to be done today? Assuming if we go to, a, it would be a substantive change, would it not? Or, or would that be something that, would it be a substantive change if we change the date for registration for smaller landlords? No, but I mean, if we didn't do it today. Let's see how it's, <clears throat> pardon me. It, it, so if you wish to put an implementation date on at this point in first reading, now would be the time to do it, to say that this was not to come into effect. For, if the, uh, an alternative would be to defer a decision and, and to come back no, and I don't want to defer back. it, and I, I didn't but think I'm, so. not, I'm not at a point that I know what I would want to put on. I'd be interested in a bit hearing from people whether that would right. be helpful or hurtful to the right. cause, but I'm not at a point right. where I would change that right. for now. So this is not a public hearing process. There is no issue with respect to substantive or, or other changes. This is the time if council wishes to make the change that it should probably do so before we give notice to the public uh, before second reading. Right. Okay, well, I'm just going to leave that. Staff have answered the questions that I've uh, had about that. Um, I'll leave that alone uh, for now. I think we are giving people um, a fair bit of time to get ready for this. Uh, you know, there's a big burden on, there's a disproportionately larger burden on smaller uh, landlords than there is on some of the large ones. They won't like it either necessarily, but as I say, I think that, um, you know, that this is a reasonable approach. Um, and has taken into account uh, concerns of lots of different people, and uh, I can vote for this at this point in time. Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, on, on that, I, I would certainly be interested in getting some more information uh, around, the trouble would be, you know, who do you consider small, like in the number of units, and who do you give more time? Mr. Duncan talked about, uh, I think it was, 4,000-ish property owners out there that had 50,000 units, you know, we might be able to reach a lot of them, but we may not be able to get some of the other ones. So that, I mean, it's an interesting uh, question, but I'm not sure how you how you pursue it. So I would look to staff on that. But, um, you know, we are not charging a fee, but it's still going to cost uh, pr uh, rental property owners to register. They or their staff will have to gather the data, go online, spend time doing this, depending on how easy it is. And I really stress, I, this has to be easy for people to do so that it doesn't burden them to register. And I think, you know, staff certainly seem to be saying that that's their goal. Um, similar to Councillor Cuddle earlier on enforcement, I mean, there, there may be some wiggle room that inspectors would have to say, you know, that... That's not life and safety, so I'll, I'll give you more time to address that. You know, you gotta put kitchen cupboard doors on your kitchen cupboards. That's different from, you know, not having egress from, say, a third floor apartment. <laughs> There's no wiggle room there, you know. Uh, and when I bought, my wife and I bought our property over 10 years ago now on Quinpool, the folks who owned it at that time uh, owned a number of other properties uh, that were not all in great shape. Uh, the third floor of our house, because it has three floors, uh, did not have egress. And under the net building code, you cannot tra uh, uh, travel more than a floor to get out. So coming down two floors, had that building ever been inspected, they would have made them, as we did right after we bought it, put a uh, back deck and stairs up to the third floor, because that's where our oldest son's bedroom was. Um, and so, you know, there are a lot of not devious but just either not well-meaning or not caring landlords who need to address issues and deficiencies in their building. Lots of our, as mayors point out, lots of our landlords, in fact, the vast majority of them are great landlords. There are a small number that are not so good. Having said that, have you considered the risk? So we send in on proactive or even reactive building inspections, send in an inspector, they give the property owner a list of deficiency and remedies for the building. 
Have you considered what the risk is going to be given our housing crisis that the landlord, assuming they're unscrupulous, or even if they're desperate, they just can't afford the upgrades. They then evict the tenants because these are life and safety issues, uh, and then fix them up and charge or move towards market rent or maybe even higher. Have you thought about that and how, how we could mitigate against that uh, in our current situation? Um, so through the mayor to the councillor. So, um, you know, it, it, I guess one, I guess, important piece of clarification is yes, everybody needs to be meeting these minimum standards. So regardless of, you know, the rental registry, if we find out about, you know, a, a unit that's not meeting our minimum standards, we're going to require them to meet that. Um, we do also want to work with property owners. So if they, you know, need additional funding to complete, you know, their renovations and keep their units affordable, if they need to apply for grants with from the province, we'll work with them and to kind of help them define their timeline for when they need to be, you know, meet the compliance standards or have, have the, the work done. So we definitely want to do whatever we can to avoid the situation that you described there. Yeah, okay. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Councillor... Hensby. Uh, thank you much, uh, Mr. Mayor. And, uh, like Councillor Lovelace, I have very few rental properties, uh, long-term rental properties in my particular district, but I can say there's quite a few uh, short-term rentals and seeing the similarities I have in the two uh, registries, perhaps serving as one would be great. Um, my, my concern though is uh, we're doing first reading here. Have we discussed having a second reading go to a public hearing? Uh, have we discussed that yet? No, that would be up to council. And uh, I personally believe that we should go to a public hearing on the second reading because uh, I'm sure a lot of or organizations and landlords will probably want to make their thoughts known. And, and I think that we as the government of the people, close to the people, I think transparency would be great in this opportunity. And I think that having a public, public hearing in this matter would be probably a great service. Okay, so we'll, I think what we do is we vote on the recommendation and then determine if it would be a public hearing. It's up to council, I believe. I would suggest that be amendment to to the main motion if you wish to have a public hearing on on either or both of the uh, bylaws. And send them as, as part of that. It's usually made part of the main motion. Councillor Hensley. Well, I believe the bylaws should be on the registry, but I don't think the, a public hearing should be on the registry, but not on the uh, minimum standards. I think that's something that we need to do anyway as a part of our due diligence for ensuring fire safety and stuff like that. So I think the first part, the registry itself, should be uh, subject to a public hearing. So I'd like to move that to perhaps uh, that the bylaw R400 go to a public hearing before second reading, at second reading. Okay, so that would be the first two, and then add the third part, which would be that this uh, would be put to a public hearing, subject to a public hearing, correct? Councillor Hensley? So we would vote on that as an amendment now, though? Not yet, I haven't heard that. Seconded by Councillor Russell. So do we vote on the amendment now? So that's, the mo that's an amendment that's on the floor for discussion. So we'll go back to the main list after we've dealt with the uh, discussion on the amendment, proposed amendment. Councillor? Councillor Cleary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, intriguing. I, I Given the sort of intertwined nature of the two, and they are cer certainly separate, uh, but there are a number of significant updates to the uh, M200. Uh, if we're going to have a public hearing, I would, I would actually, because they're tied together, uh, and I'm not sure how we would do this in terms of having the motion unless we split them and say, okay, well, let's pass one now and have a public hearing for the, uh, or second reading for this one without a public hearing, second reading for this one with a public hearing. I think we have to do a public hearing for both if we're gonna do one. Not sure we, we want to have that except that, uh, I do think we could get more information uh, that would be relevant to us looking to the solicitor, of course, uh, and his advice is, you know, if we're going to change our mind about something and we have a public hearing, based on that information, we have to have another public hearing anyway. <laughs> uh, 
uh, so it's kind of a catch-22. Uh, so I'll be interested to see what other people think about going to the public hearing. And again, if we do go to, to one, I think we need to go to one on both R400 and M200. Anyway, I, I look forward to the thoughts of others. Uh, so there is no legal requirement or otherwise to have a public hearing on both. Um, you could choose to do one or the other. Um, as to, just for your information, Mr. Mayor, through you to counsel, if you do not proceed with a public hearing, then there is still an obligation to advertise the, the second reading and to provide uh, opportunity for the public to make written submissions. So there is always an input process into the bylaws before they are passed and written submissions might be sufficient in many cases to tease out exactly what the issues are. That's your call. Thank you, Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. I would be in, uh, very much in favor of a public hearing for R400. I don't think it's needed for uh, M200. The, uh, I, I have no problem strengthening um, the standards that we hold the buildings to. But as far as a registry, I've heard from a number of people that they have not been consulted. Um, and these include short-term uh, rental landlords as well as long-term rental landlords. So this would be an opportunity for us to us as a, a group to hear from them. Um, we do have the uh, the letter from IPONS that is mentioned, but it would be uh, I, I think it would be helpful for them as the body that represents um, the long term rentals to uh, to be able to discuss this with us. Um, and again, if there is a, a body locally that uh, represents short term rentals, I would absolutely support that too. So. I support and uh, request consideration for uh, for the public hearing for M4 uh, for R400. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Hey, uh, so just to be clear, we're voting on the rental registry for uh, minimum standards in building. We voted already to send to uh, s uh, public hearing and uh, second reading the. Uh, short-term rentals like that those are separate separate legislations right so 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 we have we are moving forward with short-term rentals and that is unless I'm mistaken clerks can and legal I believe that the motion was to go to a public hearing this is on rental registration uh, the primary focus of which is not short-term rentals it's on building standards and and all rentals and and so we can go to public hearing. I, I don't think it's really necessary, as as the lawyer outlined. We have the uh, uh, that's why we have first and second reading. We're going to advertise it. We're going to allow people to uh, uh, you know encourage people to submit information, letters, and and uh, and uh, all that. Uh, but if that's council's wish, that's council's wish. Uh, but I do agree. I think M202 and M uh, and R400 can can be. Uh, I don't think they both need to be subject to the public hearing. I don't think anybody would come to the Bar of Council and say that you don't have to provide locks on doors or drains that work on sinks. I think probably most people accept that that's an important thing. So uh, that's that's uh, all, Mr. Mayor. All right, yeah, Councilor Diego Gamble. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in about whether or not we would go to a, a public hearing, there was a consultation that led up to all of this. Can you just frame that for a few minutes again for us, please? Because I think in the report it was pretty significant or it seemed that it was. Thank you. Um, to, to council. Um, so in 20, 2016, to, uh, 2017, uh, staff, uh, staff hired Stantec Consulting to do engagement for us regarding the, uh, the either looking at a rental registry or a licensing program and kind of understanding the pros and cons and kind of which way we want to go forward. So there were um, 12, I believe 12 different, uh, you know, strategic interviews that were done with, uh, with folks, including renters, uh, landlords, um, advocacy groups, um, IPONs, other associations. Um, and then there were fo several focus groups as, as well too that included uh, representatives from those groups as well. Um, and then since then we've stayed engaged with IPONs on, on how some of this work has <coughs> progressed and there's been engagement with um, our updates with ACORN Canada as well too. Great, thank you. Okay, we're gonna to go to the vote on whether there would be a public hearing added as an amendment to this motion, right? Ready for the question? Yeah. 
Okay. Ready for the question, colleagues? So that is defeated. That amendment is defeated. So we're back on the main, um, the main motion, which has been amended by Councillor Cleary, I believe. So um, on the main motion, Councillor, this is the, this, these are the people on the main motion, Ian, in front of me. Councillor Russell on the main motion. Thank you very much. Um, there was some discussion a little earlier, and I, I was listening to all of the debate. Um, because I'm not in favor of the rental registry. And I was listening to it to determine if I should uh, reconsider that, and, and I haven't heard anything that convinces me that there's enough justification uh, to reconsider. One of the things that we have in the report under the financial implications section is uh, the impact of adoption is difficult to assess. So, so we are asking for a registry that, if I'm reading this correctly, we don't know how much it's going to cost. Uh, we simply know that uh, we would have to hire two additional or four additional compliance officers, but we don't know how much the reg registry itself is going to cost. We know who the bad tenants and the good tenants, uh, sorry, landlords are, generally speaking, um, and, and we are simply looking to build a list of them. This list, and anybody who doesn't add themselves to the list, we would then hear about them not adding themselves to the list by a complaint, probably. Uh, that would be the same complaint that says there's a problem with the building. So we would use the same complaint for two different things. One of them is to identify a bad landlord, the other is to identify a bad landlord. Um, I, I just don't see the justification for spending the money for this. And I do appreciate that we did have the, uh, the consultation seven years ago. Um, again, I, I just, I, I don't get it as far as spending the money on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Do you want to close, Councillor Mason? Or? Councillor Hensby. Hensby? Not me. How do we get a voice for Councillor Hensby? Thank you very much, sir, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> um, and uh, Paul's, Paul's. I would strongly recommend that anybody who wants to speak to Council on this matter of uh, rental property registry take advantage of the public participation at our community council meetings. There are four or five community, community council meetings. If this is an urgent matter for anybody uh, pro or against the registry, please take advantage of those opportunities at our community councils. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it has been a good debate. Um, and we are gonna split the motion um, and vote. So there's three parts to the motion, correct, Ian? Are we ready for the uh, vote on question number one? That is carried. Ready for the question on number two. Is there number three? I'll get the motion for me. That's carried, thank you. And on number, we'll give the folks a chance to get reset. Number three. That is carried as well. Did I? Miss somebody, there's two names on the list, Councillor Hensby and somebody else, but did somebody, 
somebody dropped off, okay. All right, folks, we are now going to go back in our agenda, if you're following on your scorecard, to 15.1.6, Administrative Order 50, Disposal of Surplus Real Property, 1940 Goddard Street, Halifax. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council set a date for a public hearing to consider the sale of PID 0002063, located at Civic 1940 Godgen Street, Halifax, to the Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Society, as per the terms and conditions outlined in Table 1 of the staff report, dated January 18th, 2023. I so move. Second by Councillor Lovelace, I think. Councillor Mason. I wish I had, I'd like, first like to acknowledge that uh, Pam Gloden and Tom, are you still there? Yeah, yes, sir, here from the Friendship Center and from the people working on the project on this. Uh, and I don't have a lot to say because we've talked about this repeatedly in chambers as we've moved away from a 50% off because we're maybe going to do a housing development on the larger land to maybe we're going to do some stuff with that rest of that property. Maybe we're not even going to have a, a, a pool there, you know. And, and now here we are where it's clear the only way this is going to move forward with the federal and provincial governments is if, it's a, if the land is conveyed a, at a, a zero dollar value. Strong support for that. So I'm happy to see this here uh, and happy to see it move forward and I would ask for council support so we can get this project, uh, which the feds have recently announced some significant funding for, underway. Thank you, council. Ready for the question, colleagues? That is carried. So. I'm kind of sorry that you folks came all the way down here, waited through a break, and you know. We are so sorry. But uh, I do think I, I, I do think this is a very important moment for the city, and I, I wish very well uh, to you. And I do want to acknowledge what Councillor Mason said that Andy Fillmore uh, announced that the feds were putting is it 28 million into was it 28? 28.822 uh, million uh, into this project. So, um, and uh, as I said this morning, because uh, Pam was the co-chair of the ECMA announcement this morning that I spoke at, she is one of our favorite and most persistent uh, citizens in uh, in Halifax. Thank you. All right, colleagues, we'll move to uh, 15. Two one, uh, standing in the name of Councillor Deagle Gammon from Council HRM Voluntary Vulnerable Persons Registry. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, so this uh, motion is that the Halifax Regional Council request a staff uh, report directing the CAO to consider an HRM Voluntary Vulnerable Persons Registry for residents of HRM. The reports to include the definition and the parameters for the registry with a jurisdictional scan of other successful municipalities. The reports to include the cost of creation and maintaining, as well as confirmation of the protection of the information under the Privacy Act, and to be used only for the purposes of emergency management. So it would be a confidential registry, absolutely. Seconded by Councillor Outhead, was it? Uh, yep. Thank you, Councillor Outhead. Councillor de Graham. Thank you. Um, so I do sit on the Accessibility Advisory Committee. In pre my previous life, as most of you know, I worked with persons with disabilities, intellectual disability, but those also that had a secondary disability of a physical uh, issue. And the last two um, accessibility town halls, uh, the community spoke very well about the need for a voluntary vulnerable persons registry, not only for persons with disabilities, but also for persons who are aging, who are living in their own home, most times 24 seven without uh, any kind of paid care or attention, family support. There's a, a person that lives in, um, in my district and uh, he gave me a quote and he says, I am a T11 complete paraplegic, age 53, living independently on my own. I wouldn't mind having this registry in place. During a disaster, I wouldn't mind having someone check in on me on a regular basis during the duration of a disaster. So when I think, you know, a person with a disability is not necessarily incapable of living on their own or anything like that. This is about when a condition or when an event happens that changes their capacity, uh, changes their ability to be safe in their own homes. We've um, 
Jerry uh, Post, well-known advocate, known to most of you. Uh, he and I met with Erica Fleck. We talked about the role of emergency management, especially what we've seen after Fiona. Um, in uh, my own district after Fiona, I met an awful lot of people who are absolutely fine, but during the disaster, their conditions changed, right? So to have someone look out for them would be uh, an am amazing thing to happen. And I guess the, the thing about this is that it is voluntary. So uh, the staff report would probably look at all the details of what we would need, how you define vulnerable, also how uh, it could be compatible with some of the work that's being introduced uh, at the province. Uh, there's a private member's bill that uh, MLI Lorelei Nickel has brought forward that's looking at that. That actually is, would be a piece of policy and legislative framework. This would be the companion to that and more compatible. So I do hope that um, you all think that this is a lovely thing to get done and uh, that this motion would pass. And I'm sure that you also have examples uh, in your own districts where you've known of persons who were made vulnerable by an event and a registry like this would keep them safe. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you so much for bringing this forward. Uh, uh, just after Fiona had uh, several conversations with uh, Erica Fleck from Emergency Management on this very topic, and uh, you know, this became very clear. The need for this uh, became clear to me after. Fiona, when uh, I was contacted by uh, a woman who lives in the district who has uh, an adult son with uh, severe disabilities who is bedridden, and she was worried about her roof blowing off during the storm, and her emergency management plan was to put her sneakers near the front door and hope that she could run to the fire station in time to get help. So uh, we, we need to do better for our uh, vulnerable residents, and uh, I think this is a, a great place to start. So thank you very much to, uh, to you, Kathy, and to uh, Erica for your work on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you much, Mr. Mayor, and yes, uh, from my experience with the Joint Emergency Management Team we have on the Eastern Shore and the recent experience we had with Fiona and, and, and other recent storms, we've had the occasion of knowing vulnerable people that needed assistance. You know, one thing about rural communities, we, some, some of us know our neighbours, and, 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 and with that we were able to provide some services, but we don't know everybody is moving into an area uh, with their particular situation. We had a particular uh, problem in the uh, Mosher River where someone needed a generator because of a, of a, sleeping, uh, a sleep disorder and needed for their breathing machine and stuff. So we wanted to make sure those things were covered. I totally agree with this and I'm pretty sure we can work with our partners through the Victoria Order of Nurses or other uh, um, day nurses that do, uh, that do day trips and stuff. They know who the vulnerable people are. There's a database out there of who's serving clients at home. All we got to do is collaborate and, co and coordinate with them and, and have that, uh, that list of residents that are vulnerable and we want to make sure that they are protected whenever a case of emergency situation arises, be it a prolonged power outage, uh, be, a, be it a possible flood or erosion issues for, for uh, evacuation for storm surge. We need to know where these citizens are and make sure they're kept safe. So I'm, I'm so fully in support of this initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm happy to support this as well. I, I, I don't, in my, in my career, I don't think there's been a, a storm that's gone by that I didn't hear about someone who was, uh, had concerns about a, a neighbor or a friend. Um, I, I don't know if this can be incorporated at this point, but if, if um, it can, I, I, I hope that we would consider some form of a way of a referral as well for vulnerable people. So it's not just the, it's not, I, Ultimately, a vulnerable person should has the agency to say whether or not they want to be on a list. But some are not may not be connected to the knowledge that it's been out there, without someone else potentially bringing it to someone's attention. Um, you know, there's there's people in our in our communities who are very isolated, and may or may not have access to an in, the internet, television. You'd be surprised at what folks might be living with. 
And I think it would be an important piece to have even an, an anonymous uh, opportunity for a neighbor to call and say, can someone check in on this person to make sure that they know of the information that allows for it. It doesn't mean that that person is responsible for it, but that there's a way even to reach out to counselors and, and let us know that there might be people being missed uh, with to, to learn about this kind of opportunity. I think this is vital, vital to the health of many in our community. We also have, I think we've, we've changed a corner as well on how we support and encourage and um, value the ability for people who are vulnerable to still have agency by living independently and we have, and, and raising uh, persons with disabilities or, or even impairments that it might be as a parent to be concerned that they're actually going to be able to, to be able to survive on their own and independent, that this would give a lot of comfort knowing that there, there is a, a list that could be there in the event that uh, an emergency was happening and uh, they could be at further risk related to it. So I think there's just so many pieces to this that this to me is a, one of those no-brainers. This is a good thing to have. Communication is going to be really, really important to the public to make sure that we get this out there in a way that is not, that it is volunteer, but there's a lot of benefits to it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Dale Gammon. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you, colleagues, for the support that was uh, said. Um, to your point, Councillor Kent, my, I'm hoping that the report can look at uh, a referral process then maybe. My biggest concern is that um, the, in the disability community, what I've heard from them is that it is voluntary. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to take away anybody's autonomy, right? So um, a voluntary, how does voluntary work with referral? So sometimes referral has happened through our GEM teams when we're thinking about emergency management and people are fine with that. Um, but so, I, yeah, my only caution around a referral process is not taking away people's autonomy or the fact that it's voluntary. So, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Ready for the question, colleagues? Carried. Thank you very much. Um, motion from Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council direct the Budget Committee to consider Upper Hammonds Plains Community Action Plan and supporting the engagement as an option over budget as part of the budget adjustment process in the 2023-2024 Planning and Development Budget and Business Planning. Second. Second by Councillor Stoddard. Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, uh, Councillor Stoddard. So I know this is probably uh, not the usual way to go about doing this because as you'll see, there is not an amount associated with this, although it's going to budget committee. Um, so this follows our public hearing that we had on the Upper Hemis Plains um, bylaw and uh, the rezoning of that um, designated community. The uh, staff have assured me that a briefing note uh, along with the value will be uh, forwarded to the budget committee. It's just not ready yet, um, but they are working on it and identifying um, what is needed to address um, this motion. So I, I, I'm not sure what the process is here, Mr. Solicitor, whether or not we can put this forward to the budget committee without an amount and just wait for the briefing note, or if we get the briefing note and then we address it at budget and I put the motion on again. Um, but I'm wondering if you can speak to that, please. Generally, uh, well, look, I don't know what the briefing note is going to say. And who, who exactly is preparing the briefing note? I'm sorry, Councillor. Uh, in that case, then it, it would form part of a briefing note. If if it's added to the budget adjustment list, there will be a briefing note prepared to go with it. That's so right. that yes. comes after the fact. Yeah. So okay. whether it's moved here or whether it's moved at the budget okay. uh, committee. Thank you. So I will ask you to support this so we can move forward with this. Um, uh, proposal to create a community action plan for Upper Hammonds Plains. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. I'm just curious if any of the community here is a part of the upper is a part of the uh, local area rate for Hammonds Plains. If they are, would the funds for this particular uh, 
action plan be going from that area rate or would this be general from something from the general funds? That would have to be addressed in the briefing note. Okay, thank you. Councilor Cuttle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess um, my question was just about process and, and um, bringing this forward at regional as opposed to bringing it through the budget committee and if that makes any difference and and why we would be doing this here and and not there. I don't know if... Um, we'll let uh, Councillor Lovely speak to that if she wishes to... Uh, to. Certainly, so the notice of motion followed the public hearing um, after the conversation that we heard from the public. So I felt it was important to move that at regional council while they were here in the room, knowing that that was part of a recommendation that came from staff and knowing that staff are working on the briefing note to move forward uh, to budget committee. So um, while it's not uh, perfect, it is imperfect and uh, would appreciate your support on that. Right. So would it be brought forward when we have the presentation from planning and development or would it be brought forward when we consider the bow list at the end? It says the bow list, so the it would be a briefing list. note that would come with us when we do the bow at the end of March or whenever it is. All right, thank you. Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm struggling not with the notion of what is being asked, I'm struggling with the fact that it's being brought here. I think that we could potentially be setting a precedent for the, the uh, inundating council agendas with this kind of budgetary consideration. I think that frankly, it needs to stay within the budget debate. We've got one tomorrow. It could have just as easily been brought there. Um, at any point, any of us can raise uh, ballot items um, and we will be we, and we all know of the, the schedule for that. So I, I'm, I'm going to vote in f against it because it's here, knowing that it really, in my opinion, and, and I think uh, Councillor Cuddle has, has expressed some concerns around it too. I don't, I don't see where, where it fits here um, that the net benefit, it still needs to go through the budget process that with, the brief, with the briefing note, the information all of it brought back to us just like anyone else would, would do. So I, I, I'm not convinced of it being needed here. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as I recall, we've had a number of motions from Council going to the Budget Committee pre-2020 and since 2020. Uh, we're the same body. Uh, we're just referring it to a committee just as we would any other issue that we would refer to a committee. Uh, the issue is not so much does it come from here or does it come from budget committee because uh, we have done this before. Uh, the issue is going to be once it gets to the budget adjustment list, I'm not sure whose face, there's a bunch of faces over there uh, when someone said 12%, uh, but colleagues, we have a lot of stuff going to the budget adjustment list. Almost all of them are overs. Councillor Austin, kudos for you being the only successful under so far. Uh, major under, uh, eight, eight, eight million dollars. Uh, but so, you know, let, I'll, I'll vote to put this on the budget adjustment list. I may not vote for it once it's there because we have a lot of stuff, including, and also why is it coming from here? If you remember the staff report on the Upper Hammonds Plains uh, uh, motion and public hearing, this was in it. And I, I, I mentioned it at the time that it, rec it, and I asked actually questions of our staff, it recommended hiring some staff to do more work. And so it was a council report, council motion, it's here. If Don't not vote for this because it's at council. It's, we're the same body, it's going to the same place. Uh, vote for it based on whether or not you agree to add resources. Again, this is just a parking lot, but once we get to that parking lot, there's gonna be a lot of disappointed faces around this table because we can't do all the stuff that's in the parking lot and we still have to find, Madam CAO, a, a, well, I think it was 15 million, but we didn't vote for a bunch of stuff, so I, I think it's still even more money somewhere uh, for other cuts if we're gonna achieve anything close to 4%, and it won't be. Uh, so, you know, let's not make it 12. <laughs> Thanks. CAO. I just wanted to mention that the Planning and Development Business Unit is coming forward on February 17th. 
and that might be the place to have the discussion to put it on the ballot list because I'm confident staff would have the number for that time at that presentation if that would make people feel more comfortable. Councillor Lovelace? Uh, yes, thank you. So just a final word. Um, so this isn't precedent setting. We've done this before. We'll do it again. Um, you know, to, uh, as to Councillor Clary's point, this came from Council as a notice of motion from that staff report and from that public hearing. So it's not that this is out of order or precedent setting. Uh, I'm just asking you today to move it ahead so that when we have the discussion with the development um, and planning business unit, we have that briefing note and we have this uh, bowel already together. I, I, I just don't understand why we wouldn't do it since it's here in front of us. And it was a notice of motion uh, following that public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Right. For those following at home, BAL is budget adjustment list, uh, and when things go in the budget adjustment list, it does not mean that they are approved for budget. It means they're there for consideration. Ready for the question, colleagues? That is carried. Thank you. Um, there's nothing in camera other than an information item. I am going to ask the deputy mayor if he might read a couple of proclamations that I neglected to get him to read that are important for the community, uh, if I can do that now. Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Before we do that, uh, could I ask that that uh, in-camera info report be brought forward for our next meeting? Yeah. Thank you. So it shall be asked, so it shall be done. I uh, missed that one. Um, so I'll read the first proclamation, uh, African Heritage Month, February 2023. Whereas the Halifax Regional Municipality is committed to celebrating the cultural heritage of all citizens and whereas February is recognized internationally as African Heritage Month, a time to recognize and salute the many contributions and ongoing achievements of black people all over the world. And whereas 2023 marks the 39th year the Black History Month Association has celebrated the achievement of African Nova Scotians in Halifax. And whereas this year's theme, Seas of Struggle, African Peoples from Shore to Shore, outlines the struggle of people of African, de people of African descent faced from the shores of Africa to the shores of Nova Scotia, recognizing that the one thing that has remained constant in our history is the Atlantic Ocean, the long-standing history of people of African descent in the development of Canada, the sea has played a vital role. This theme explores the struggle and adversity that was was overcome and examines the effects of slavery and seafaring of African Nova Scotians. Whereas this year's theme also aligns with the 2015 to 2024 global observance of the United Nations International Decade for People of African Descent, the goal of DPAD is to strengthen global cooperation and support of people of African descent, increase awareness and the, pa and the passage towards presence in all aspects of society. Therefore, be it resolved that I, Mayor Mike Savage, on behalf of Halifax Regional Council, do hereby proclaim February 2023 as African Heritage Month in the Halifax Regional Municipality. So that was the first one. So the next one. Uh, proclamation for Bell Let's Talk Day. Whereas January 25th, 2023 marks the 13th annual Bell Let's Talk Day, a day of conversation, support, and positive change for mental health. And whereas the Halifax Regional Municipality supports positive mental health for all citizens and members of our community and seeks to improve the lives of the one, of the one in five citizens who will experience a mental illness or mental health issue in their lifetime, and Halifax Regional Municipality raises a flag to celebrate Bell Let's Talk Day and encourages all citizens of Atrium to join the conversation and help create positive change. Therefore, be it resolved that uh, Mayor Mike Savage, on behalf of Halifax Regional Council, do hereby proclaim January 25th, 2023, as Bell Let's Talk Day in the Halifax Regional Municipality and encourage support of this campaign. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, we have no added items. Clerk, Mr. Clerk. I'll go to notices of motion. Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Chair. Take notice at a future meeting of the Halifax Regional Council, I intend to move the council consider adopting one bylaw T800 respecting property tax billing for tax relief recipients and two amendments to administrative order 18, the revenue collections policy 
the purpose of which is to authorize once per year property tax billing property tax billing for organizations that have been accepted into the municipality's tax relief for nonprofit organizations program. Thank you. Councillor of Beautiful District 6, <coughs> Councillor Mancini. Mr. Mayor, I have two. Uh, first one, take notice that at a future meeting of Halifax Regional Council, I intend to move proposed administrative order 2023-002-ADM respecting public participation for planning documents, public engagement for certain planning applications, and engagement with abutting municipalities and amendments to administrative order number 48, the Community Council Administrative Order, the purpose of which is to set minimum standards for public engagement, set requirements for engaging with their neighborhood, neighboring communities, and direct how the public engagement guidebook should be used to develop public participation programs. The next one is take notice that at a future meeting of Halifax Regional Council, I intend to move the council consider adopting by policy a public participation program, the purpose of which is to permit the development of a single unit dwellings on R1, single family residential zone properties, along with Green Bank Court and Cove Lane. Councilor Smith. Thank you. Take notice that at a future meeting of Halifax Regional Council, I intend to move a motion to direct the Chief Administrative Officer to provide a staff report that provides options regarding potential future uses for 5812 to 14 North Street, Halifax, that would recognize its historical importance, including but not limited to one, collaborating with the property owner to preserve and commemorate the property's history as part of redevelopment, two, purchasing the property for preservation and development by the municipality, or three, purchasing the property with the goal of providing a space to nonprofit health care, affordable housing service providers associated with the African Nova Scotian community. All right, if there's nobody else, then um, we will uh, leave this meeting for now. We're back at six o'clock with a public hearing. Um, so that's it for now. I just remind people who may not be here for the public hearing that we have a budget for people who want to watch from home tomorrow morning at 9.30. I'm told that both bridges will be open tomorrow, but subject to change, subject to change, subject to change. Um, we'll be back here at uh, six o'clock. Yeah.
Okay. Uh, we, we're waiting on a one person. Hope that. Uh, hope they weren't poisonous. Thank you, boy. And I'm just going to hold tight. We have a little, um, you know, internal strategy meeting going on here until our deputy mayor. All right, folks, we are here for a public hearing. Thanks to, thanks to everybody who's uh, joined us tonight. Uh, so the process tonight is we'll hear from a staff for a presentation, and then if there's any questions or clarification from staff, we then give the applicant an opportunity to present. After that, we open the public hearing. Speakers can participate for a maximum of five minutes. Keep your comments respectable on topic and directed to the chair. The clerk will announce when you have 30 seconds. We've got new props for that, eh? Look at this. That's great. That's awesome. That's, uh, that's the technology that works the best. So that's straight from the old uh, gong show. So the clerk will announce when you have 30 seconds. Uh, I'll call three times. Has there been any more correspondence, Mr. Clerk, on this issue? Additional correspondence was circulated to all members of council this afternoon. Okay. All right, then we shall begin. I'm going to ask for a staff presentation. I understand that Megan Mond is here. For a few more weeks anyway, by the look of it. Good evening. Okay, presentation, wait for that. Perfect. Should I wait for the presentation to pop up? Okay. Great. Well, good evening, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. My name is Megan Mond, and I'm a planner with HRM's Urban Enabled Applications Group. And tonight I will be presenting on case 24045, which is an application to make amendments to the Beaverbank, Hammonds Plains, and Upper Sackville Municipal Planning Strategy and Land Use Bylaw for the Carriagewood Estates Subdivision. So the applicant for this proposal is Clayton Developments. And they have asked to amend the municipal planning strategy as well as the land use bylaw for Beaverbank, Hammonds Plains, and Upper Sackville to enable smaller lots to be created in their proposed subdivision called Carriagewood Estates. Carriagewood Estates is located in Beaverbank, immediately to the east of Trinity Lane and to the north end of Daisy Drive. So the lands, uh, as I mentioned, are located in Beaver Bank. They are just to the east of Beaver Bank Road and generally kind of situated between Galloway Drive and south of, or sorry, north of Galloway Drive and south of Kinsack Road. So the image on the left-hand side, uh, that's, that's showing that, and then on the right-hand side is the approximate boundaries of the site. So the site can be accessed from two locations on Trinity Lane and then it's accessed from the end of Daisy Drive, which you can see there. 
So the surrounding area is primarily single unit dwelling development. The area has developed over the decades, so the lot design and architecture of the houses does vary in the neighborhood. Some of the development did occur pre-municipal water and sewer services, so those lots tend to be larger, while more recent development is happening on smaller lots. The image on the top left shows an example of some of the larger lots that you would see along Trinity Lane. And then there's mature houses, the houses are further set back and set back from each other. And then the image on the bottom right shows the houses, some of the newer development on Daisy Drive that will be close to the proposed Carriagewood Estate subdivision. And those are um, obviously on smaller lots. So there are three levels of planning documents in HRM. The highest level is the regional plan and it guides where population growth and investments in services like transit, piped water and sewer should occur. The second level is community plans and community plans focus on specific geographic areas and outline where and how different types of development should occur. So often planning applications that require council approval are enabled in the community plans, but in this application the proposal was not enabled by the community plan. The third level and most detailed planning document is the land use bylaw, and the land use bylaw identifies the zoning of the lands and specifies the regulations for developing a property. So any development that can meet the land use bylaw regulations can happen without council approval and without community engagement. So the site is serviced with municipal water and sewer. It's currently zoned R1 under the Beaverbank Hammonds Plains and Upper Sackville land use bylaw. And this zone permits single unit dwellings, two unit dwellings, or sorry, existing two unit dwellings and mobile dwellings and accessory uses. The site is designated residential under the Beaverbank Hammonds Plains and Upper Sackville Municipal Planning Strategy. And this designation seeks to support and protect the existing low density residential environment. And the site is currently vacant, but construction has begun for an as of right subdivision. So amendments to an MPS are significant undertakings and council should only consider such amendments when circumstances have changed since the planning document was originally adopted. The circumstances would need to have changed to the extent that the original land use policy is no longer appropriate. So this slide highlights the steps for this planning application. Regional Council initiated the process to consider the proposed amendments on April 12, 2022. And then since then, staff have completed a detailed review of the proposal, engaged with the public, and prepared a staff report which went for first reading in December of 2022. The application is now in its final stages. So following the public hearing tonight, council will make a decision to approve or refuse the proposed MPS and land use bylaw amendments. And if the proposed amendments are approved, then those will be forwarded to the province for review. And assuming that all was approved, then um, the, the amendments would be in effect and the applicant could apply for permits under the new rules. So as I mentioned, the subject site is currently zoned R1. And lots in the R1 zone must have at least 6,000 square feet of lot area and 60 feet of street frontage. So today, if Clayton wanted to subdivide the lands, they would have to meet those minimum size requirements. So they are asking to be able to subdivide the lands into lots that are 4,000 square feet instead with 40 feet of frontage. So they've specifically asked for the smaller lot requirements to only apply to the Carriagewood Estates subdivision in response to a previous application where they submitted um, an application to change the uh, R1 zone requirements itself so that it would affect all serviced um, and lots that are capable of being serviced zoned R1 in Beaverbank, Hammonds Plains and Upper Sackville. And then to further the limit of their imp sorry, to further limit the impact of their ask, they've also proposed to cap the population density to no more than 228 houses. Um, so that is the same number that they have approval to build under today's regulation. So they're not asking for any more density within the subdivision, even with the smaller lots. So the community engagement process is consistent with the intent of the HRM community engagement strategy, the HRM charter and the public participation program approved by council in February of 1997. 
Staff provided information and sought comments through the HRM website. They had signage posted on the site, mailed 225 letters to property owners within the notification area, and hosted a virtual public information meeting on August 18th of 2022. The total number of web page views um, between April 2022 and January 18th of this year was 373. So of those 302 were unique views. Visitors spent an average of four minutes and 15 seconds on the web page. We had approximately five people attend the virtual meeting and then we had 13 uh, calls or emails with feedback as well. So the comments raised during the meeting included the following topics. Concerns about traffic on Beaverbank Road, need for additional sidewalks in the neighborhood, concerns about the response time for emergency vehicles, and concerns and questions relating to the development of the Carriagewood Estate subdivision itself. So the comments that we received via email and phone included all of those same comments we heard at the meeting as well as the following. The impacts of the subdivision's development on residents and wildlife, challenges with turning left on Beaverbank Road, the need for an alternate route in and out of the community, concerns about a greater demand being put on municipal services such as water and sewer, concerns about school capacity, concerns that this application will set a precedent and other developers will be asking for the same thing, the aesthetic of smaller lots does not fit in with the community, the reason they chose to live in Beaverbank was for larger lots and open space, they don't want city sized lots, the need for more crosswalks in the community, and the need for the poor cell service to be fixed. So the proposed MPS policy, new MPS policy to enable this request is a little bit of a long one, so I'll just give an overview of it. The policy would be added to the residential designation, and it would enable the creation of a new zone that's based on the existing R1 zone, but permits smaller lots. So this new zone will be called the R1C zone or the small lot single unit dwelling zone. The policy limits the application of this new zone to the subject site only and it limits the number of single unit dwellings that can be built on this site to 228. So here is an overview of some of the key parts of the proposed R1C zone that would be added to the land use bylaw. So the permitted uses are single unit dwellings, uses accessory to single unit dwellings such as offices and daycares, and open space uses. The requirements are the same as the R1 zone, except for the minimum lot area and the minimum lot frontage, which would be 4,000 square feet and 40 feet respectively. The zone would also specify that the subject site could have a maximum of 228 single unit dwellings, which is carried through from the policy. So we have some rationale for this proposed policy. Um, firstly, HRM cannot regulate the cost of housing, but they can play a role in supporting housing affordability, and affordable housing is encouraged through the regional municipal planning strategy. The cost of construction it, for new public streets and services within a more compact development is typically less than would be in, an, in a new community with extensive road frontage. The average price of housing and HRM has increased dramatically over recent years, along with the cost of living. Opportunities for residential development on lots with less frontage, where there's already central services available, could help bring more affordable housing to the market. Further, the proposed amendments are also limited in their scope. So firstly, they're site specific and don't enable the new, enable the new zones application to any other lots. Secondly, both the proposed municipal planning strategy amendments and land use bylaw text amendments explicitly state the maximum number of single unit dwellings that can be built on the site. And thirdly, the proposed new zone deviates from the existing R1 zone only with regards to minimum lot area and minimum frontage. So all of the other land use bylaw regulations, including permitted uses, minimum setbacks, lot coverage, building height, accessory structures, um, and provisions for parking, watercourse buffers, and secondary suites all remain the same. So by keeping much of the land use controls the same, the character of the new development will better blend with the existing character in the area. 
So in summary, Clayton is asking for the ability to create smaller residential lots on one parcel of land in Beaverbank. To enable this ask, both the MPS and the land use bylaw for Beaverbank, Hammonds Plains and Upper Sackville does need to be amended. A new policy would be added to the residential designation in the MPS that enables the creation of the new zone to permit smaller lots and a new schedule will be inserted into the MPS to identify the subject site. The proposed land use bylaw amendments are to add a new residential zone that permits the smaller, the single unit dwellings on smaller lots, as well as complementary uses, the rezoning of the subject site from R1 to R1C, and a new schedule to identify the subject site. So staff recommend that regional council adopt the proposed amendments to the municipal planning strategy and land use bylaw for Beaverbank, Hammonds Plains and Upper Sackville as set out in attachment A and B of the staff report dated December 7th, 2022. And that's everything, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Megan. A question of clarification uh, from Councillor uh, Lovelace. Uh, certainly, yes, thank you, Megan. Appreciate the presentation. A uh, quick question um, on the use. Uh, why wouldn't shared housing be included in this zone? Um, so the uses that we have chosen for the zone are copied and pasted directly from the existing R1 zone. So it's the single unit dwellings and the shared housing was not in the existing R1 zone. Um, there is a note in there that we have included bed and breakfasts as well mm -hmm. as the um, the new the, the proposed um, uh, housing or the units for uh, rental that was discussed earlier this afternoon. And the new, the word is escaping me. The short term rentals. Short term rentals yeah. are in there, but shared housing is not. It's not no. Okay. And then my other question is, what is the rationale for limiting this R1C zone if there are um, other R1s within um, a service boundary. Um, so, sorry, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. So, the, the purpose of limiting this zone to the application of just the subject site was to limit the impacts of, of the application. So, when Clayton first came forward with the idea of having smaller lots in this area, it was to apply it to all of the R1 zone lands. Mm -hmm. And there was quite a lot of pushback from the community in, in terms of concern that it would affect the character of all of Beaverbank. Um, so, when we looked at the numbers, it would be affecting about 808 properties um, and that could enable almost up to 50% of them to be further subdivided into small lots which would have quite a significant impact on not only the character but traffic and other things so it was quite hard to um, understand the ramifications of that under that application. Okay, thank you. It's, it's important to have that background. Thanks, Megan. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you mentioned that some of the concerns that were raised were about uh, traffic and traffic infrastructure, everything from um, crosswalks and lights. Was there a traffic study done and will this have an impact on, on traffic infrastructure, required traffic infrastructure? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. So uh, Clayton did submit an application or uh, TIS with their application. However, the nature of this application does not um, require that we have a TIS. So what they're asking to do is to amend the land use bylaw itself, and so then any further development would be reviewed through the permit application process or the subdivision application process. So Clayton does have applications. They have had an approved concept subdivision application um, for the Carriagewood Estates itself and the TIS was submitted in support of that and reviewed through that process um, but the TIS was made available for this application as well and then um, any subsequent subdivision applications the development engineering group would decide um, what they need in terms of traffic impact studies to evaluate how that's being affected but that's that's all through a separate process that you look at traffic. Yeah okay and I guess there's no change in the actual number of lots so it's not exactly yes Another. what was already approved. So the, the, the other question, I know we say this sometimes, and I'm just wondering if you explain, like when we, when we make statements like this would keep the cost of housing down, I'm, I'm wondering like how do we quantify that? Because I mean, it, there's nothing stopping the developer from getting market rate like, as much as they possibly can. Even if they save costs, they're still gonna try to maximize the profit. That's the way 
housing market works. So, but as you know, when, when we have staff make presentations and kind of make these declarations, I'm just wondering, what is that based on? And are those statements fair to make? Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillors. So I would I would caution that it's that we're not claiming that this will provide more affordable housing. It is a mechanism that could lead to affordable housing, but ultimately we can't control the quality of the housing that's built and the price that that housing goes up for sale. So if you look to our regional municipal planning strategy, it does talk about different techniques that we can use to su better support. Um, hopefully, at the end of the day, having more affordable housing but I wouldn't say that this is because you have smaller lots you can absolutely provide more affordable housing it's it's a tool that we have at our disposal that we can use as planners um, but it's not something that can guarantee that the housing will be more affordable yeah thank you I just think we need to be put the caveats around that thank you thank you Councillor Clary thank you mr. mayor um, it's funny I didn't even look at attachment B before I just looked at the lot being shrunk, and I was like, well, that's a good thing. Uh, but then Councillor Lovelace brought up the shared housing, uh, and you said it isn't included as, as a use. Um, in uh, July of this past year, so six months ago, uh, Council gave direction for all municipal planning strategies and land use bylaws to include shared housing. Um, so I'm just curious why shared housing wasn't part of that, given that six months ago we said it had to be everywhere. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor. I might be speaking wrong, and I see Aaron coming up. <laughs> if it, it may not have been embedded in the zone. So Aaron, do you want to speak to it if you have? Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Aaron McIntyre, Director of Development Services. Um, the, the amendments specific to Beaver Bank, Upper Hammonds, Plains, and uh, Sackville were deferred for Council's decision at a later date for shared housing, just within this plan area. They're coming back uh, some point in the future. I recall... Um, so I'll have to go back and search the minutes, but I recall from that meeting that uh, what we, we did not defer any uh, zones. We asked for information to come back to us upon adoption, looking at things like parking and other issues that were a concern for some. Uh, so I'll have to dig into those minutes from July 12, because I don't recall that being the case during our council meeting. Anyway. I appreciate the clarification. Thank you. Councillor Lovelace. Uh, thank you, Mayor, so I'll just confirm that on page 39 of the land use bylaw for, Hammonds, for Beaver Bank, Hammonds Plains, Upper Sockville, uh, under R1 uses permitted, it clearly says shared housing use with 10 or fewer bedrooms. Um, and the date on that is August 9th, 2022, and then again, September 15th, 2022. So it's currently in the land use bylaw. So I think there might just be a little bit of discrepancy as far as what it should be, um, but if, if on one hand we're saying no, but on the other hand we're saying the land use bylaw is yes, I think maybe we just, we've got our ducks not in a row, Mr. Mayor. So is there any further clarification from staff on that? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I can, I have the land use bylaw on my laptop. If that's helpful, I can go open it up and see if, how it applies, or Carl might actually. <laughs> Calling all the backup. In it. If everybody else has it, right? Hi again, sorry about that. I think I'm confusing things. I think it was the MU1 zone that was deferred. It might have just been specific to the MU1 zone. Yes. I was thinking it was plan wide, so my apologies for that. Carl's confirmed, Megan's confirmed, it is in the R1 zone. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. I'm good. Okay. So we'll make that Trepid work by councillors, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Clary. So a uh, quick uh, clarification from our solicitor. Given that we're at a public hearing and what's been provided to the public is not factually correct with what's in our land use bylaws and should be in our land use bylaws, where does this leave us tonight for ensuring this follows all of the other bylaws and the current bylaw and the direction council gave six months ago? That's a good question for you, John. 
Give us an answer, though. Yeah, thanks. Uh, <laughs> so it's in the R1. This is an addition uh, 7B. So the question is, does that amend the R1 or does it add on to it? And I, and I can't answer that. I'd have to turn to the planning staff to let me know where that sits. Megan, go ahead. Yep, there we go. <laughs> uh, so this will be an entirely new zone. What we did was base it on the R1 zone, but we must have missed that, that part of the R1 zone. Could we, while we're waiting for an answer, Mr. Solicitor, pass what's here tonight as so we don't have to go back to another public hearing uh, and then move a motion at the end for a SUP report on amending that and adding that which would then, I mean, it's another land use bylaw, so it's gonna require another public hearing either way. I'd, I'd like to confer with the director of planning and just in terms of whether this is substantive given, I, I think probably it would be worth taking a couple of minutes to see what okay. we can do. Uh, Mr. Mayor? People, yeah, people don't, don't leave your chairs. We're gonna figure this out real quick. I think we're still on questions of clarification. Yeah. If, if it's non-substantive, adding one little use. Okay, um, folks, uh, I want to ask councillors to stop complimenting each other. It's not appropriate. Uh, <laughs> although I do think that uh, mask becomes you way. Uh, all right, folks, uh, do we have, uh, Megan, are you, uh, you've got an idea for us? I will not uh, take credit for the idea, but yes, Mr. Mayor, we have an idea. Uh, so the MU1 amendment package will be coming forward within the next six months. So at that point when we introduce the shared housing in that zone, um, or I, I actually shouldn't speak to, I don't know what that application is for. Um, we can also make the amendments to this zone uh, should council decide to pass the new zone today, then we could insert that new use into that, into the R1C zone at a later date. So does that, does that slow things down for tonight and for the development? Okay. No. All right, thank you. Are we all okay with that? Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. If there's no other um, questions for Megan, uh, then uh, I'm gonna ask for a motion to open the public hearing. Move, second it all in favor. And we will invite the applicant to come up to uh, council. I believe it's Andrew Bone from Clayton Developments. Welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council and any members of the public here tonight for allowing me to present on our amendment for Carriagewood Estates. My name is Andrew Bone. I'm the Director of Planning and Development with Clayton Developments. It's great to be back at Council for the first time since my retirement two years ago. Um, I'm here with my colleague, Jared Diel, a Senior Planner at Clayton. 
Clayton Developments has been in, in existence since 1959, and we've developed over 18 communities throughout Atlanta, Canada, including many in HRM, including Colby Village, Clayton Park, Bedford South, and Bedford West, to name a few. Our communities provide homes for over 75,000 people, and our larger, larger developments include a mix of, of uh, residential office and retail uses. The Shaw Group, our parent company, uh, has recently celebrated 160 years in business in Atlanta, Canada. Next slide. The proposal we are discussing is about modernizing zoning and subdivision rules in the urban service area, and specifically a portion of Beaver Bank, to create housing which is more affordable or attainable than current zoning enables, uh, while not increasing the density, not increasing the traffic over base, base requirements, not increasing the impact on other uh, facilities such as schools, while maintaining minimum standards relating to relationships between properties, creating a sim similar building form, and while re reducing the amount of road the municipality has to take over and maintain. Next slide. This map sh shows the site uh, in Beaver Bank, serviced by sewer and water, outlined in blue. Carriagewood Estates is the last large undeveloped uh, service site with sewer and water in Beaverbank at about 76.6 uh, acres, shown with the red star. The development on, of this site is currently underway with existing subdivision rules, or 60 foot wide lots, uh, with an anticipated yield of 270 lots. This is an as of right process enabling development of the land by standard subdivision rules and permitting. The develop, development sections include Splinter Court, Daisy Drive, and Darner Drive, with 220 lots remaining. This is our second planning application related to this site, based on public concern with our previous application, which was case 23213. We've placed that application on hold and made this application. This application covers a smaller area, thus limiting the impact to just our lands. The request maintains existing development yields, which do not increase the number of lots that are available. The request maintains separation distances and setback requirements, and enables housing, which is typical and present in the Beaver Bank area. Ultimately, our request is for a new R1C zone. If approved, the proposed amendments would increase, improve affordability, maintain density of the site, reduce the length of public road, decrease HRM road maintenance costs, enable to increase uh, setbacks from the wetland on water courses on site, effectively creating more green space on the site or open space, and does not create any changes uh, outside the subdivision, uh, making this a site-specific amendment. This is our concept plan of Carriagewood Estates. Next slide. For context, the lands identified in blue are currently developed with 60-foot lots. Next slide. Uh, the lands in red are proposed at 40-foot wide lots, uh, subject to the new R1C zone requirements. And the area in green is wetland and open space uh, that uh, becomes available because of the, the new rules. This slide shows the original approved concept and the updated proposed concept for the site. The existing portion of Daisy Drive and Darner Drive uh, are constructed at 60 foot wide lots and provide a transition to the existing neighborhood in areas such as Trinity Lane. Um, the red line shows the extent of the previous subdivision plan, the, the development closer to the wetland and reduced amount of open space in the subdivision, or sorry, increased amount of open space. The new design for 40 foot with 40 foot lots provides a variety of benefits since the same number of units can be fit into the smaller area. There are three less cul-de-sacs which are being removed. The road length has been reduced by 700 meters, which means less maintenance costs. These, change, trans, these changes translate uh, into more 
undisturbed open space and a larger buffer against the wetland and cost savings from reduced infrastructure allows these homes to be brought to market at a lower price point than 60 foot lots. I just want to highlight that um, there is a price difference uh, between 60 foot lots and 40 foot lots. The market itself uh, demands that. The uh, people will not pay the same amount for those. So there is a cost saving. And that's at this point because the subdivision is not constructed, those, uh, the prices have not been set. Um, so I can't give you exact numbers, but there is a price difference. So there is a, uh, a significant difference in the cost between 40 foot and 60 foot lots. Uh, public comment provided included concerns with traffic and other infrastructure. Um, because uh, the, the lot yield is being maintained under this new zone, uh, there's no greater impact than the base uh, zoning. This area is in service, a serviced area and is in an area where the municipality has not placed controls uh, on development relating to traffic on Beaver Bank Road because service development is, is development that's more desirable than some of the development in the Beaver Bank area that is on rural large lots. Sidewalks are being constructed within the development and other, any other impacts are consistent with uh, what's enabled un under current policy. In closing, the outcome of reducing lot widths on the property, right size the regulations to match market need, create more attainable housing products by reducing infrastructure costs, create savings on municipal services, and lowers in environmental impact in Carriagewood by, re by reducing the development area and increasing the open space. For these reasons, we suggest that the, reducing the minimum lot frontage requirements and lot size in the newly proposed R1C zone will have an overall positive impact. Thank you for this opportunity and your attention to this, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, question of clarification, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, uh, and thank you, uh, Andrew, for uh, the presentation. Appreciate that. Uh, just wanted to uh, confirm, uh, so this change will result in uh, extra green space uh, in, in the subdivision, so that would be extra land that would be turned over to HRM as, as parkland, potentially? So there's, um, what, it's, what it allows us to do is, is pull the housing back from the wetland. So um, we have offered uh, to, to give this extra land to the municipality. Okay. Um, whether or not parklands, parkland planning will, will take it is, a, is another question. Gotcha. That, will, that would be resolved through the planning process. But uh, you know, there's, it, it'll either become the, the back of lots and and remain undisturbed, okay. or we'll, we'll go to the uh, municipality's parkland. Right. There, is, there, just, there is a central park as well that, that is fully dedicated for parkland right. uses, so um, that meets the sort of the general 10% uh, requirements of, of subdivision. Okay, um, and uh, you indicated that uh, the uh, subdivision is currently under construction, so there, there are a handful of uh, homes that are either built or in flight now that uh, will be at s the, the 60 foot, but they're sort of front ended to the subdivision. You're not gonna see a, you know, a, a scenario where there's 40 foot lot and then a 60 foot lot, just so the 60 foot lots are, are front ended. So, so the, um, the 60 foot lots um, that are being constructed now, right now are on, I think it's Darner. Mm -hmm. And half, um, uh, roughly a third to a half of Darner is at 60 foot lots. Um, the remainder of the land, if the, the zoning goes through, mm -hmm. would be capable of, would be the, the, the minimum required, or the maximum, yeah, the minimum uh, lot side would be 40 feet. Right. Now, outside of this application, Clayton Developments has at our last public meeting committed that we would adjacent the existing development, 
continue to do 60 foot lots, so that's the west side of Darner. Mm -hmm. We would do that as a buffer. Um, that's not reflected in anything, but that's our commitment to the, the community. So we will, there'll be a few more 60 foot lots, okay. but the, the majority of the rest would be uh, 40 foot lots. And do you have an indication of what the difference uh, price point wise would be between the 60 footers that are already built or I, I don't know if any of them has, have been sold yet, but just, you know, as a comparison, uh, what uh, you know the price point would be for a 60 foot versus a 40 foot. Right, um, I talked to our marketing people and they said that the, the prices hadn't been set yet. Okay. But uh, you know there is a, a, enough of a difference that it's, it, it will definitely help people in the area buy. Because mm. the savings comes not just from the smaller lot but the fact that you don't need as much road, road. you don't have as many cul-de-sacs, so there's the savings is built into that. I'm just trying yeah. to understand the math. Yeah, the, the, the math is complicated because yeah. the, the, the only input that's changing is, is road frontage, right. but all the other inputs remain the same, so the amount of laterals and, and uh, the amount of work that has to be done is, is, is similar. So it's not a direct, you know, you can't say that, um, by dropping the frontage. By uh, every foot, you save X number of dollars. Yeah, it's, it's not, not a not direct a, it's not correlation. It's not linear, gotcha. It's not linear. Okay. So, um, but there is a significant difference and it will be noticeable among purchasers. All right, appreciate that, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. There's no other questions um, of clarification. We'll now move to the speakers list. Members of the public will be given five minutes to address the topic. I'll call your name. You can come forward to the microphone. We have nobody on the list at, uh, the, uh, who's signed up in advance to speak, but if there's anybody here who wishes to speak to it, you are welcome to come forward now. Is there anybody here who wishes to speak to this? Is there anybody here who wishes to speak to this? There's nothing for the applicant to respond to, so I will ask for a motion to close the public hearing. Moved by Councillor uh, Russell, seconded by Councillor Lovelace. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Councillor Blackburn, will you take us on this? Thank you very much, and uh, I'll start by putting the, uh, the motion on the floor. That uh, I move that Halifax Regional Council adopt the proposed amendments to the Municipal Planning Strategy and Land Use Bylaw for Beaver Bank, Hammonds Plains and Upper Sackville, as set out in attachments A and B of the staff report dated December 7th, 2022, to enable smaller residential lots for a proposed subdivision called Carriagewood Estates off Daisy Drive in Beaver Bank, I so move. Seconded. Seconded by Councillor Russell. Um, Thank you, and just out of curiosity, I'm just wondering why the, the motion doesn't include, uh, since we're limiting this to just one PID number, I'm just wondering why the PID number isn't included in the motion, but um, I can, I'll, I'll, I'll wait for uh, an answer on that one, but uh, just to give folks uh, some background, uh, thank you so much to, uh, to staff, the community, uh, for, uh, you know, letting us know about, uh, about uh, this and, uh, you know, this again, as uh, as Andrew pointed out, this is the second time around for uh, for this uh, application, a little different form this time around. And, and thank you very much to Clayton for you know hearing the community and uh, and changing the scope of the application. Uh, originally, this application would have been uh, you know subject to the entire planning area, and uh, that was a, a non-starter for the community. This uh, that would have changed uh, the the entire vibe of uh, not just Beaver Bank, but uh, you know many other communities in the planning district. So uh, I was uh, very pleased to uh, to see Clayton withdraw and come back with something uh, a little more targeted. Uh, so you know, just to let you know that uh, these units are going to be built at 60 feet or 40 feet. These 222 units are are allowed as of right. Um, so you know that's that's why perhaps there wasn't uh, you know. A, a, a huge uh, traffic impact statement done. I mean, this is 
this is a, a by right subdivision. This land was always expected to be developed. Um, and actually that development was taken into account when uh, the capacity of Beaver Bank Road was uh, determined years ago. Uh, you know, saying yes to this request will not add a single unit to the project. Uh, 228 is what they're building, that's what they're allowed to build, that's what they're going to build. And as pointed out, uh, this will give some more green space, some more uh, uh, wider berth around the, uh, the wetlands in the area, which uh, certainly will be appreciated by the community. Um, just wondering if we could quickly go to slide 11 on uh, the, do we still have access to that, the HRM um, uh, presentation? presentation? Yeah, slide 11. Just a couple of things that I wanted to uh, address. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, so impact of the subdivision on residents and wildlife, again, as I said, this is going, this is a by right uh, development, so uh, it, it's coming whether we like it or not. Uh, challenges turning left onto Beaver Bank Road. Yes, Beaver Bank Road is uh, at capacity, near capacity, and we do have uh, serious conversations going on right now with the uh, provincial MLA who wants to breathe new life into the Beaver Bank uh, bypass project. So, you know, that is something that uh, the province had on the books for many, many years, and for whatever reason it wasn't funded, but uh, good to see that. Uh, the attention is turning back to that. Uh, let's see, uh, concerns about demands on municipal water and sewer. Um, again, you know, there were no issues seen with, with that. Halifax Water was fully engaged and they have more than enough capacity for uh, these uh, 228 homes. Same with the school, Beaverbank Monarch School and uh, Beaverbank Kinsack School as well as Harold T. Barrett Junior High all have uh, room. They're, uh, they're not uh, at capacity, certainly not uh, in a state as some of our other schools are in the, uh, the district. So uh, there's no concerns with, uh, with that as far as the, uh, uh, the school board is concerned. Um, Application setting a precedent. Well, we do have the 40-foot lots in uh, as a standard in many areas of uh, HRM. So, uh, you know, that uh, unfortunately the 40-foot lot precedent has already been set. Um, the smaller lots don't fit the community. This, this actually, this development is tucked into the back of an established neighborhood. Uh, so it's, it's not really visible to anybody but uh, the folks that live there. Uh, it's not something that you're going to see from the uh, the main road, and uh, so I, you know, I, I don't see that as a as a huge concern. Um, reason for living in Beaver Bank is for larger lots. Absolutely, um, you know, with those larger lots, though, uh, the lots were larger to start off with because we uh, had uh, our own wells and septic, and uh, with a sur fully serviced uh, subdivision, that's really not uh, a concern. Uh, need more crosswalks. Crosswalks are coming. We have uh, one, two, three, four coming up in the next uh, few months, all four of them with the rapid flashing beacons. So that is something that is on the way. And need cell service to be fixed. Uh, one of the major cell providers that uh, may or may not be celebrating Let's Talk Day tomorrow has plans to build a, uh, a new tower in the Beaver Bank area. So uh, that's, uh, that's, oh, I'm out of time. Terribly sorry. Uh, that's uh, all that to say. All that to say, I don't have a huge issue uh, with this, and uh, I, uh, I thank you for your support. Thank you. You're so seldom out of time, I wasn't even paying attention. Councillor Lovelace. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I promise I'll be quick. Um, I do support this as well. Hey, <laughs> I do support this. You know, I, I, I look at this uh, design of the subdivision, I think, yeah, that's how we should have done it 20 years ago. You know, you've got two exits for the subdivision. How nice and cool is that? Um, trails embedded throughout. Uh, you've got protection of wetland, open space throughout, economies of scale uh, with regards to looking at this, you know, from a serviced uh, subdivision. Um, and I, I really appreciate the fact that Clayton took a, a step back and said, okay, let, let's, let's revamp how we can do this. And I want to say hi to my former colleague, Jared. Good to see you. 
Um, so I, um, I am fully supportive of this. I've, I've seen what uh, Clayton has done in the Bedford planning area and uh, you know, I'm just jealous really that Beaver Bank has uh, serviced uh, sewer and, and water throughout um, and we don't. And sidewalks are going in which is really exciting. So you've got a full complete walkable community. Um, thanks to staff for your work on this and for the presentation. Sorry to sideline everybody with the shared housing thing. I just wanna ensure that we're consistent um, and so look forward to the R1C zone, but I do think that we need to think about expanding that into other service areas and I guess that's a shout out to Halifax Water to get another <coughs> water treatment plant uh, for Hamas Plains. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, nobody else? Are we ready for the question? I'd like to thank the folks from Clayton for being here to tonight and wish you well with this development. Thank our planning staff, Megan in particular. Good luck with all of your upcoming endeavors in the next uh, few weeks. That motion is carried. We're done. We are adjourned.